the hour of 10 o'clock having arrived. We will call the May 28, 2024 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council to order, and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Council Member Watkins is currently absent. Bruner? Present. Helen Tory Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Let me move to statements of disqualification. Is there anyone who needs to make a notice of disqualification? Councilmember Brunner? Yeah. For, for those of you that are listening, let me just say, I just noticed that Councilmember Brunner <laughs> sadly has more or less lost her voice over the weekend. So if you hear her struggling to, to speak, that's because of that. So Ms. Brunner. Items number 12 and 13 as it relates to my employment. 12 and 13, you're recused on. Thank you. Anyone else? Items for disqualification? Uh, we are on a call for public comment regarding our closed session. That is items 1, 2, and 3 on today's agenda. This would be the opportunity for anyone who's with us in chambers or anyone online to comment on any of those closed session items. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? No, we don't. Is there anyone with us in chambers today who wishes to make comment on the closed session agenda? Last call, seeing and hearing no one. What we will be doing now is we will be going into a closed session to take up items one, two, <clears throat> excuse me, one, two, and three, we should probably be back about 1045 or so, uh, and we will resume regular business. We stand adjourned into closed session. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. The hour of 1045 having arrived and the city council having completed its work in closed session, we are back in open session. Clerk will call the roll to reestablish a quorum. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member is Newsom. Present. Brown. Here. Watkins is currently absent. Bruner. Present. Helen Tari Johnson. Present. Vice Mayor Golder. Here. Mayor Keeley. Here. Having established a quorum, we'll move to oral communications. This will be the opportunity for anyone who is either with us today in chambers or online to comment on any item under our jurisdiction but not on today's agenda for a period of time up to two minutes. First, let me ask Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? Nobody with their hand raised. No one with their hand on. Let me ask if there's anyone with us who wishes to make comment during oral communication. Good morning, sir. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Good morning. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Um, I'm here today just because, uh, you know, uh, as of a few days ago, anyway, on today's schedule was the, the Mission Laurel Street project, the, the food bin. And I'm not sure how or when or why it got shifted, but um, the last notice I received was... Hold on for just a second. I want to make sure that, I'm, that we are doing this right. So this okay. is oral communication, any item under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. Is it on today's agenda? I want to make sure which items are we talking about now. Um, just the, remind me. The food bin project. Food bin will be taken up at a time specific tonight at 530. I see. We will take that item up, and you're more than welcome to come back at that time, either call in or show up, and we'll take your okay. testimony well, on that, that item That's at really that good, because uh, it, like, it would have been like the second or third time I'd shown up. And, okay. But I must have misunderstood what was online. That's quite right. So. Did you also say you had a question on item 15? No. no. Okay. No. Very good. We'll see you this evening. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Uh, excuse me. Good morning. Welcome. Yeah, still morning. Okay, I have a story to tell. I was at the farmer's market last Wednesday, parked on Cathcart, the very last parking spot facing Cedar, 
right in front of my bumper was the marked crosswalk. I looked in my left mirror, door mirror, because I was ready to pull out and I saw a Santa Cruz police motorcycle with what I would call determined speed and I decided not to challenge him. So I let him come up to the stop sign just as two people stepped across from the hula side of Cathcart into the marked crosswalk. And the motorcycle officer rolled the stop sign, did not stop, and did not yield to pedestrians. Of course, he was white. Anyone else on, do we have anyone online? No. Anyone else, last call on oral communication? Seeing and hearing none, we are finished with oral communication. We are on item four. This is the 2023 Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. Uh, the, uh, and the Santa Cruz Police Department Joint Annual Report. Ms. Murphy will be leading on this item. Let's go. Okay, we are, good morning. Good morning. Madam Chair, how are you today? Great, how are you all? Very well, thank you. Thank you for your service and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you for having us and thank you to all of you and to the city staff for all of their help with us and the Santa Cruz Police Department, the Chief of Police is coming in momentarily. Um, so you have a copy of our my glasses are <laughs> not where they should be. Thank you. Well, there is a full-service vice mayor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Glad you didn't need a pacemaker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you all have our, our, a copy of our report and just some of our highlights. As you know, our mission is to collaborate with local stakeholder partners and law enforcement to ensure best practices to respond and prosecute violent crimes against women. Our vision is to end sexual assault, sexual harassment, and domestic violence in the city of Santa Cruz through prevention, programs, and public policy. Uh, to end sexual assault, sexual harassment, and domestic violence in the city of Santa Cruz through, okay, I already said that, I apologize. Our creation was a response to the high rates of domestic violence and sexual assault in the city and the need for a community-led effort to address these issues. Our, the Commission's focus areas and priorities include providing education to the community and raising awareness of the resources available to survivors of violence, as well as advocating for the development of programs and services that support survivors and promoting the prevention of violence by addressing its root causes. The Commission seeks to engage and empower community members to prevent violence through education, support, and resources. Additionally, we collaborate with other agencies and organizations to develop coordinated responses to violence against women, which includes training, educate, education, as well as educating first responders and law enforcement. The Commission has several specific goals and priorities that we have identified, including developing prevention programs for youth, working to increase the availability and accessibility of, of services for survivors, improving data collection and reporting on violence against women, as well as addressing the intersections of violence with issues such as racism and poverty. Some of, our, some of the uh, changes in the last year that we've decided to focus on, we have three goal areas, which is to increase our visib visibility and impact, strengthen our partnerships, and strengthen our processes, processes. Overall, the commission is committed to creating a safe and supportive community for all women free from violence and oppression. We, I don't know if, if uh, the chief would like to say anything, but again, the purpose of our report is to provide a better understanding for our community members regarding the issue of sexual assault, domestic violence, and, ident and identify local trends and key findings. This report should be used to tailor educational re outreach, define opportunities for our community to reduce sexual assault and identify ways for Santa Cruz Police Department to remain up to date on the best practices when working with victims and investigations. Some of our highlights, 
for 2023 include we issued a commission for the prevention of violence against women newsletter and for 2023 we partnered with santa cruz city schools to provide self-defense classes we revamped and updated our uh, website which we've included more resources and information for community members we have uh, reinstituted drug tes testing kits and brought back the drug testing coasters which um, have been given out to bars and restaurants uh, restaurants in the community to allow uh, community members to test their drinks um, and then we've also increased our branding awareness by giving out t-shirts tote bags and stickers at uh, community events and we've increased our community-based organization partnerships by collaborating um, on programs and events including uh, moab the dyke trans march pride the pride parade monarch services mentors for change coaching for boys into men and we've all, we also held a men speak out event at the Resource Center for Nonviolence in April of 2023. Do we have any questions or comments? Madam Chair, thank you very much. We will probably have those. Let me see if we can receive uh, some comments from the chief and then we'll take questions uh, to both of you. Chief, good morning. Good morning, Mayor, City Council members, Bernie Escalani, Chief of Police. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly about our incredible partnership with, with CPVAW. Uh, this has been a partnership for years. Um, we have lofty goals of completely eliminating uh, the violence against women, whether it's through domestic violence or sexual assault. And um, we work very tightly together, um, and I think that we have a great partnership, and uh, I think there's a lot more great things we can accomplish moving forward. So uh, thank you for receiving the report, open to any questions. Um, but the, the fine work uh, of these ladies and the entire group um, is amazing. So uh, we're, we're very grateful for their work. Thank you, Chief. Let me see if there are questions uh, by council members. Council members. Okay, we're going to see. <laughs> let me start with Ms. Bruner, and, and let me uh, reinforce for those of you who weren't here at the beginning of the meeting, Councilmember Bruner has been uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the uh, roller coaster and has lost her voice, and that is not a good thing for an elected official, so we will all listen intently as you whisper your question. And thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the work and the goals and the highlights and the information provided in the report. And also to um, ask a little bit about the role of the victim advocate with, at our police department, because I understand not every police department has that and, and that collaboration. And also, um, any data on, um, I know sexual assault with uh, younger women, but also transgender women. Those were my comments and questions. Okay, thank you. I, uh, Chief Escalante can speak to the victim advocate, but that is correct. The Santa Cruz Police Department is the only agency in the county that has their own uh, victim advocate. And as far as stats go, we can receive the stats that you're requesting from uh, the Santa Cruz Police Department. And I'll let Chief Escalante. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, it is my understanding, other than the district attorney's office, we are the only agency in the county with a victim advocate. Um, and, and her primary role is to help survivors and their families through the court process because um, it can be very daunting and overwhelming on top of being victimized. So she is really there to guide them through the process and explain the process as they go through it. So um, she reviews every report, uh, domestic violence, sexual assault related, uh, even battery cases and stuff. She does much more than, than just these cases. But, um, and then she reaches out to the victims educates them about next steps and walks them through the process if it goes all the way through. And also guides them to different services that are available to them. 
for the questions. Ms. Kaltar Johnson is recognized. Thank you so much for the report and all the work that you do on this very important issue. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm looking back at the report. I read it um, earlier in the week, and, and I'm not recalling. Maybe, so if I missed it, I apologize. Um, is there data that, that we collect on CSEC, um, commercial sexual exploitation of children, that we include in here? Um, if not, perhaps that can be an opportunity to bring that in. Um, and I know just working on a grant recently that um, dating violence has, has gone up tremendously in our community since, 20, since 2019, 2018. Um, so I wonder what specific work we can do um, in partnership with our, our community allies around youth and um, transition age youth and youth. So thank you again. Yes, those are both great questions. And for the first question, we do not collect that data, but we can. And I don't know if we can get that from Santa Cruz Police Department or... Um, and then as far as dating violence goes, um, we agree that there is an increase um, in our community, and we definitely would like to provide more um, outreach and resources to youth in the upcoming year. Just one more thing. I know there's a state law that passed. I'm forgetting the name of it right now. Um, but it passed recently that every school, maybe you know, um, every school district and every school, I think middle school, high school, has to provide education and outreach. And some schools are choosing to do like an online, online curriculum. So anyway, that, that might be an opportunity um, to partner through schools and other CBOs. We did partner with Santa Cruz City Schools and provided um, funding for an online course for them, and so that, that is something that we have done in, in the past year. The vice mayor is recognized. I know I can speak a little bit to that. I know they start teaching that in, they've been doing it for years, because my 20-year-old got, they started doing the lessons on consent starting in sixth grade, I think, in middle school. So they, I think, um, maybe they're ahead of the law, but they, but yeah, I know Santa Cruz City Schools is very actively educating um, for the questions or comments well thank you yes i can see that you are uh, uh, hi i was going to add um good morning um a couple years ago we also partnered with walnut avenue women and family center and we provided funding for their teen art class um, specifically about dating and violence and those posters were displayed um, and i believe are still available to be put up so we could reach back out and continue that um, and perhaps do more posters for outreach. Thank you. For the questions or comments? Well, let me say, uh, Madam Chair, thank you to you and your colleagues for your very fine work and the support that you receive from the city government, especially from the police department. I think that our city, this was established long before I ever arrived here, and I think that it is an important recognition of the danger and problem associated with violence against women. I think it is really a positive thing that our community has elevated this to the level of a commission, pays close attention to it, cares deeply about it, and it does look to me, don't want to get too excited about the trend lines, but the trend lines look moderately positive, and I don't imagine that's by accident. But that is by a result of the very good work that you and others do. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the use of the glasses. <laughs> can we get her glasses back? I Did love you it. miss that? I missed that, that? Right, but I can relate. Hilarious. <laughs> I can totally Item five on Beach Safety Week has been continued to June the 11th, June the 11th. Item six, we will take up uh, at or about four o'clock this afternoon. We are on presiding officer announcements. I have none. Statements of disqualification, let me ask again. We've already received some. Do we need to, does anyone else, do you have an opportunity? 
giving you an opportunity. You weren't here this morning. Do you have a disqualification item? Seeing here none. Mayor, We're on additions and Mayor, deletions. I will go to, excuse I think, me. I think I have to state it again. Again? So um, item 12, cooperative retail management business, real property improvement assessment, and item 13, downtown association. Okay. As it relates to my employment. Items 12 and 13, Council Member Bruner will recuse herself based on her employment. Additions or deletions, let me see. Uh, Madam Clerk, we do have one. We do have one, thank you, Mayor. Um, item 15, which is the 2024 pavement rehabilitation project, mm -hmm. um, staff has requested this be removed from this agenda and will be placed on the June 11th agenda. <laughs> Item 15 is removed from today's agenda and will be placed on the June 11th agenda for the City Council. Mr. City Attorney, any good. reports out of closed session? Yes, good morning, Mayor Keeley and members of the City Council. Uh, the Council met this morning in closed session in the courtyard, courtyard conference room. There were three items of closed session business that were discussed this morning. The first was a liability claim, the claim of Century Insurance. Council received a report and gave direction to its uh, risk manager on that item. Second item was pending litigation, case of City of Santa Cruz versus che Chevron Corp et al. This is the litigation that the city filed several years ago now uh, relating to the impacts of sea uh, level rise uh, and associated um, carbon emissions. Uh, that case is currently pending in the San Francisco County Superior Court Council received a report from the city attorney's office on that item. The third item was one item of significant exposure to litigation. Council received a report from the city attorney's office on that item, and there was no reportable action. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. We are on the consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar with the process, we will be taking up items 8 through 22 minus item 11 and 15, which have been continued. But all the other items, 8 through 22, will be taken up on one motion. The city clerk is giving me a signal. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Madam City Clerk. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I do want to point out that staff has um, shared that the resolution ahead of you for the um, item 12 there is a um, some edits made, so let me just share my screen really quick before you make the vote on that, and you will see them. Okay, this is brought to Ms. Unit. Would you come forward for a moment? Good morning. Thank you for your good work. Will you take a moment and explain this to us? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is our uh, resolution of the intent to levy the cooperative retail management assessment. There was an erroneous mention to the downtown ranger program, uh, which is no longer in effect. So we need to strike that from this resolution. Very good. Thank you. And with that amendment acknowledged, we will uh, now hear from anyone who wishes to address us on the consent agenda either someone in person or anyone who is online, you can make up to two minutes worth of comments on any and all items. So if you wish to make comments on three items, you're still going to get the same amount of time. Anyone with us in council chambers wish to comment on a consent agenda item? Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? No one with their hand raised. No one with their hand up. Members, the matter is back. Let me start going through pulling, commenting, or any questions? We'll start with Ms. Bruner on my left. Any items Question on Question on item nine. Item? Nine. Nine. Please proceed on your item on your question on item nine. Is there some? Hi, thank you. I had a question about the $10,000. This is the Children's Fund uh, Advisory Committee funding recommendations. And I had a question on the second part of the recommendation to allocate $10,000 from the uh, for community outreach. And I was wondering if you could uh, just talk about what that is and why it's coming out of this pot versus regular community outreach funding. 
Sure. Uh, good morning, Mayor, Council Members, Lisa Murphy, Deputy City Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. Thank you for your question. Uh, the Children's Fund Advisory Committee, after they went through their process of allocating the awards and over a period of, of funds that haven't been distributed for several years, uh, the committee felt it was important to reach out to the community to let them know how their tax dollars were being spent very specifically to this fund since this was set up through a vote of the people. And so the, the idea was to do direct outreach and utilizing the funds from this um, from the Children's Fund seemed appropriate. Can I, the uh, city manager or city attorney, like the, the, I'm sorry I wasn't able to ask this question prior, but um, other examples of um, where community outreach, that funding, how, that pay, how that's paid for, I just thought that this was dedicated funding um, for purposes of children's support and allocation. And so anything for community outreach normally would come from a different pot of money, so to speak. Do we do that with anything else? So I appreciate that uh, question, Councilmember Bruner. Happy to speak to that. Um, it is not uncommon for uh, special taxes of, uh, of this type uh, to be used for direct communication. In this case, I, I believe the intention was to utilize it for an annual report, an actual printed annual report that would go out to uh, every voter in Santa Cruz, um, really as, a, as an opportunity to ensure transparency of, of use of funds and consistency with what uh, the Children's Fund was really uh, originally um, stood up as. And I know uh, Councilmember Watkins has been a big advocate for doing additional communication, but it is consistent with the, with, uh, the Children's Fund uh, Charter and, and is an allowable use specific to the work that's happening under the Children's Fund. Um, and I've seen these uh, types of communications used by, by many other cities and organizations um, as, a, as an effective way of, of doing that. Councilmember, might I uh, acknowledge Councilmember Watkins for a moment to yes. also assist in the response, Councilmember? Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Councilmember Bruner, for the question. And certainly thank you, Lisa, for the conversation that we had. Um, we had a lot of conversation about the use of the funds, certainly wanting to see the majority of those dollars as we're having the proposal now, going straight into the hands of the organization supporting the kids. And as our city manager said, we also really want to make sure we're clear with our community, with our voters, that these are how these dollars are being used, and that when they said they were voting to support kids, that this is what that is looking like. And having a portion of that uh, funding go to that outreach for accountability and transparency, sort of as a report card, felt um, something that the committee could get behind, and that's why that proposal is that amount for the council to consider. So my follow-up question. Certainly. Um, Ideally, the maximum amount would go to supporting children and programs. So if it's whatever leftover money, would that just automatically roll into the pot of funds for children's, like, we don't have to spend the full 10000 or what if we spend 6000 and there's leftover funds It didn't cost as much as 10000 Will it just automatically? I don't want to assume that. Well, sure. automatically. Yes, yes. Uh, Council Member Bruno, those funds are restricted and they will stay in the fund. It's not like the general fund where it disappears, right? It will roll over any unspent funds. And that's, you can see by evidence of how the past several years where the funding hasn't been expended, it just kept accumulating and it's restricted for those purposes. So anything that's not spent, yes, it will roll over to the following year. If I can add to that, uh, Council Member Bruno, we actually expect the total cost of the, of the annual report to be closer to 20,000. Uh, so the general fund will be matching uh, 10,000 with the uh, with the commitment that the children's fund is providing, and we're basing that off of other citywide mailers. Uh, the the Schmoo review being one one example of that. Um, so it'll be the the total cost will be shared between general fund and children's fund. But if there was residual, it would revert back to the children's fund. Last question. Sorry, is that because this is like a new thing and we want to? The, the committee wanted to 
get the word out. And this isn't going to happen every time. I think we we really would actually anticipate it happening as the fund comes through, that the dollars are sort of accumulated and then the funding is released, just to be accountable to our voters. And as um, Matt was saying, this is similar. I sit on an advisory body in Monterey County. They send a report card out to all the voters to be completely transparent as how this special funding source is being allocated to their community. So it's really about a report card and transparency and setting up that standard um, for this unique type of funding source I think is actually a really good thing. So I would hope to see it continue. Certainly that'll be at the discretion of the council and the committee, but um, something to start with, especially as it's the first time and it's nearly a million dollars that we're putting out. So we want the community to be aware of that. Thank you. I guess my last question then, I wonder if there's a way to consolidate when when um, these types of uh, reports go out to share costs. Like twenty thousand dollars is a lot of money. That we have a lot of youth and programs and other other reports that go out. If you know one side could be one thing and the other the other, and we're, we're doing everything we can to maximize um, consolidating costs. I think that's a great thought, Councilmember Bruner, and certainly something that we can explore, particularly with the general fund commitment that gives us some flexibility in terms of what we're, we are reporting on. I could, I could see Measure L being a good example of that, of being able to speak to uh, the ways in which we're investing that funding uh, as we had committed to the community. So certainly something that we can explore. As well as the city manager's weekly email as well and website. Happy to do that. We have lots of great ways we're communicating with the community, and the newsletter is one of those. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Councilmember Kalatar Johnson is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you. I also had questions and comments on item nine. Um, just to Councilmember Booner's point around consolidation, there may be an opportunity with the State of the Youth report that we've committed to doing every other year. Um, and then just a um, a suggestion idea that when we are working on this report that it is connected to the children and youth bill of rights and the 10 tenants maybe that was already in the thinking um in the question about the report will it be provided in spanish and electronically as well or can it be yes does that absolutely. add another twenty thousand? <laughs> Uh, you know, I based it off of the cost of mailing out for the shoe. Okay. So I, they do do it that way. We'll have that opportunity to complete. Okay, two more questions. Um, so I know that this the funds have accumulated because we needed to get the structure in place. Are we still planning on doing these every two years or on an annual basis? You know, this was an unusual time because of the, right. the accumulation. So they did two years. I think originally the intent was annually, but having that flexibility. Mm. And, and then we'll see. We, we're uh, anticipating a little over 250000 per year that will be collected. So next year, well, in two years, it'll be a smaller pot. Mm. So it most likely will be a one-year. It will be a one year. I'm, I won't. Yeah. Okay. Could, most I would likely. Just, I would just say two years makes sense to me because I know it takes a lot to, um, you know, land on a decision and then administer it and all that. And so I think I, I do think two years makes sense. And then um, faux par. Really glad to see that we are supporting for par faux par. Is some of that for scholarships? Will we continue to do scholarships for? I believe the intentions all for scholarships. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then just a quick comments. Um, I just want to um, acknowledge. Um, uh, Ms. Murphy and Councilmember Watkins and, and everyone else who serves on that committee, I know this has been a long time coming and it's really exciting to just see it alive and happening. So thank you guys for all your work. The vice mayor is recognized. <laughs> on the consent agenda. Councilmember Watkins is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor. I will just say a few comments on nine, since that's where we're at, um, and also notify you all of um, a component of that that I will have to recuse myself from because I'm a board member of. But I will go to I will get to that. Um, I just want to thank Lisa and our entire city staff who worked on this, as well as the advisory body who put in a lot of volunteer hours, a lot of time and thought to examining really high quality, amazing programs in this community seeking funding to support youth. It was really hard, as always, with these types of um, decisions when you have so much to offer and just a limited amount of funding. Um, 
but we just in hopes that you all understand, we really did our best to identify the programs that really would enhance and put those dollars straight into the services that go directly to youth as evidenced by uh, FOPAR, right, in terms of our scholarships. And I just also wanna thank the council and I wanna thank the community. I think this is, uh, this is an extraordinary moment personally that I just have to say, I feel so happy that nearly seven, you know, nearly a million, three quarters of a million dollars is going to supporting our kids and our families and our community and the health and well-being of them. It's a really great thing that is the values of our this of this community of this council, and I, I sincerely and, and deeply thank you for that. Um, and then to the part where I have to recuse myself from, which I had to recuse myself from, as a committee member. Uh, as a board member of United Way, United Way is receiving some of these dollars. So in that decision-making process, I recused myself. And in this um, consideration, I will recuse myself from that allocation. Is that correct, uh, Tony? OK, so when the vote comes, um, I wanted to make that disclaimer for you, Bonnie. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you. I have a comment on nine and a comment and question on uh, 16. Uh, so Six, I, 16. 16, yes, it's a wastewater plant improvement. Thank you. Uh, mostly a comment. So um, I just wanted to thank uh, Councilmember Watkins in particular here because, you know, you started with a vision to uh, develop this children's fund and you've you've really demonstrated so much commitment along the way and so much energy and I know it's been challenging uh, the I'm sure making those decisions was not easy it was so good to see some of these child care programs on the list um, particularly uh, because they're uh, they have um, low income slots, subsidized slots, they make childcare available to uh, workers in our community, including city workers, <laughs> I'm aware of. And so I, I just think, and, and some of those, those uh, childcare centers lost funding through the core process and it's been really, really hard for them. So I'm thrilled that this is happening and um, I wanna thank the subcommittee and staff as well, but mostly uh, a testament to your, uh, your, your commitment. Councilmember Watkins, thank you. Uh, on uh, item 16, this is a, a gender report on the wastewater plant improvements. And mostly I just wanted to uh, thank our Public Works staff. The, this report, if anybody wants a, a very quick and very clear overview of how our waste treatment plant operates, how it functions, You'll get it here. It's it's really well. It's so well written, um, and uh, you know, just encourage people to take a look. Um, these these items that come to us on consent. You know, we don't often uh, spend a lot of time on them, but I just wanted to share that. You know, it was really really um, great to to read. And so I guess I actually don't have a question there. Um, I'll leave it at that for for today. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Newsom is recognized on the consent agenda. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. I just want to make a very quick comment again on uh, agenda item number nine and just want to associate myself with the comments of my colleagues and thank Councilmember uh, Watkins for all of her work uh, on this uh, on this, and uh, the staff for all the work on this. It's really excited to see, exciting to see all of the programs that will receive funding uh, through this and I'm just really excited and want to thank you for that. Thank you. On the consent agenda, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I suspect at the end of this calendar year, we're gonna be doing a lot of thank you, thank you to you for everything around uh, it's children. All, it takes all of us, thank yeah, you. Yeah, wonder, wonderful work. I have no items on the consent agenda. Anyone with us today wish to make a comment on the consent agenda? This would be your opportunity to do so. Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush, who wishes to make comment? Yes, we'll take the person online. Good morning and welcome to the city council meeting. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, this is Nora Caruso from the Santa Cruz Toddler Care Center. And I just really wanted to take the time to also thank the committee and council member Watkins. I know this has been quite a journey um, and we've been with you through it. And we're just really appreciative of um, this kind of acknowledgement and recognition and 
as council member brown alluded to um, we just want to be able to serve all families in santa cruz city um, especially those that are working and need help um, with child care and providing child care for this age group is inherently expensive due to the low teacher student ratio that we must keep because our kids are so little they're one and two year olds they're in diapers they can't talk so we have you know three kids for every one teacher it's really expensive to provide this care and we're interested in keeping it high quality and making sure that um, they're getting everything they need so uh, this recommendation recommendation um, can really help us to provide um, some more scholarships for families to come to the toddler center and receive our services and yes um, we did lose quite a lot of money um, with the core funding that last cycle. So this will help to backfill some of that and we're very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Yes. Yes, we'll take the next person online regarding the consent agenda. Good morning, welcome to the council meeting. Hi, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, just similar to Nora, I'm Erin Hohengarten, and just wanted to say thank you on behalf of WePens. We're incredibly grateful, um, especially because I know it took the committee kind of an extra ad hoc meeting to approve our funding. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of our heart. This is going to keep a struggling program going that provides um, child care to West Side parents and low income families. I just want to say thank you very, very much. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? No one with their hand raised. Anyone who is with us wish to come in? Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the body. The appropriate motion would be to approve, approve the consent agenda minus items 11 and 15 and acknowledging that Councilmember Watkins has a limited uh, conflict on item 9. In is the, that the appropriate way to say it, sir? Thank and, you. And 12 and 13. And, and abstaining... And Council from on 12 and 13. 12 and 13 because of her. Employment. That was my motion. Very good. That is the motion by the vice mayor. Is there second. a second? There's Can a I, second. Um, mayor, I'm so yes. sorry. Um, item 11, you said, is pulled, but I don't believe it was. I thought item 11 was continued. No, it was, is that it was just 15. Continued? Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. And there was the edits, too, to the other item. Yes. Okay. All of that is contained in the motion. Debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. The consent agenda is approved. all the way through to item 23. This is a report on council compensation and staffing. Ms. Schmidt will be presenting on this item. We have material in our packet. Ms. Schmidt, good morning, welcome. Thank you for your good work on this item. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council, Laura Schmidt, your Assistant City Manager. I'm going to head over to the staff computer and bring up the PowerPoint presentation, and then I will hand it over to Jan Perkins from Raftelis, and she will give you a presentation of a report based upon direction from last year's budget hearing. Council had asked us to do research for other agencies similar to our size and scope regarding council salaries as well as council staffing. And with that, I will hand it over to Jan. And if you give me a couple of moments, I'll bring the PowerPoint up. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the council meeting. We'll hold here for just a moment. Just hold for a moment. Thank Get you. all of our collateral material up and running. Well, give me a moment to um, alert my colleague that, it's, uh, that you're a very efficient city council moving early. <laughs>
Ms. Bush, thank you. <laughs> Laura, are you you're going to dance or you just, you'll do it? Okay, okay, good. All right, thank good you morning. so much. Um, I'm going to see if my colleague Claire Pritchard is on. Um, she was going to join by Zoom. How would I know that? Let's see. I'm sorry, what is your question? My, my colleague, Claire Pritchard, was going to join. It's a little bit early, but I did. Oops, she says technical issues, restarting Zoom. OK, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and then she Very will good. join. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I do want to hold up the city council, because you are so efficient. Anyway, I'm Jan Perkins. I'm with Reftelis. I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, I know this is a topic that um, was on your agenda a year ago, so it's been kind of a long time in coming. Um, today, um, Laura, maybe you can go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to be providing a, a short overview of our study. Of course, it's been provided to you, and, and I suspect that you've all had an opportunity to read it. So my intent is to provide the highlights, walk through it, yep. and then be available for, uh, for questions and, of course, then your council discussion. Um, my, my colleague, Claire Pritchard, when she, when she does join, um, assisted with the analysis, the data collection, and so I wanted her to be able to join as well. Um, anyway, the, um, serve, what, what, we'll, what I'll go over today is the, the benchmarking that we did for, for you. Um, I was able to interview each one of the council members. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate that. And so I'll summarize those themes as well. Uh, we identified a number of options for the council, and of course you may have other options that, that uh, occur to you as well, but we identified several uh, for your consideration, and, and then we'll have a discussion. So, next slide. So in terms of the overview, um, our understanding was that the council was interested in an independent review of compensation. It had been quite some time since there had been a, an increase to the council's compensa compensation. In fact, 2017 was the last time. And to have a, an independent review, um, how does uh, Santa Cruz compare to other cities? And that's what we did. In addition, there was an interest in taking a look at staffing. Um, how could staff support be provided at a, at a higher level uh, to the city council? So we looked at both of those. Next slide. So first, I'm going to go through the benchmarking. Uh, I first want to share a caveat that no two cities are alike. You know that, of course. And so benchmarking is inherently um, problematic. Uh, we, we do benchmarking to show a perspective, and that's really what it is. It's a perspective. Um, we identified, we used a variety of factors in selecting cities population size, it was a fairly broad uh, range of populations, whether the city is full service or not, whether the city elects council members by district or not, um, beach, leisure, destination cities, presence of a university, we wanted to have several of those other cities in, and the level of homelessness. So there are a variety of factors that, that we looked at. Um, the population ranged from a low of, a, of about 60,000, and that's comparable to Santa Cruz without your university population, uh, to a high of about 224,000, which is Fremont. Um, six of the eight survey cities have a directly elected mayor and council members elected by district, so there's fairly good comparability in that as well. Four of the survey cities have universities um, within their jurisdictions. Next slide. We did spotlight homelessness because we know that is a, a big issue here in Santa Cruz. And it's certainly, no news to you, a sig significant here. And compared to the other survey cities, the, the city that comes closest in the level of homelessness is the city of Fremont, with a much larger population. So next slide. Let's get into the salaries. Uh, first is the mayor's salary. Um, salaries in California for elected officials very widely, significantly. From There are actually still some cities that pay nothing, very few. 
but some cities that pay very, very little, and some cities that pay a lot. And it's all based on local preference. It, that's, that's really what drives it. Um, the benchmarking survey that we did illustrates that range. Um, two cities in our survey were significantly different than the others. San Rafael, population of about 60,000, only pays its mayor about $8,400 a year. And then on the other end, the city of Berkeley pays uh, its mayor about $128,000 a year. So those are the two extremes uh, in our survey cities. The average of our peer cities, which includes those two for the mayor, is about $44,000 a year. We also calculated the median, which is about 27,000. So um, in, the, in the report, we detail out the, the actual salaries of each one of those cities, and I won't go into those right now. On the council salary side, again, they're significant. Um, I would note that Santa Cruz is 35% lower than the peer average um, of those survey cities in, in our benchmark study. Um, again, San Rafael is very low, at less than 6,000 a year, and Berkeley is high at over 80,000. So again, there's that wide range. Um, and page seven of our, of our report shows the council salaries for each one of those. Um, just a, a couple of notes. Uh, Fremont is just under 30,000. Um, Santa Barbara pays its council just over 60,000. So again, there's, there's really quite a wide variation. A couple of other factors on the next slide. Some cities have automatic salary increases. Your charter does not allow for that, um, but, but we did want to point that out. Berkeley and Santa Barbara can change annually based on county median income. Uh, Fremont and Santa Monica can change annually based on CPA, CPI, excuse me. Um, those are built in. In terms of uh, staff support, moving on to the next section. Um, we looked at, we asked in the questionnaire that we sent out to our survey cities what kind of staff support is provided, uh, whether there's dedicated staff support, um, who, a re who the staff report to. We tried to get that level of detail. Five of the eight cities have some dedicated support for the mayor and the city council. Three of the cities have staff positions dedicated entirely to that purpose, Berkeley, Santa Barbara, and Santa Monica. Only Berkeley has positions that report directly to the mayor and the council. The others report within the city manager's office. On the next slide, some examples of the kind of staff support that we found in those other cities. Santa Barbara has a full-time administrative assistant to the mayor and the council who reports to an office supervisor in the city administrator's office. Santa Monica has two positions within the city manager's office, a council office and legislative affairs liaison, and an administrative staff assistant within that office. But they're dedicated full time to the mayor and the council. And Fremont has a management analyst that reports to a deputy city manager and an executive assistant who reports to the city manager. Those positions can do other work as well, depending on kind of what's going on in the office and what the needs of the mayor and the council are. Next slide, council interview themes. Um, so I certainly appreciate the time that each one of you spent with me. Um, getting your perspective is very important. Um, the comments, um, there were a variety of comments from each one of you. Um, there were some themes. Um, one of the themes that I heard from council members was that if the compensation was higher, that it, it might attract more lower income candidates. So it, it might widen the candidate pool um, for running for elected office. So that was one of the themes. Um, a couple of other themes was that it could um, recognize the important work that the mayor and the council members do as well as recognize the time spent on city-related work. Not all council members felt that the compensation was inadequate, however. Um, and most council members mentioned that the benefits were greatly appreciated that are currently being provided. Uh, next slide. Um, I asked in my interviews with each council member what staff 
what um, needs are currently being not being met now through the staff, uh, through the staff support. Um, first of all, every single one of you said that you appreciate the support that you do get. Uh, very complimentary about city staff. Um, your, your comment was that each one of you said that when you ask, you are given assistance. So there is no criticism whatsoever. Um, there were some um, areas that were, would be considered gaps, however, some work that some of you would like to see fulfilled. Not all of you said all of these things, but the kind of um, areas that were identified, assisting with policy work that you'd perform on regional bodies, um, conducting research on various issues, um, engaging with constituents, scheduling and email management, actually several of you mentioned that, and preparing talking points when you need to present to various groups and um, assisting you when you um, need to prepare to speak to groups. So those were the kind of issues that were brought up and needs that were brought up. Um, okay, next slide. So options for consideration. First of all, with compensation. Um, what we, in our report, what we did was just identify that the current salaries were last increased in 2017. Um, inflation has increased by more than 25% since that time. Um, and our understanding of the city charter is that it prohibits salaries from increasing by more than 5% a year and also prohibits um, automatic increases. But of course, I would refer all questions to the city attorney on that since I, he is the expert on the charter and I am not. with regards to staff support. We looked at this from the potential, what, what are the potential needs? And I've already identified what, what I heard in my interviews. So we, we categorized the needs in four areas. Scheduling, assistance in conducting research on various issues, preparing for meetings and presentations, and assisting with managing emails. Those are the four categories. So we identified three options that you could consider uh, for meeting those needs. The first option is for the city manager's office to determine if there are staff in other departments that perhaps could be reassigned at, at no additional cost to the city. Don't know how feasible that is, but we wanted to put that out there as an option um, that could be considered. Option two would be to add positions. And for that option, that would be similar to what the other cities in our, in our survey, um, except for Berkeley, do, which is to add positions to the city manager's office to, to increase capacity. And that's it's really not surprising that that's the, the typical option, given that these cities are council manager cities. But in that option, the city manager's office would be responsible for the day-to-day -day supervision of those additional staff. We've identified two possible positions um, to meet those needs that I um, went through. Uh, one of them would be an administrative assistant to handle scheduling and email management. And the second would be a management analyst who could conduct research and assist in preparing presentations and helping council members and the mayor uh, prepare for, for meetings and, and work on regional bodies and so forth. The cost of adding those two positions um, would be approximately $300,000 annualized. Uh, we, we got that information from the city manager's office. Option three would be to add positions that would be aligned to the mayor and the council. Uh, through a dotted line relationship, as we put it in, in, in the report. Um, these, and, and that is in recognition of the, the charter that, that requires all staff that report to the city manager. So it would be a dotted line relationship to the mayor and the council. These positions would be temporary staff um, under 1,000 hours a year and would be at-will positions. There would be a process that, that would be undertaken through the city's human resources personnel rules to create such a classification uh, through standard steps that involves coordinating with bargaining units and so forth. The cost of that would be determined based on the level of position, 
that was determined and the, um, the temporary a person who is hired, as well as the number of hours assumed. So we did not estimate the cost on that. Um, any questions on how that would specifically um, be put into place, um, I would refer to the city manager or city attorney. But if that option is selected, um, we would recommend that a, a set of guidelines be established for smooth functioning by all parties once those individuals are in place. Since the city manager is the sole individual responsible for the organization and city staff, to have protocols placed um, in place where all the individuals, those staff, city staff, city manager's office, all know what, who's doing what, what the roles and responsibilities are. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Well, thank you for your presentation, Ms. Perkins, and thank you for the fine report. Let me see if there are questions by council members. The vice mayor is recognized. I did have a question. When you said that the, the temporary, so does that mean that they would not have, like, job rights? Like, for example, if the position was eliminated in a year from now, or the, would, would they have, does that make sense? Like, once they get... I'm going to turn that to the same I don't know what the period is for this, but that's what I was basically asking. Right. Uh, thanks for the question, Councilmember Golder. So um, as proposed for that option, it would be a limited duration position, so the individual applying would know that it was for a time certain, um, you know, in distinction from a, a permanent uh, position that might be added. And follow up to that. Certainly. So what would they do in the months of July or December? There's always plenty of work to go around, I guess is my initial thought. Um, and although um, the council goes on their summer recess during those months, uh, there's certainly support work that could continue to be provided during that time. My last follow-up question is, is this a need that the staff feels like? Do they feel overburdened by the work we're asking them to do, specifically Bonnie, Julia, Rosemary? I think. Well, I, I well, let me just say I'm I'm not sure that's a, I, I, mean, I appreciate yeah, the I question, just but. Yeah, I want to know if this is like a need thing too. If it's mutually beneficial, that's my question. Or if they're like we. I will um, just respond to that question, Councilmember Golder, with um, throughout the course of the interviews that Jan completed, um, there was certainly a theme from the council of at times wanting some additional administrative support. Uh, that for me indicates that um, there are at times uh, bandwidth being <coughs> stretched in ways that the council are feeling. Uh, that was uh, particularly acute uh, with the feedback around um, all the correspondence and emails and, and uh, constituent letters that I know at times you all uh, struggle to keep up with. Um, so I, I do think there is, um, there is room for additional support and growth from a, from a staff support standpoint, from a mutual beneficial Thank you. So if I might, on a couple of issues here, I'm not sure these are questions so much as uh, I want to point out that I do believe that there's a fourth option that wasn't put in here, and that is a charter amendment. Uh, so I hope we'll note that. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is uh, the world is changing on us here. Uh, which is a world where we have a directly elected mayor and we have six council members by district. I think that that's not an insignificant change with regard to council members. I think that when everyone's elected at large, everyone's responsible and no one's responsible for a issue in a particular neighborhood or whatever happens to be, unless you live in the neighborhood perhaps, uh, then maybe you take an interest in it. But now that we are districted, I think that it is fundamentally different. Council members are expected by their constituents to be neighborhood council members and people know who to go to now. And I think that the workload, what we will see is that individual council member case workload will go up uh, as voters become more and more accustomed to the idea that they have a council member, where before they didn't have a council member. They had a lot of them, but they didn't have one they knew they could go to directly. 
I think that change is important to acknowledge here. I think the fact that we are the county seat uh, is different than perhaps in the other three cities here in the county. Uh, that brings with it a large number of issues for us. Uh, and again, based on the district concept, I think that, that we will see that the response that is expected from district council members because we are the county seat, whether it's around issues around homelessness or other issues, I think that there will be increased pressure on council members to deal with that more directly than they have in the past. I think that uh, it is also fair to recognize and acknowledge council member Brown that uh, oftentimes we find ourselves uh, doing work because we are the county seat, we have a, a, an increased relationship with the Board of Supervisors uh, in terms of the delivery of health and human services and how that works. Uh, and so uh, in that regard, we are dealing with our counterparts who basically have th the equivalent of three full-time staff who work for each member of the Board of Supervisors. They don't work and are, there's no dotted line to the county administrative officer. They work for individual county supervisors. When I was a county, I've done both sides of that job. I was a staff member of the Board of Supervisors. I was a county supervisor and uh, I, I know both sides of that in terms of the benefit that provides to a supervisor. In other words, I think it's a, a resource mismatch of a certain kind when we deal with, with supervisors on city county issues. Let me be very clear what I didn't just say. I didn't just say that I'm not adequately staffed by our city manager and our department heads. All of that I'll stipulate too that, we, that you found in the report. It's absolutely true. That's a different issue than whether council members may need or want going forward their own staff uh, to deal with their own district and the uniqueness that, of, of issues that come up. Another comment or observation. I think we can see if we just look at the consent agenda today, we can see that we choose to do some things differently perhaps than other communities do. Example, the Commission on the Prevention of Violence Against Women is a choice that we made. I suspect the other jurisdictions don't have that. Uh, we, council member to my right, has been perhaps one of the greatest advocates for children that this city has ever seen. And there is a direct consequence and result of that, the Children's Fund and all the issues that go with that. That's where a council member decided to focus in on a particular issue area and a staff member could help prosecute that policy agenda. So I think there are a lot of reasons uh, going forward to consider mm, what I would call independent staff that, uh, that are hired by and are accountable to a council member so that that council member's work on, uh, on behalf of their district has that unique tincture or flavor of that district when that council member is working on it. So I think, that, again, I think this is a wonderful report. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I am, uh, so that we, I'm fully uh, disclosing what my interest is, I have no interest in trying to add anything that will assist me in the next two and a half years. I am very interested in seeing that we step in the direction of perhaps something on the order of something between 0.25 and 0 0.50 FTE for each council member, and perhaps one to one and a half FTE for the mayor. Uh, I understand that would take a, a charter amendment. I understand that, uh, that there would be a lot of work to do that, but I do think that what the modern day expectation is in a districted council city with a University of California with a, an enormous 
population that grows from 66,000 to 166,000 about seven months of the year because of us being a tourist destination. I think for a whole range of reasons, it, it would make sense to continue on this path for this, this effort to continue to move forward. I suspect my, the council members will have thoughts on this as well. But I would see that this is the basis of a continuing effort to see where we want to be. And that's where I would like to be. Let me see if there are other council members with questions or comments. The, va the vice mayor. <laughs> you are right, because um, initially I was thinking the money could be better spent on something else in the organization, but I think um, your argument was very compelling and the points you made were uh, spot on, so I've changed my stance. <laughs> Good job. I'll have to do more of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Ms. Contar Johnson. Thank you. Yeah, um, I I'm really appreciate this um, this report and the, the direction. Uh, I think, you know, it, it is hard to balance everything out. And um, you know, back to the question you were asking, Vice Mayor Golder, I, I hold back on asking for support because I don't want to overburden um, staff because I know how hard you're working and how much you have on your plates and you're often at capacity. So I think this direction makes sense. I think it's really important if we want to have diverse representation and diverse voices here on the dais that we create these opportunities with support, um, potentially increase compensation in the future. And uh, like you, Mayor, I, I'm not interested in seeing this um, in, in my next four years necessarily for me, but I want other community members to um, consider this because it would be, there, there's, there's support that would allow them to you know, juggle the, the, everything that we have to juggle in our lives here in Santa Cruz and elsewhere. So I'm, I'm very much in support of this direction. It looks like today we're just approving the report. I did see, not to get off topic, but I did see an item in the budget that looks very much related to this. So I guess we'll talk about that item in the budget when we get to the budget. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Councilmember Brunner. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to also say thank you so much for the report. And like the mayor said, this has stemmed from looking at it from an equity lens as well as public servants having access to the community having um, the possibility to serve as a public servant and over the last 20 years that has really become hard you have a whole working city council now <laughs> and i think a lot of the challenge that comes in some of those interview um, answers and summaries that you presented is because this is everybody here has a full-time job because we cannot afford to be full-time council members and so all of those categories are challenging on top of everything else and yet we're committed and you know like volunteering um this is serving the public so moving in this direction and and evaluating i know you know, Berkeley was the outlier, um, but they made that commitment to really um, invest that money for council members to be able to do that full time. And so it, it is something that, you know, where do we feel that the next, the next terms of council members for the city of Santa Cruz will be able to continue to serve without it being such a burden. Thank you, council member. Council member, moving around, moving around. Council member Watkins is recognized. Mayor, um, I just will say, one, I wanna say thank you for the report. It's something that we've I've been asked, is this like a full-time job? How, how do you do it? What, you all have other jobs? Like, you know, in terms of conversation and understanding about this, um, this position as an elected representative, but also a position that isn't at 
a compensation level that it would be a full-time job for a lot of people. I, I think it's really great to see a comparison. I think to your first initial statement that no two cities are the same, <laughs> I think that feels really true here. I think in terms of where we are comparable to Berkeley, you know, in terms of the university and a lot of the different aspects going on in that community, I think are similar to our community. Um, yeah, our population size is different and um, we are the county seat. And so I think, you know, having us look at this and thinking about regardless of who sits in these seats, how are we able to achieve the people's business the best way we can, right? And that is to the points that have been made about the additional support to be able to do that. And certainly we know our staff is stellar and working very, very hard. And um, there's a lot of pressures. So thinking about holistically where that could, can move forward, I think is a, a great, this is a great foundational and starting point as mentioned to do so. So I look forward to having that conversation. I really appreciate the report. I think it's really, really helpful, very informational and, and certainly um, gives us a lot of space to sort of think about where we fit uniquely. And charter amendments do happen, as mentioned. I think that that option was was not explicitly said, we, but we had a charter amendment recently. That's how we have a directly elected mayor and council seats that are by district. So um, our community can also decide how they want to move forward if that's something we want to look at in the future as well. So anyways, just wanted to say I appreciate it and thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with um, my my colleagues comments so far um, and I continue to be concerned about the budget ramifications of this I mean we're looking at you know our next item is a you know a hearing about a budget that we're, that's 2.5 4 million dollar deficit and so I I feel concerned about making a move that adds a 300,000 potentially 300,000 dollar cost um, I also believe that if the city were to move in this direction, that um, those positions should be um, more directly responsive to council members rather than just being an additional auxiliary staff in the city manager's office to take on whatever might come up. I, I feel like that's that's not really going to um, get to the intent of you know what we were what we're looking for here. So. Um, I, I continue to be concerned. I'm not totally convinced yet. <laughs> Vice Mayor Golder said she's convinced. I don't know that I am. Um, but I do recognize the struggle um, as someone who, you know, for the some of the time that I've been on this council, um, you know, really relied on this income in addition to my other part-time income. Um, it's, it's really, really hard to do the job well. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, I, I want to support... Uh, potentially increased compensation um, and I think we are more like Berkeley it, you know the char characteristics of an active community and that warrants that you know we do put in more time than I think a lot of council members from smaller cities we're full service city lots of activity lots of act activism um, and I think that um, right now considering a future charter uh, amendment is is worth continuing that to explore that um, no count no sitting city council member wants to put a, I mean, I'm just gonna be <laughs> real here wants to put an initiative on the ballot to significantly increase their compensation um, and so it's easy for me to say yeah that makes sense you know I'm there's no accountability I'm termed out um, but I think that is gonna be a real challenge moving forward for council members who will ultimately make this decision I'm guessing it won't be a charter change during my the rest of this year, but maybe so. Um, anyway, I just all that to say, um, yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic that we can uh, move forward with this as our basis, and I continue to have some real concerns about the politics and the the resources. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I wonder. Uh, let me see if there's anyone with us who wishes to make a comment on this item. Uh, anyone with us in chambers wish to comment on the item? Anyone who is online? Yes. I'm shocked. Uh, we'll take the person online. Good morning and welcome. Three, two. Yes. Uh, hey, uh, wow, you're shocked, huh? I'm, I don't know why. Anyway, uh, I have not too much to say about this, but y yes, I mean, we could use 
you know, more pay for council members for sure. You do, you, you know, you, you uh, do more work than you're paid. So by all means, and yeah, we could probably get even better people. You paid enough, but boy, that would take a lot, you know, to actually, you know, draw the real, you know, real sophisticated professionals out of the private sector. But uh, I also never really liked it when I worked. Everybody in the company thought I worked for him, you know, and everybody else thought that too about everyone else. And you know what? It's it's really lousy. Uh, you know, you really want to report to one person. Um, you know, um, as far as what, what is that person going to do? Research, paperwork. Maybe you should maybe explain that better. But um, and I thought that currently you could request help of less than one day, and it was kind of automatic. And would that change? Would they take that away, or how does that work? Um, and uh, hey, you could well, fund, I guess, employee wise. You know, out of the 27 and a half proposed extra employees that are in the budget, you know, you know if you didn't want to add any headcount. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else, Ms. Bush? I'd like to make a motion to receive and approve the report regarding the council member compensation and staffing in Terrible Cities. There's a motion. Is there a second? Motion is second. Uh, Madam Vice Mayor, I'm wondering if, if you might be willing to consider a friendly amendment that would add the following language. Direct the mayor to work with the city manager regarding further consideration of salary and staffing needs of council members and the mayor and to return with a report in October. Sounds good. Let's Thank do you. it. Agreeable. Agreeable to second. Motion. Okay. Thank you. Debate or discussion? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, one closing comment, uh, which goes to the, the question of the salary as opposed to the staff. Um, it struck me when uh, the charter was revised and the notion uh, of, of becoming mayor, uh, I thought about this, uh, that not with regard to my service, certainly, and I think that, that the argument of not feathering your own nest essentially is, a, is an obvious and compelling argument. Uh, but thinking forward about, as council members have mentioned, what is it you basically have to do in order to even think about running for the city council? And what that does, who that takes out of play uh, just consistently in our community. There have been exceptions over time. There's a council member here and a council member there, but largely if we looked at the economic demography of who's been able to be here, I think it's pretty self-evident that uh, a lot of people are, are left out of the game. It doesn't even occur to them. And I think, again, with regard to districts, how do you get the best city council member in a district? Not the one who can afford to do it, but among the constituents in that district. How do you get the best one? And my guess is that part of that, the answer to that question is, who can afford to do this? And uh, we have a wonderful city with extraordinary people in various income levels and various backgrounds. So uh, thank you for uh, the motion that's on the table. The clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all very much. Thank you to the consultant. Thank you to Ms. Schmidt. Uh, what we are going to do at this point is we are going to take a 20 minute break from 10 afternoon until. 12.30 p.m. this afternoon. We will return at that time and take up the first of our two considerations of the city's fiscal year budget. We stand in recess until 12.30.
Santa Cruz City Council is back in session. The clerk will call the roll to establish a quorum. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watson? Here. Bruner? Present. Someone Tari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? Here. The quorum having been established, we are moving to item 24. This is a report on the fiscal year 24 25 proposed fiscal year budget for the city of Santa Cruz. We will receive a, a staff report. We're going to receive comments from our city manager, then a staff report from our finance director, our department heads uh, who are wonderful, uh, are here and will be available to answer questions by members of the city council. We will also take public comment on, on this as well. This is not the only opportunity to comment on the budget. Uh, the board, uh, the uh, city council will be taking a subsequent action to adopt the fiscal year budget at a subsequent meeting. I will say that as we begin this, I want to express my thanks and appreciation to the city manager and the fiscal team, Ms. Cabell in particular. Thank you to you and your, your team for assembling this budget. Thank you to all the department heads and others uh, and your staff folks who participate in building your departmental budget and the city budget each year. You do a very good job on behalf of our city. We appreciate it. Uh, it is my view in the four elective offices that I've had the privilege of holding that the single most important activity that any elected body engages in, whether it's the city, the county, the state of California, is the adoption of the annual budget. It is the blueprint for our hopes and dreams and aspirations, how we attend to operationalize, intend to operationalize those. It is not a, I believe, cynical comment to say that if it isn't in the budget, it doesn't matter. I think that it is a fair comment to say that with regard to most public policy, if you want to advance the public policy, it does need an appropriation in almost all cases. So uh, this uh, budget activity is where I think we create ourselves as a small end of the funnel to look in an intense basis for a day or two at all of the functions of our city government, how the administration, what its views are of the future and what the elected leadership of the city decides that uh, in conjunction with our administrative team, what is it we want to get done in this upcoming fiscal year? So again, thank you to all of you who participate in the budget process. And Mr. City Manager, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I appreciate those opening remarks, Mayor. At times, folks get a little perplexed at how excited we get about our city budget. Uh, but it really is one of the most important pol policy documents that the Council approve uh, on an annual basis, and I am uh, pleased to present our proposed fiscal year 2025 budget. Uh, the proposed budget reflects the City Council's priorities as set forth in the 2023-2028 strategic plan. It was just recently updated. The budget is really an opportunity for us to operationalize what the Council is telling, uh, and by extension the community is telling City staff is most important to them. As we transition away from the financial uncertainties of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and a return to pre-pandemic economic patterns, our general fund faces challenges in meeting increased expenses and community service demands. However, despite those fiscal constraints, the proposed budget <clears throat> excuse me, maintains our organization's tradition of excellence, innovation, and strategic planning, ensuring continued high-quality services are delivered to our community on a daily basis. The proposed fiscal year 2025 budget totals, this might be hard to believe, uh, approximately $433 million across all of our operating departments. It also includes a capital investment program budget of $113.4 million and the general fund allocation of approximately $150.5 million reinforces our commitment to prioritizing essential, essential services, advancing the City Council's initiatives. And some good news, uh, following the printing and posting of the initial proposed budget, um, which initially relied on a $2.4 million uh, in reserves uh, use of balanced revenues with expenditures, 
Through additional review of revenue assumptions, including strong admissions tax and utility user tax growth, we now have a fully balanced budget without use of fund balance or reserves. So uh, very pleased to share that. It's a testament to the work that our finance team has been doing. And we'll get more into those details here in a moment. So our presentation today will focus on progress and action that's really layered throughout the budget document itself. Uh, we'll provide a high level overview of the budget update for fiscal year 2025. We'll provide some details related to our capital investment program. And then uh, we look forward to robust discussion, questions, direction from the city council. So again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was a lot of intention in building out the proposed budget. It was built on and informed by the council's strategic plan, including the seven focus areas that you see before you. Our city teams have been very busy investing in the service projects and programming that the council and community have said are most important to you. And you will see those priorities emphasized throughout the budget document. And of course, the budget was not developed in a vacuum, uh, and it was not developed overnight. A citywide budget of this magnitude necessitates countless hours of teamwork, collaboration, and a lot of patience along the way. I wanted to ex extend a special thank you to the members of our finance team. That includes Elizabeth Cabell, Marisol Gomez, Tracy Cole, and Emily Burden. Your dedication, innovative thinking, and adaptability were instrumental in navigating this complex and ever-evolving process of building a citywide budget. I also want to extend my gratitude to Assistant City Manager Laura Schmidt, whose leadership, support, and strategic direction were indispensable throughout the process. I also believe that this, is, this will be her last city budget. She's departing from us in July, and she was really instrumental in helping to develop the budget you have before you. I would also like to thank the City Council and Mayor for your leadership throughout this process, your uh, robust and helpful feedback, helping to inform uh, the proposed budget you have in front of you, as well as our executive leadership team of department heads, our department budget leads, and the many city staff who helped collaborate and con contributed to the proposed fiscal year 2025 budget. So thank you to all of our many city staff that were instrumental in developing the budget you have before you. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Elizabeth, our finance director, for further presentation. Ms. Cabell, good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. So I'd like to start with sort of looking at the budget process overall. On page 21 of your budget, we start talking about what that process is. It really is a year-round process. We are actually meeting with budget leads throughout the year. It's not just um, the few months leading up to the preparation of the document. But we look in the fall to um, City Council for goals and priorities in the bulk of putting the um, budget together happens in the January through May time frame with lots of meetings. Um, and then we do hearings in May and then adopt in June. So part of the review process that really starts as soon as we adopt the budget, we start looking back and looking at how we can improve it. Um, so in 25, we have several things that are new to the budget that we wanted to point out. Um, we do have a strategic plan that was adopted, so we have that reflected in the budget. Um, and it, not only specifically what the strategic plan is, but in the department summaries, we have all of the goals and accomplishments tied out as well to the, to the city council strategic goals. We also have improved, um, gone on to the next phase of our health and all policies where we are um, incorporating the pillars of equity, sustainability, and public health. We have those identified as well in the department summaries, the goals and accomplishments that support those, as well as in the CIP. So we have that spread throughout the document. Um, speaking of CIP, we've pretty much totally revamped the way that is presented. Um, first of all, you may notice it's less pages, which is always good. <laughs> um, the, we also have the beginning of each um, department has a summary of their CIP projects, both the present and future projects. We have fact sheets for every project that has funding in 2025. We also have a couple of maps that will be of interest. We have on page 258, we have um, the opportunity zone map where we have identified projects in the various opportunity zones throughout the city. And then we also, starting on page 259, have projects by council district. So you can see that listed as well as geographically where they are. And then another section that we've expanded this year is the financial and budgetary policies. 
Um, this year, what we've what we've added there is we have a table where we try to where we indicate are we in compliance, maybe not quite in compliance or out of compliance by red, green, and yellow um, bubbles. So there are only two policies that we we have, none are in red, but we do have two policies where we are not 100% in compliance. That is our um, stabilization reserve. Our policy requires two months unrestricted reserve. We're not there yet, so that policy, we're in the yellow there. We also, um, the Economic Development Trust Fund is another policy that we're in the yellow. We usually do a transfer to that fund. We did not do that in 25 so that we could present a balanced budget. That will come back in 26, but that's another policy that we are, that we recognize we're out of compliance on. Okay, and a couple of themes for 25. This is our first full post-pandemic budget. We have no state or federal funding that we've had for the past couple of years. So this is our full, everything is just general fund budget. We have no, no ARPA money um, from the federal government as well as no, none of the state um, funding. We've used all of that. Um, we also talk a lot about a status quo budget. So we do have a status quo where we tried to do a status quo budget. Um, that's really referring to our discretionary spending and to kind of put that a little bit in perspective and for the general fund in our 150 million dollar budget about 30 percent of that is truly discretionary spending which we refer to as trying to keep the status quo. We um, did recognize and do recognize that there's lots of things that are out of our control contract increases increases in costs for supplies. So we did um, bring those into the budget, so we are not asking departments to absorb those additional contract costs. Those are um, built in, we did add those into the budget. Um, even with all of these changes that we've done, we did um, reduce, as I mentioned, the economic, the transfer to the Economic Development Trust Fund. We also did not do our $5 million transfer to the CIP fund. Even with all of that, we are um, still continuing to try to keep um, revenues balanced with expenditures so that we don't, so we can hopefully get to a point where we can build up our reserves. But we continue to, to struggle with that and to look for additional revenue opportunities. Along those lines, we do want to have a um, huge thank you for the passage of Measure L. Um, this half cent sales tax allowed us to continue several of these ongoing projects that we have here, climate, public works, field services, rental programs, homelessness outreach and shelter, um, Harvey West Pool, fire equipment, just to name a few. In general, um, it's allowing us to maintain our services even though costs are increasing. Having that additional sales tax revenue really allows us to continue providing the services that we have. So just um, kind of reflecting back on um, back in November, we brought a long range financial plan to council. And in there, we identified several different strategies for kind of closing that fiscal gap that we've been talking about. So um, during this year, we've implemented many of those. The sales tax measure is one of them. We have been working on um, a fee study that we um, plan to bring to council in October that will um, bring us closer to uh, more fuller cost recovery in our, um, in our fees. We've also um, brought on an investment advisor that's allowed us to improve our investment allocation and, um, and returns on our investments. And we've been doing a few more. We brought back some TOT audits. We kind of put that on pause for a while. Those have come back. So we're um, implementing many of these strategies that we've identified here, kind of in the categories of expenditure costs, service delivery changes, and revenue enhancements. So looking at what we are um, project projecting for the next few years, um, as I mentioned for 25, or as Matt mentioned, um, we are bringing a balanced budget. We initially had projected a $2.4 million deficit. Between the time of printing and today, we've been able to do some additional work to um, examine the revenues as well as the expense side of things to bring that into balance. We really wanted to um, not have to project dipping into reserves. So we're able to do that for 25. We also expect 24 to come in balanced. We, we adopted a balanced budget for 24, and we do expect that trend to continue and as, as we get closer to closing the year. 
Um, 26 and 27, you'll see a dip, and that's really as we bring back those transfers, the Economic Development Trust Fund, the CIP, those transfers come back in, so that's why you see a, a dip there. Um, the, in 28, we kind of go back up a little bit, and um, that is really reflective of new hotels coming online, so we have additional TOT revenue, as well as the fact that we um, have been making a $2 million transfer to the IT fund every year to support our um, new enterprise resource planning system that we're in the process of um, getting implemented. So that transfer stops or sunlights in 28. So that's why you see a little bit of a bump there. And then, you know, basically after that, we're still kind of chasing revenues, chasing expenditures. Um, the chart on the right there is the one that um, reflects where our reserves are. The red line is where we want to be. We want to be at two months unrestricted reserves. Right now, where, where we are, um, we're below that red line. The pension reserve, which is kind of the, the second and fourth boxes there, those, um, that is a reserve that we have. That we, it is restricted, so we don't count that, or that is not counted as part of our state, meeting the needs, meeting the policy in our stabilization policy. So we do have that pension reserve. It can only be used for pensions. The other two reserves, um, we are, you can tell we are still a little bit below or where we would like to be. Since we expect 24 and 25 to come in balanced, um, I don't anticipate any change in those reserves right now. Everything will pretty much stay exactly where they are for the next two years. Um, if we do have a surplus, then we can look at what that means exactly for, for our reserves. We can get things a little closer. But, but basically, we look at um, we're still trying to get up to our two-month reserve target. So getting into the numbers. So this is how the first column here is the budget that you have in the proposed document we had for the general fund. So we showed a deficit of 2.4 million. So what we um, have done and tried to um, not use reserves. So we did a little bit digger deep, deeper dive into some of our revenues. Um, we looked at the model and how things were being calculated. We also took into account that we have this, the county overall is um, tourist, the tourism industry is really coming back stronger than we had anticipated. So we um, increased our revenue for ad tax. That's something we usually budget very low on just because it's very volatile. We don't know what's going to happen if there's a pandemic or something. So we usually um, budget that very low. We did bump that up a little bit, as well as increases to the utility users tax that we um, noticed in our model were not calculating correctly. And then a couple of um, that 300000 there, some other changes that we made in, re in expenses, just to, um, some cleanup there to make sure that things were going to the right funds. So with those, um, we are able to bring in a budget of $150.3 million in revenues and the same $150.3 million in expenditures. So I talked a little bit about um, contract costs and how those are increasing. So even though we strove with departments to try and keep the budget status quo. We were able to add this additional 1.6 million in um, contract increases, um, legal compliance requirements, things that we had to do. We have um, the development um, software that we have, the land permitting software. We did put an additional 500,000 into that. Um, so all of these things are additional 1.6 that we're able to actually come in a little bit above or kind of give to departments so they did not have to absorb those costs. In the past, we've had we've asked departments to absorb contract increases. So we're very happy this year to be able to not put that burden on the departments but be able to bring it into the budget. So this is some of the things that are those contract increases, that 774000 on the previous slide. These are some of the things that um, the contract increases that we um, have in the budget. Um, Harvey West Pool, we've got some software, Microsoft 365, water rates at the golf course, um, mattress replacements in the fire stations, fee study, fuel. So all of these things are basically increases we, that were out of our control. So we didn't want to put that burden um, to the departments. The general fund will be added money for these increases. And then for positions in the general fund, we are recommending six positions here. One um, in the city council office um, to support, or administrative assistant to support city council and CPVAW. Um, human resources and administrative assistant. 
IT, a business systems analyst. We've got lots of new um, implementations. I mentioned our enterprise resource planning. We've got the um, permitting system. We have lots of new initiatives on the IT side, so they've requested a business systems analyst to support that. The three positions in police are um, to allow for a better career ladder for staff. Following these um, additions, there will be the freezing of positions. So really the net for those three police positions is about $65,000. So it's not the full um, you know, 3, 350 that you see there. So, um, but those positions, so that just allows for some more um, growth in the police department. So then all of these are um, another $1.3 million in positions that we have for other funds. This reflects up at the top, we've got three economic development positions that will be funded by the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and the Public Art Fund. And then um, finance is having a new position, a risk management tech and that will be funded by the Liability Fund. IT, another business systems analyst, this one specifically to be spread out and supported to support the various enterprise funds. 10% of that will be general fund, but the rest of it will be um, paid for by the enterprise funds. And then public works, an additional mechanic in the, that's supported by the fleet fund and four resource recovery workers in the refuse fund to reflect changing. We used to have um, contract, we're bringing some contract services in-house, so that's the four additional positions that we have in the refuse um, department. And then something that we have a little bit more of this year that we haven't had in the past is limited term positions. Um, you've heard, I've talked a lot about um, our enterprise resource planning, our ERP system. So to support that initiative, we're in the process of um, develop, or finding a vendor, making that selection, and then starting the implementation. Um, so to do that, this is a huge burden on staff. So we have... Um, asked departments to identify what sort of limited term support they would need to help us get through this implementation. Um, most all of these are for three year limited term. They're fully benefited positions. They just are three years instead of ongoing. And they're specifically to help us backfill so that current staff can be used to help move forward the, um, the implementation of the ERP. The exception there is the um, Assistant Urban Forester for Parks. That is a, um, that's funded by a grant that they received, so that position also is a limited term but not directly related to the ERP. So looking at our citywide budget, $320 million. This does not include the CIP. This is just the operating budget. So bulk of that, of course, is the general fund, but then we've got all of our enterprise funds over there, special revenue funds, internal service, everything, all the all, all things operations. Um, so that's our $320 million citywide, um, citywide budget. So looking at the CIP, um, we, in 24, we adopted a um, little policy, a mandate, of pause, prioritize, prioritize, and plan so that we did not provide new general fund funding for CIP projects in 24. And we're going to continue that in 25. Um, it's specifically just the general fund funding. There's lots of other funding that's, that CIP um, projects have. So things are not slowing down. There's still lots going on. Um, but it allows us to kind of focus on those projects that we have out there that may have other funding or that we can move general fund funding around. Um, again, some numbers to put out there. We have about $142 million general CIP program, again, not including the enterprise funds. This year, we've spent about $26.5 million of that. Another 14.7 is encumbered. And here's a list of some of the um, projects that we have that are part of that. So we've been making significant progress on lots of CIP projects. Um, so in fiscal year 25, part of what enables us to balance the budget is not having that $5 million transfer. So we're going to continue that one more year, hope to bring that back in 26. Um, and then just all of the departments who are part of the CIP program have been very strategic in looking at other funding sources, other funding that may be general fund but can be moved from this project to that project. There's been a lot of work to figure out exactly how we can continue moving forward in 25 while we without provide without additional general fund funding. Here's a few of the projects that um, were completed in 24.
and some of the things that are planned for 25. All right, thank you so much, Elizabeth. So as we wrap uh, fiscal year 24, we're incredibly proud of uh, the work that's uh, currently underway. And we do look at fiscal year 25 with a sense of optimism. Uh, we think it provides the city council, the community and city staff, a really robust uh, policy direction to continue achieving the work that's contemplated in your strategic plan. We think it also enhances organizational resilience through mindful fiscal strategies. It helps to maintain fiscal stability while supporting innovative services. And it helps to collaborate with city staff to effectively prioritize services for the community. So we look forward to having a ro robust discussion uh, this morning, answering your questions and receiving any direction you might have on the proposed budget. Thank you. Well, thank you to the city manager and the finance director and to your team and to all the department heads and those involved in putting the budget together, including our workers who provide input, I suspect, at, at all levels in all departments. So thank you all very much for this. Let me start through and see if council members have questions. I'm going to start with the vice mayor and work this way, then I'm going to start here and work this way. Madam Vice Mayor. I echo the mayor's um, comments, and I have to say, and I sent an email right after I got through the first 178 pages, that it was really easy to read for a lay person and easy to digest and it was apparent that um, the staff and the department heads put a lot of thought into um, recognizing the goals that they had accomplished for this last fiscal year and um, setting future goals as well and so with that i do have a lot of questions and notes um and i'll start i'll start <coughs> up. um so one thing that i didn't really see was and this is for planning, additional um, plan checkers or building inspectors to accommodate some of the new construction. And I'm wondering um, about if that is something that is needed. There you are. I was like, I saw you all in here somewhere. I was looking around. Thank you, Vice Mayor Golder, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the city. And yes, that is a uh, consistent challenge, the plan checkers and inspection staff. Um, we actually have vacancies in both of those um, uh, parts of our building division right now. And um, really, it's a, a matter of being able to recruit um, those individuals. Um, we've had um, open recruitments for 20 plus months now um, and had an inability to fill those. And so we did not request additional positions because in part we've got positions that are vacant that we're not able to fill. But I will note that if we have um, projects continue to come in, then we've got to provide those services. We do that through our, our third party um, and um, we may need to rely on uh, more third-party inspection services as well as more construction begins to start up. And um, that presents its own challenges as well, um, but um, we have not requested additional staff for the aforementioned reasons. I've been watching yours and the police department, both of you guys having trouble with recruitment, and I'm wondering if compensation's a factor and if there's ways we look at that and I'm wondering do, do you for lateral transfers do you how do you compare to other for I guess both PD and for um, building do you count people's years of service and you know oh I can I can speak to the building part yeah. not the PD part yeah. I'll, uh, as it relates to building um, we uh, recently with the with the adjustments yeah. um, that were done in February we um, adjusted up to be 10% below market. Um, we were um, slightly below that um, before. Um, and um, even um, at that position, it's, it's challenging to recruit. There's, there's a lot of exciting projects that are happening here in the city. And so you know, we, we try to encourage um, applicants based on you know, the type of projects they'll get to work on. But um, it's not exclusive to the city. I will say um, it is a, a challenging recruiting environment in the building division um, through in, in cities throughout the state. Um, 
I know that's the case in the, the three other cities that I've worked in. And um, the, the private sector um, can um, outcompete us when sure. it comes to that. And so then I think to my, my question is, and maybe it's a process question, if I have some recommendations, <clears throat> this is not the time or this is the Actually time? Actually, it is. Okay, then I have a recommendation that I'd like to propose that we look at some of the positions that are habitually vacant and hard to fill and look at um, making those, making, and I'm not, I don't know how, making adjustments to the compensation in those to make them um, more desirable, at least compared to other jurisdictions near us. As to process, yeah. let's see if we can agree on something here. Uh, so today is essentially our first public look at the budget. We've all been sharing it since uh, it came out over the weekend. Uh, we will have another opportunity, uh, a way to do this. We can do this a couple of ways. We can do it quite formally. We can do motions and all of that. Another way to do it is uh, we'll use your example. Uh, you are asking a question, could you return on or before the last day of budget hearings with a response to this issue? We'll just do that uh, so cool. council members can get their questions, you can respond. Does anyone feel the need to do that by motion? Are we all right doing this in a little less formally? Very good. Please proceed. So that, that was my first one, is I just want to look at some of those really hard positions to fill in terms of compensation. And yeah, I appreciate the comment, Councilmember Golder, and it's certainly something that we're, we're very concerned about across all of our departments. We are going to be embarking on an updated compensation study. Uh, retention and attraction are one of the data points we look at as we're looking about level setting uh, compensation for any particular position. Uh, so that is work that we will, um, we will be embarking on. I want to also just note, note that we are approaching the, the tail end of a three-year um, MOU with with all of our, our bargaining groups. Uh, so, so come the tail end of this year and early next year, we'll be sitting down at the, down at the table with our groups again, and of course, uh, talking through of, among other topics, compensation as well. So uh, more to come on that, uh, but appreciate that direction and something that we will be working on. And then, and I don't know what the best way to do this is with different departments or what, but in terms of building department two, I just know that some of our projects are exempt from impact fees. And I, I would like to take a look at exploring having all projects pay some sort of impact fees, not to make them, you know, unfeasible. But I think with the, um, the amount of development, there's certainly impact to parks, there's certainly impacts to public safety and child care and things like that. And so I would be interested in seeing that. We agree with you. And we do plan on bringing some proposals back to the council this fiscal year. Um, more to come on that. Um, and, you know, one of those examples is our our public safety uh, impact fee that doesn't apply, uh, for example, to affordable housing projects. Mm -hmm. So we have been having some discussion around uh, charging perhaps a prorated percentage uh, in those projects to better capture the additional demands that it places on our public safety services. So uh, we will be uh, bringing those proposals back to the council. Um, okay. <laughs> Is it okay if I just keep going? Please okay. Do. So. Um, Fire engines, and I'm sorry if I'm not saying it right. I know there's trucks and engines, and they all are different things. And I know one of the ones that's in there, I I understand we're getting from a grant, um, and so we that's where we learned at the public safety committee. Um, but I know we've had challenges getting fire equipment in the past, and so I just wonder if there's a schedule for replacing that equipment, and I want to make sure that we're ready for that. Appreciate that comment. Uh, replace, replacing an apparatus is a major investment, uh, as I'm sure you could appreciate, uh, Councilmember Golder. Uh, Chief Odie and his team have developed a replacement schedule. Uh, just over the last couple of fiscal years, we've been fortunate uh, to fund two uh, apparatus replacements, and we have plans for, uh, for replacing others as they've reached the end of their useful life. Um, we're not always in, in any particular fiscal year in a position to do so based on how things are pacing, but it is an area that we have been prioritizing. Um, thank you. The next one with Parks and Rec. Um, and this one kind of goes back up. I saw the demolition of the Poganip Clubhouse as, as an unfunded project right now, but I'm wondering if there's a way with um, 
putting an idea of doing some sort of um, improvements up there that will help facilitate active recreation other than mountain biking and hiking if the homeless garden project isn't going to land there maybe pivoting in some way um, I've got lots of ideas but um, I'm sure other people do too but I just wanted to say if we're tearing that down I just don't want to see it become more encampments up there and not that that's you know a huge draw for people but just looking at activating that space I'm going to ask Tony Elliott to come up on that one. <laughs> we do have a master plan for the Poconip open space area, and there are elements of it that are no longer relevant. Exactly. Tony and I have been having some conversations around potentially taking a fresh look and, of course, engaging the community in what those uh, options could be. But I'll let Tony dive in on that. Parks directors recognized. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Thank you for that question, uh, Vice Mayor Golder. Uh, lots going on in Poganip. Um, as the city manager mentioned, we have uh, an older uh, Poganip master plan uh, that uh, may be ripe uh, to relook at, or at least components of that. We don't have budget for that right now. We don't have that uh, in the budget uh, or really a, a timeline for that. But there's opportunity to look at Poganip, I believe, as a whole from a trail standpoint, uh, from a broader use standpoint, from a maintenance standpoint as well. Uh, and this pertains to the Poganip Clubhouse uh, currently. So the clubhouse uh, is in disrepair. Uh, it is currently red tagged. Um, it is, it really has, um, uh, it, we've sort of scaled back on the fire suppression on that facility. Our vendors and contractors um, are really no longer willing to service that building because it is collapsing, it's failing. Uh, we collectively say that uh, Parks and Recreation, the building department, uh, and the fire department have collaborated on this a lot. We've monitored the condition of the building. We've had engineers and architects look at the building. Uh, it is in disrepair and really needs to be uh, raised or um, or decommissioned, uh, torn down. And so uh, that is uh, was not included in the budget. Uh, and so we are looking at what that process might be to really consider that. Um, that's a big policy decision for the city council. And so we really want to bring that um, in, in a more complete way uh, to the council um, before we uh, take any steps forward on that. But a lot of work to do there as it relates to the building and the park as a whole. Um, and happy to work on proposals in terms of a planning process that we could bring back to the council for consideration. I don't have any ideas today, but I just think when, it, when you have that in there and, if, and whether or not Homeless Garden lands there, we should probably revisit it at some point in the next year would be a hope. Um, uh, okay, thank you. The other thing as relates to Poganip um, and more for PD is I know there's a lot of encampments up there. Um, the head of the mountain mountain trail, I can't remember her name right now, mentioned that and I've had my own experiences. Um, it, would it be possible to get e-bikes for the police department to do some patrols up there? Um, I also think about, I don't know if anyone follows the, the Portland bicycle police, but they do some amazing things with their little e-bikes up in Portland in terms of, um, Patrols. The police chief is recognized. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Uh, we actually already have e-bikes. A lot of it comes down to staffing. Got it. Okay. Uh, as far as being able to uh, patrol those open spaces, um, but I think you did mention it. You saw in our future goals, it, it is a priority of ours to build up our staffing to the point where we have more proactive public safety presence in our parks and open spaces. So. Uh, I think you will see some more progress there moving forward, um, but it's not about the equipment, it's, it's about the staff. Okay, thank you. And I hate to bounce around, but as long as you're standing there, we did talk about something at public safety, and I'll bring it up now, is we would like to look at organizing and maybe with community partners a, um, a uh, fireworks display maybe in the summer of 2025 on the 4th of July that's organized. Um, we talked about it at public safety as a way that it might prevent people from doing illegal fireworks, and it was such a huge success at the boardwalk two weekends ago. Um, and so we thought maybe other community partners might be willing to contribute financially because they know it's a big expense, but having, as we know, something positive for people to do usually keeps people from doing what they're not supposed to do. So I don't know if you have any comments for that. Or yeah, I know reasons. years ago we, the city used to do something on, on 4th of July. Um, I think it's something, it's kind of how well we manage it and plan it ahead of time because 
Um, I think it will potentially prevent some of the illegal activities, but I think some, because of the holiday, will still partake in their in their own individual celebrations. So it really could potentially stretch our, our resources really thin um, by attracting a lot of people from outside of the area. Thank you. Um, I feel like I'm going kind of all over the place. Does somebody you, else want to? You don't need to apologize. Okay. Go through your list and we'll right. move on Thank to the you. next one. You're doing fine. My next one is about the rental inspection program. Um, I'm wondering, and I've asked this before, all, at, we've had it for more than five years, so theoretically, and I know some new rentals come online, if it's something that we need to have. Um, or is it something we could explore complaint-based again? And I know Mr. Butler's told me that a lot of people don't pass the inspection, but some of the things, um, like a doorbell, like it's hardly worth moving out for. Uh, I don't know if it's something that we can just revisit if we need, and is it staffed? The planning director is recognized. Good afternoon, Mr. Butler. Thank you. So we do still have um, a high significance of uh, properties that do not pass the rental inspection. Um, the rental inspection also you know, provides protections to some of the most vulnerable folks in our community in terms of um, making sure that they have a healthy and safe living environment. Um, the, I'd, have to, I'd have to check, but the, uh, historically, the number one thing that our team finds is that um, smoke uh, detectors and, C and carbon monoxide detectors are um, not um, in units, and we know that's a, a life safety issue that um, our team regularly finds is, is not in place. Um, we do have provisions in place um, with the, the fees for um, uh, rental inspections. I believe they're around you know, $75 or $80 or so. Um, for the initial unit, and then it can scale down after that initial unit. Um, they go towards funding that program, and um, we have not had um, full staffing in that program um, in the, the last, over this fiscal year, in part due to um, our retirement, and um, then someone who was out on, on leave. Um, and so um, we are looking forward to getting back up to that um, and can ensure we can we can look at our fees as well to make sure that we're um, accomplishing full cost recovery. Do you um, inspect the bigger complexes or just like mom and pop type rentals? We do inspect the larger ones. Um, so when a, a building is constructed, there's a I believe it's a five year period when um, we do not have any inspections. You know. Presumably, things are in working good working order for at least five years. And then we go out and we inspect a portion of those units. Um, so if there's a 100-unit complex, we're, we're not inspecting all 100 units. We're inspecting a, a small number of them. And then um, based on that, um, we are um, ultimately going to get through all of those units, but not on in a single year. It's, it's over a period. In terms of cost recovery, though, are those larger units? Do you is it like is there a do you charge per unit or is it? It it is a per unit, but it's it's smaller in part because we're going out and we're inspecting you know ten units at the same place. If it's a hundred unit property, maybe we're inspecting ten of them or five of them, and um, so it's one trip out and it's it's the same unit that we're in, it's the same often unit types that Got we're it. inspecting okay. in each one. Okay. So there's a little bit of efficiency there. Okay. All right, thank you. That was my question about that. Um, um, uh, okay. Um, in terms of, I was looking at on page 206, the amount of tons of debris removed by public works um, for homeless encampments. I think if there's anything that can be done to prevent them from getting started in the first place, and I know that's not your department, that's kind of everybody's department, I don't know, I don't have a specific ask, I guess, but I think, um, wow, that's a lot of waste going to the landfill and it's certainly not being sorted and um, some of it's hazardous waste and it's just, like, that's a lot. What can we do to prevent it from accumulating in the first place? And I don't... 
Nathan may have thoughts on this. We might want to call up Lisa Murphy as well, uh, our deputy city manager who's over our HRT team. But I, I will just say that um, that's our goal. Yeah. Our goal is to help to ensure that large encampments are not forming in areas where it's causing that level of environmental degradation and damage. It's unfortunate that we ha have to have a dedicated team to addressing those encampments, but it's the reality that we live in. I know that the number looks a bit staggering, but what I will say is that the team has really made progress over the last uh, two years and uh, again, trying to mitigate the large encampments, which, which tend to be the most expensive when they do eventually form. Um, we expect for the foreseeable future that we will have a need for that work and you'll continue to see uh, those numbers um, those numbers in future budgets. And I did and I did see and I sorry if I'm cutting you off but I did see like uh, on there um, the navigation center and those other things that we're doing down improvements on Coral Street to help address this and I just would like to encourage us in any way that we can collaborate with the county to encourage the other cities to help um, with this. It's not a Santa Cruz issue it's really a regional issue and it's frustrating and a little disappointing that I feel like it's coming out of the Santa Cruz budget to pay for these sorts of things when it's it's, it's everybody's um do you have something you want to add to that and, and just one more um one more comment with regards to what we're what we're spending on the cleanup okay. it has significantly dropped from where it was two years ago when we looked at collectively how much we were spending across all of our departments really just um, mitigating encampments, dealing with the challenges associated with homelessness, it was near nearly 10 million. Uh, we're now investing in up, upstream services and support that have signif significantly reduced the amount of time and expense that we're having to spend on those large encampments. But I do hear you that this should be a regional effort, not just a, a city of Santa Cruz left, and we continue to be engaged with our, uh, our county partners and, and the other cities and agencies in our area uh, to do, the, do their part. And I appreciate that approach, and I think everybody that's helped out with that, because I think it has made a, a difference. If I could, yeah. uh, thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, if I might add uh, a comment to what the city manager said. The city manager and I have been working not only with our county partners, but a couple of the cities who have heretofore perhaps not uh, engaged in a fiscal way with regard to shelter and some other activities. And we had a very positive conversation with uh, the mayor of the city of Scotts Valley and another positive conversation with the mayor of Capitola, both of whom are interested in making a contribution in their fiscal year coming up uh, in that regard to help us. The other reason that's important is because we are still have an ask at the state legislature between the legislature and the governor with regard to a bit of a bridge from here uh, for oh, roughly half a year till our sales tax money kicks in in terms of our costs of sheltering operation. And the governor's office has indicated to the city manager and to me that in order for them to do that, they would like to see participation by all the cities and the county. Oh, okay. And so we are working with them to do exactly that. Thank you for doing that. I think all of us can reach out to our colleagues at the other cities. I don't know how, well, anyway, we could all do that. Thank you, I appreciate that. And then this is a question, I don't know, I think it's for Parks and Recs, but page 230, there was something called a dingo in attachments. I'm, what, what is a dingo? I could have Googled it, but it's just, uh, I kind of wanted to ask, and I was hoping it was something to clean the sand, because we saw that cool demonstration. Mr. Elliot, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to introduce our acting Park Superintendent, Mike Godsey, to answer the dingo question. <laughs> good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, great question. And Thanks for the question. Yeah, the dingo, it's a little confusing. It's actually a hand-driven mini excavator, like a skid okay. steer, and it has many attachments for brooming, excavating, trenching, drilling. Um, and it comes on a trailer, and it's towed behind a simple 250 Ford vehicle, and it's basically a mini skid steer that's driven by hand, so it can get into smaller spaces. I should have went to the touch of truck. That maybe I could have seen. It. <laughs> yeah, it's called a dingo. Dingo. Um, okay. Well, then, then I guess two parks and recreation. We did see that demonstration of that sand cleaning. Do we have something for cowls that we could use on? I know the wharf crew is lean, or I don't know who does it, but I like. It, it's a great question. I think you're referring to um, it's a it's a robot 
uh, that we demoed out at Main Beach and Cal Beach that cleans the beaches. Uh, this is a, um, a product we, we tried several months ago. We do not have a budget uh, proposed in the budget before the city council for that robot. Uh, that is something that we are interested in exploring over time. Uh, we do have beach combing, beach sifting equipment to clean the beaches currently, but we don't have uh, a robot uh, at this point. But would love to explore that down the road. I just didn't know if it yep. was something you were interested in. I, I think it is. There's um, there's work to do there, um, but it cleans the beach in a more uh, sort of detailed and, and sort of deeper, more robust way than our sifter that we have currently. So I think there are opportunities to look into that in the future. We don't have that in this year's budget. Thank you. Um, the, the other thing, and I don't know if this is Parks and Work or Public, Parks and Rec or Public Works, but I've gotten a couple of reports, and so has my colleague, of people slipping and falling and hitting their heads on the stairs that go down to indicators and to the lane. Um, and I just think the seaweed accumulates pretty quickly, but they can be really dangerous, and so I don't know if, what we can do to keep bowls clean. I fell. You fell as yeah. yeah. Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks uh, for that question as well. The surf access stairs along West Cliff and elsewhere in the city are sort of a dual uh, responsibility of both Public Works and Parks and Rec. Uh, generally speaking, Public Works constructs uh, or builds those stairs. Parks and Recreation is responsible for maintaining those stairs. Uh, currently, um, our Open Space and Greenways team uh, pressure wash the surf access stairs on West Cliff approximately once a month. Uh, but in day 28, 29, 30, they're getting pretty slick. Uh, what we are doing right now is actually working on an MOU, an agreement with Save the Waves uh, and some of our surfing uh, community members um, from a volunteerism standpoint uh, to allow volunteers in the surfing community to help assist us with maintaining those stairs. So we want to make sure they're safe. We uh, want to make sure to limit liability um, as people are accessing the ocean. So we're looking for partnerships to keep those cleaner uh, and safer moving forward. So that's an agreement we hope to strike um, and resolve that issue uh, here very soon. Thank you. And I, I think that kind of touches on another thing I was going to bring up in terms of um, ways to save money. And I was thinking about is there positions that we could or things we could take away from different groups and maybe um, save money maintaining certain places. I know we looked at, um, Councilman Brown and I looked at doing, um, you know, kind of a neighborhood adopt a park and those kinds of things where it would cut down on staff's time. And I'm thinking even like the median on Woodrow, people could be out there pulling weeds instead of the team having to weed whack. And, and I don't know if there's opportunities for that. It would involve volunteers or groups, but if there is, I don't know. We are uh, certainly open to that. Um, and, um, and Adopt a park as one example uh, is certainly something that I'm sure Tony's team has explored uh, <coughs> over the years. Medians can get uh, a little challenging just because they can pose a safety risk to those that are in the median. So how that happens and the traffic control related to it is important as well. Uh, but we're always open to opportunities to partner with uh, with the community. Thank you. Um, okay. My next is I we've, we've heard a lot about traffic safety and people wanting safe routes for walking um, to different places in the neighborhood. Well, I'm sure all of us have. And one thought around sidewalks, and I don't know if this is possible, if there's any way, is that to pass a rental inspection, you have to have your sidewalk. Or to, if we could have a program where um, the city offered low interest financing for, and I don't know where the money would come from, this is just an idea, for individuals to install their sidewalks. But I think there's a lot of opportunity. That, I don't know, I counted like 20 houses on Westcliff that didn't have sidewalk, or that you're talking, I saw it on somewhere, with the one by Garfield Park. Good I don't afternoon. have any plan, that's just an idea. The public work director is recognized. Good afternoon, Mr. Nguyen. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, Council Members. Uh, the City of Santa Cruz does have a sidewalk and loop program where development projects, whether it's a single family home, I believe the remodel is over 500 square feet, uh, is required to pay into either establishing a sidewalk adjacent to their property and or paying an in lieu fee at which we build a reserve up and then use that funding to either do individual projects or couple that leverage that funding to go after grants. And so uh, sidewalk improvement is a 
woefully underfunded uh, piece of infrastructure throughout the city. We do have a lot of sidewalk, missing sidewalk and curb ramps, but we do make headway with grant-funded projects such as our Safe Routes to School projects, uh, but we do try to couple that with uh, the sidewalk and loo uh, when feasible. It is the individual property owner's responsibility to have the sidewalk, right, mm -hmm. and pay for it. We don't require uh, homes that have missing sidewalks to install a sidewalk unless they are going through a development, meaning they're doing an addition or remodeling their house. ADU doesn't count. ADU does not count. Solar panels don't count. That's correct. So what about passing rental inspection? Can we make that count? I think that's something that we could look into and explore, and I'd have to... I well, don't want to piss anyone off, but I probably am. But I think like that could get a few built. That was just an idea. You don't have to, nobody has to answer me. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, okay. This is, I, I think, maybe for Bonnie or I don't know for who, but it's, I'm just wondering if places like um, the tannery or other places that the city owns the property but are managed by other people, whether those have annual rent increases. Not that I want to make it unaffordable for people, but to cover as we look at our, t our water, you know, going up 10% a year for the next 10 years or for holding in reserve for um, improvements to the properties over time because that one's getting older and I just was wondering what the... Good afternoon, Ms. Lipscomb. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for that question. So our affordable housing projects are rent restricted. They do increase over year, but they're based on HUD standards. So each year in May, they put out the new income limits, and so those are raised within those. Awesome. That's all. Yeah, that's what I didn't know. Thank you. And then um, another one, I saw the project about Bay Drive, which, by the way, I thought it was a typo, and I looked, and I was wrong, that it's actually Bay Drive, that part of the street. But... Has anybody done outreach to High Street or Western Drive as part of that process to, to make sure that the traffic that's coming down from the university and Bonnie Dune doesn't like, if the good we're doing of creating the bike lane doesn't overburden the other neighbors with more cars? Does that make sense? Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Vice Mayor Golder. Yes, the, the city has done some outreach with regards to the Bay Drive protected bike lane and pedestrian project. It's been in a CIP project, I believe, the last uh, two years. Uh, it's, and we've inched forward as far as the design and development and done some outreach with some of the impacted neighbors. But as far as the neighbors uh, really outside or when we're talking about high and up towards the mountains, um, I can't recall uh, saying that we've done a uh, specific outreach beyond, you know, the impacted impacted zone. Correct? I'm going to suggest that just because otherwise I know I'm going to hear about it is can we please reach out to High Street and Western Drive and just notify them that this is happening, tell them where they can give input, because otherwise uh, if they don't have notice, then I'm afraid of what's going to happen. Yeah, we, we can work with the communications team to develop a, a plan around that. Um, okay, like four more things. Um, the dump station for RVs, would this be just for uh, people living in their vehicles or can anybody use it and would there be fees associated with it? Uh, the RV disposal station is would be open to the general public. Okay. So any members who have an RV, whether they're visiting, living in town, uh, housed or unhoused, would be able to utilize this service. I like it. Thank you. Um, and what, this is going to be, sorry, Fred. What aside from tax? Because it's, I know we disagree on taxes. Um, what aside from taxes can we do to 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 save to raise money and look at revenues? And so this I'm punting back to the revenue committee. But I've said before I would love to see um, a water polo tournament and our new pool when it finally gets built. I'd love to see soccer tournaments, travel ball tournaments, mountain biking. I don't care hula hooping, roller skating, whatever it is. I'd like to see events happening in town. As, uh, as throughout the year as a potential uh, revenue generator. I, was, I went over the hill with my sister on Saturday or Sunday for something. We were coming back, and all every car, I was just picturing $10 in tax revenue as they were coming back over the hill, sitting in traffic. And so the more we can bring people in for some of our less crowded weekends to do different things around town that I would love to see. Obviously, the Cold Water Classic is awesome. Things like that where it's like it's a, a, it, it creates positive places for people to be and things to do. Um, thanks, Revenue Committee. All right. 
Do. I'll stop yapping. Someone else. No, that was hardly <laughs> yapping. That was very helpful. Thank you so much. I want to review exactly what we think is coming back with regard to the vice mayor. I showed two specific items. There is something on compensation information. There is something on impact fees. Those are the only two. Others were comments and observation. Do we agree? Very good. Councilmember Collinbar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. I think the vice mayor would be covered it all. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I do have some additional um, observations and questions, and I do want to start out by thanking everyone for the work on this. It was, uh, as was has been said, it was really easy to digest and, and go through and understand. Um, okay, so I'm going to go department by department. I try to organize myself in that way. Um, some departments I have more questions about. So economic development, um, just one, I think, smallish question in the FY25 goals. Um, I didn't see the temporary farmer's market site explicitly called out. Maybe I missed it, but just wondering what the thinking there was. Yeah. Um, so the temporary farmer's market goal, we're, we're hoping to actually wrap that up in this current fiscal year. Okay. As far as the location, we do have a preferred location that their board voted on. Um, and so we're working on getting those final details together for them, and then we'll be pivoting to the permanent location process. And we're hoping to kick off that contract, and that's looking at the existing library site, what that would look like um, in combination with the farmer's market um, and a, 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 couple, a couple other combinations and kick that off later this summer. Great. Thank you. Okay, I have one question for IT. Um, the, um, I think this was an under accomplishment, I can't remember if it was accomplishment or goal, but the um, updating of the CRISP app, um, I, I'm just wondering what that entails. I'm asking because there's a project I'm working on that uses the CRISP, so I just would like to understand it a little bit better. Uh, that would be a, a code update that took place on the back end. Uh, we had a relatively antiquated code base that was mostly not cosmetic on the front end, but we did make some enhancements with the mapping. Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, this is SCPD. Um, oh, um, okay, sorry. Now I've, I've just gotten myself disorganized. So um, a couple of questions uh, or comments, I guess, um, for FY25 goal. This goes to our meeting a couple weeks ago around um, sting operations. I know that we have a tobacco grant, and um, I'm hoping to see some stronger language in FY25 goals around sting operations for substances across the board, alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco. So that's a question recommendation to add that as an FY25 goal, since that was the direction given at the last council meeting. Yeah, we, we agree with those goals, and, and we will strive to have more proactive uh, enforcement stings with all of those elements, like you talked about, alcohol, cannabis, and, and tobacco. Um, it, it all obviously depends on our staffing availability to, to get those done, but we, we, we share the same goal. Can we name that explicitly? Because I didn't see it named. We can add it to the budget. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the other question or observation, and I know we have an item later on, um, but I'm connecting the two pieces of um, um, response time to investigations. Um, that's related to a later item, but I'm connecting it to the positions that are requested, the three positions. Do, will any of those support that need in the department? Yes, that's the reason for the investigative analyst position. Everything today is electronic and involves a technology, and everything, it seems like every investigation includes looking into phones, looking into computers, and really I think over time we'll benefit with that position because previously we've been using a sworn position for that work, and we tend to train somebody, buy a lot of expensive equipment, and they go to Google or they go over the hill somewhere. Now we're looking at civilianizing that position with the goal of hopefully the salary will actually be less than a sworn position and we'll hopefully keep that person. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, Parks and Rec. <laughs> um, so I have some questions about the CIP. Really glad to see some of the 
the projects moving forward. The depot field replacement, and I know we've emailed about this, um, will there be, can there be consideration of looking at housing and improving, excuse me, housing, um, lighting, improving the lighting at depot field? Um, I said housing because, we, as we know, there will be more housing there, there will be more foot traffic there, that field gets used quite often, um, we have an active RV program there, so is that part of the consideration when we're looking at doing depot in this named project? Yeah, thank you for that question. If I'm not mistaken, that item for Depot Park for the turf replacement uh, is in our future capital improvement planning, so not an item for fiscal year 25. It's future. Uh, for, so we've got about probably a year to two left on that turf at Depot Park. Um, and uh, at this point, the number that's in here would only include that turf replacement, so that would not include lights. However, I do think you raise a really good point. Uh, that field is heavily used. Um, heavily demanded. We have requests for adding lighting there pretty fr uh, frequently. Mm -hmm. So that could be a component that we add. Uh, with that said, there would be a, a big neighborhood process. That would be mm -hmm. a, a discussion we would want to have with the neighbors, um, obviously with the proximity to Neary Lagoon and mm -hmm. uh, environmentally sensitive locations. We'd want to be really thorough in that analysis, but I think that's a good recommendation. And broadly at Depot Park, there may be an opportunity to think about uh, that park um, holistically as well as far as the bike ramps, uh, the building itself. So there may be an opportunity to expand that as we look at that uh, in fiscal year 26 uh, or beyond. Um, okay, yeah, because there was another CIP item that was more general. It was like studies, designs, and construction items for uh, Parks and Rec, and I think it was like 100,000, I can't remember. So I was wondering if this specific piece about um, lighting can happen sooner rather than later under that CIP, if that would fit. Good question. I might invite sense. up our principal management analyst, Lindsay Bass, to speak to that. Great. Thanks. The general $100,000 uh, CIP item is more to make certain projects shovel ready um, mm -hmm. to get them to a point where we can get them entered in as new CIP or to move them more expeditiously. And also, you know, at some point, um, projects sometimes require additional studies. Um, so that's just something that allows us to be a little more nimble. Um, the lighting component at Depot would most likely be higher than that. Okay. Um, but uh, it is definitely something that we are looking at in conjunction with the turf. But as Tony mentioned, it would require more of a public process to vet that. Makes sense. Okay. So not under that item. Okay. Um, the other related uh, is Harvey West. And I saw there's an item for ball field sand and irrigation. Will turf be considered for that project? Great question. So this summer, we're launching our Harvey West Park redesign process. Uh, and in that process, we expect to uh, include discussion, outreach, uh, and analysis on whether or not the ball fields at Harvey West could be uh, rebuilt in a way to use artificial turf rather than real turf. So uh, that's not specifically built into this project that uh, you're referencing, uh, council member. But uh, as we look at the park redesign as a whole, we will definitely consider that. Thank you. Those are my Parks and Rec questions. I'm going to go to planning. Um, this, is, this is a comment and a request. Um, we'll, we'll be hearing an item later tonight. Um, but the housing landscape has, of course, changed in our community, and the discretion that we have as council members has changed. Um, and I know we've emailed about this, but the, the public process and the community outreach process, I think, needs to be reworked and rethought on these big big housing projects. So it would be great to see. I would like to see uh, some language in the FY25 goal of, of uh, improved community engagement, engagement and outreach process for housing development. Happy to do that. OK. And um, the other, this is maybe just a, a question. Um, the building permit process for local businesses, we've heard, is challenging. And I know the planning department is very aware of this and working on this, um, but I didn't see that called out either in, in the FY goals or even accomplishments, because I know the, the planning department is working on it. Right, we're happy to add that as well if it's not already included. Um, both of those things are things that we're actively working on. OK, yes, please do. Will do. Thank you. Okay, Public Works is, is almost my last. 
Um, Vice Mayor Golder did ask some of my questions, but um, on this, uh, oh, she asked some of my questions, but not this one. So there's the Westcliff stair repair. Is that the stairs at, at Manor, or is that the Steamer Lane stairs that Vice Mayor Golder was speaking to earlier? That's under the CIP, I believe. That's a great question. I, I don't recall off the top of my head which staircase that is. I see uh, Kevin Crossley, our assistant okay. director, is on, and maybe you can provide uh, some background there on which staircase we're talking about. Great. I didn't hear that. Your your um, audio hold isn't on, working well. Hold on, just a second, sir. We're having a your volume's pretty low here for us. Hang on, just one moment. Let's see if we can hear you. Make sure your volume's up. Okay, let's give that a try again. Nope. No. Evan, if you want to come down to the chambers and, and help yeah. respond, we can why go we, on to the next we question. Why do suspend on this item? We'll return, but but please continue okay. with your questions. Um, okay, so the uh, traffic, I was wondering where, I saw Bethany Curve in there. We, we know that work's happening. The traffic mitigation efforts that I know are in play related to the, the upcoming, the, the closure of Bethany Curve and all the upcoming changes, where is that? woven in or is it woven in because I didn't see the work around traffic mitigation good good question councilmember Tari Johnson the traffic the temporary traffic control plan is woven into the infill wall projects okay and so Bethany curve includes the TCP that you see out there today okay and then um, I know we've had we have a grant for the um, improved bike and pedestrian um, on Delaware, improvements on bike and pedestrian access on Delaware. And and I think that's still happening, but I didn't see that either. Uh, yes, we have a project, CIP project, the Swanton Delaware multi-use oh, so uh, project. I just that. Yep. Okay. It is in the CIP. Sorry, I missed that one. That's it for public works, thank you. Yep. Um, this is maybe a question to uh, our city manager. So um, I didn't see, the Children's Fund and the implementation of the Children's Fund, the Children and Youth Bill of Rights and the Youth Liaison embedded in any of our department's moving forward goals. And I don't know where it lives, and maybe that's the bigger dilemma here, is that they don't really have a home yet. Uh, so I guess I'm asking a question, making an observation, and maybe a recommendation that we find a place for them to live and have that reflected in the budget. Uh, thank you for that comment. Um, I think that's right. It's more of a reflection of making a decision as to where those um, where that work will live uh, longer term. Uh, but absolutely, once uh, we land on whether it will continue with my office or perhaps migrate uh, to Parks and Rec, we'll ensure that it's reflected in the budget somewhere. If, if it's possible, maybe we can land on that before we adopt this budget. Because we've been having the conversation for a while. We're happy to work towards that. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Nguyen, on the previous question. Yeah, if I may follow up with a response to the CIP project that includes the West Coast Staircase. There is no funding program for fiscal 25 okay. uh, proposed this year, but we are hoping to get funding into fiscal 26, and then we will reevaluate which staircase uh, would be worked on next. Okay, so we don't know yet at this point. Okay, thank you. All right, my last question um, back to city manager. Um, there's a number of ordinances that we will consider as a council in the next few months. The gas powered leaf blower for one, micro hauling ordinance. Um, obviously, we don't know if those will pass or not, but how does that, in terms of just the process for the budget, do we just integrate the implementation of those and what it would require as we update the budget? Um, okay, that was it. Yes, that's uh, typically how we would operationalize uh, those policies and ordinances once they are officially enacted. Uh, rather than uh, staff making assumptions as to whether or not, for instance, the council would support uh, a leaf blower ordinance, we wait until those are in place and then we work towards making adjustments to the budget in the future. Makes sense. Thank you. Those are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Contar Johnson. 
Councilmember Bruner, and for those of you who were not here earlier, I want to point out, that especially those of you online, Councilmember Bruner has a, a issue with her voice right now, uh, and so we will give you the floor, but we're going to all have to listen closely. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for presenting this budget and balanced budget. Uh, so far, so thank you, I appreciate that. And um, really calling out and prioritizing essential services and the city staff that provide those services. I think taking a step back, you know, all of these questions are great, but I think our priority that I just wanna call out is so important that we really show and call out in our budget the essential services as a municipality that we provide and the support to um, our city staff that provides those services and that we continue to invest in and support the equipment, the tools, the systems that city staff needs to provide these essential services to operate and run our entire city. And so when we talk about, um, you know, the questions have been great. Thank you for asking. Some of my questions have been asked as well about filling positions, compensation, and what is needed. We rely on you all to let us know. And um, we can tell you what we hear from our constituents, what we see in the city, and, and that we continue to show that in, in, in our budget, right? Um, so one thing, I'm going to ask Fire if you could come up, please. We recently had a public safety committee meeting last week. And um, there, there was just a couple of questions. Um, I know that uh, when I started in 2020, um, the priority then was a new engine. It was very important. We had an older engine that was breaking down. And this is a necessity for public safety. And I'm so happy that we recently have acquired the new engine that we started back then, that process and budgeting for. And then it was two, two and a half years to, to finally build and get here. So in the fire um, columns, I don't see anything budgeted for this coming year for the engines. And I know we still have two older engines and knowing how long it takes and the prices just keep going up. I would like to see some direction of investment in continuing that in our engines. So not waiting until they break down or they're out of compliance. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a great uh, guess. Thank you. Council member, uh, Rob Odie, fire chief. Thank you, mayor. Thank you, council. Um, that is a great comment and question. That's something I've been working with uh, the city manager and uh, actually the whole uh, finance team on and, and my team. Uh, it has been a challenge. Uh, it hasn't necessarily just been a challenge, um, you know, from the city's standpoint. It's been a, a challenge industry wide. Um, it currently, as it stands, the turnaround time to not from order to landing uh, said equipment is three years. So if we were to purchase uh, something today, place that order, uh, we wouldn't see it for three years. Um, so to your uh, point, you know, we have uh, three pieces of equipment that are currently, you know, in that, uh, that sort of are at the uh, end of life in terms of uh, the NFPA 1901 recommendations. Uh, we have uh, a front line that's downtown that's a 2015, and one that's at the campus that's a 2012. 
Um, so if we were to order them today, um, and they would be, um, you know, 16 years old, so they'd be end of life by the time we got them if we order them today. Um, same thing if we ordered the, uh, the one downtown in 2015, it would be 13 years old, um, just approaching end of life um, if we were to order it. So again, um, you're not wrong in that we do need something, it's about how we get there, and that's the challenge that we face. Um, and so uh, I know we're working collaboratively on how we get there. Um, and so um, that's, that's something that we're trying to do in terms of the public safety impact fee. And so my team's trying to look sort of creatively at funding mechanisms. Um, and so we're, we sort of will look continuously down that road. Um, but of course, um, it's, it's sort of, it's a challenge. And so, you know, it costs a certain amount now and they'll cost more down the road, but it's, it's that delicate balance of not only a price, at the time that it takes to build. And so I'm just, you know, that's sort of the, the challenge that we face at this point in time. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I just feel like something like that is something we don't have time to figure out down the road. Right. How, like, that's something we have to prioritize in our budget. I don't know if you can speak to. Um, you are, uh, certainly preaching to the choir on this, and I appreciate your advocacy on it, uh, Council Member Bruner, because it is important. Uh, we've been fortunate in the last two fiscal cycles to get really creative in terms of how we were able to uh, purchase those uh, two most recent engines. We had some really difficult decisions we had to make when it came to uh, the FY 2025 budget, uh, especially on the capital side. And so if there was an appetite amongst the council to give direction towards an additional purchase in this fiscal year or the following, uh, we could do so with uh, a spend into fund balance. We could do so by bringing trade-offs in terms of reductions we would need to make perhaps to other capital projects, moving funding around within the existing CIP, uh, or find some way uh, to um, look at potential reductions to um, come up with the funding for it. These are major purchases. They tend to be upwards of a million dollars for each. Yes. Um, but I am sensitive to the fact that we have long uh, turnaround periods for uh, for the purchase. So that's not lost on, lost on us either. I would like to ask for options for this fiscal year to be brought back, please. Okay. Absolutely. I'll have my staff. We'll work on that, and we can work with the city staff as well. And then I had a question also in the... Ms. Bruner, could I ask you, I just want to show you, and, and that request is for options relative to fire apparatus? Yes. Thank you. For funding fire apparatus, knowing that it takes three years. That's I, correct. Yeah, three years. This last one was two and a half years by the time we get it, and it costs, and we have so many more residents coming to our city and new developments and fire is responding to medical emergencies, water rescues. We need fire apparatuses and engines to be functioning. That's the tool that they need to do their job and that our public relies on um, for response. Thank you, Council Member. Um, another question was um, in our public safety committee meeting, the pickup truck that- The type six fire type engine? six, and that was paid for, I thought, with a grant. Yes, that was a federal earmark through Congressman Panetta's office that okay. we had requested, and that will, we'll be actually getting that to the beginning of next year, uh, um, fiscal, uh, not fiscal, calendar year 25. It looked like it was in um, the way that it, that it was laid out, four hundred thousand dollars. It looked mm -hmm. like it was for a Type Six engine. Yeah, it, that's how it's classified. It's like it's classified as an engine, a Type Six engine. It's a. It's but kind, it's not they're all coming, typed differently, it's and not so it's a wild. Out of our. So the money is going know, into our budget. And then it's Coming being out. paid for, but it's it's all being uh, it's Break comes through a thing. federal earmark. Yes. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to correctly? make sure I understood yes. that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank yes. you. I think that was it for fire. Okay. Thank you. Um. So uh, my next um, category is building, planning, housing. <sighs> I 
I believe I, uh, Council Member Vice Mayor Golder uh, spoke and I, just over this past year and with all, all the new development and working on our outdoor dining subcommittee and um, small business residents, permits, plan checks, inspectors, how, how can we invest in supporting that process to not be what it is, like even more so called out in this budget. If you have a vacant, I don't know how many vacant positions you're trying to fill, but if we can take some of that money and invest in getting those positions filled through whatever options are deemed best, whether it's incentives, marketing, training, Third party help, I don't know, but um, I would really like to see investment in that because the ripple effect is even greater. And so um, I know that there's no additional ask or in the budget for that. And you mentioned you had vacant positions that for 20 months you haven't been able to fill. And so, how can we, you know, take some of that to really? invest back into filling those. I don't know where that gets called out, but I see that as another priority that's just escalating. Thank you, I see. Well, a HR. partnership here with yes, planning and development. Yes, thank you. We do Here's have the a- the honest oh. recognized, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. We do have a call out in um, HR's 25 goals related to workforce development, and that does include a lot of the positions that impact um, Director Butler's department. Um, so we're looking towards creative solutions, not just in the 2024 compensation study, but other policies. Um, our city manager mentioned negotiations coming up. So looking um, at more creative solutions in regard to training and development and partnerships with local colleges, training centers. Lee mentioned that it's an industry issue. This is not just our area. Um, so we're also writing the coattails of what our previous water director um, was working on with external workforce development on the private side. We're using those resources as well to bolster our internal recruitments, retention related to those positions too. Not just Lee's department, it impacts public works, it impacts water. So there are, that is that goal that's very broad in HR, but I hope it speaks to those concerns, Council Member Bruner. Thank you, stay here though, I have a question for you, thank you. I, as I said earlier, my question for you, if you could just briefly call out and summarize how we're investing in our city employees in this new budget proposal. Sure. Thank so you. The new budget proposal, um, there's two major, I'll call them focus areas. One of them is culture as a competitive advantage. Um, that looks at all our DEI recognition programs, awards, uh, that more outward outreach and recognition of staff. We also have the compensation study, the 2024 compensation study, and that looks to obviously bolster, change the methodologies, update our methodologies from our 2021 <coughs> compensation study to directly impact um, employees' pay. So two sides of the equation. We know pay is important, right, to everybody, but there is also a cultural aspect. Um, so there is a number of program areas there with diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, um, as well as different forms of recognition. Is there anything more specific you can speak to? Um, no. Okay. That's what. Thank you. Um, and then um, you asked about Children's Fund, and thank you. That was my other. Oh, um, my last one was. Parks and Rec, Tony Elliott, thank you. We worked really hard to create grant funding for equitable public events and sponsorships um, for cultural events. And I know some also falls in economic development and housing and some of the grants and funding, sponsorship funding for community and organizations, and um, I just want to call out that that has been really important, and um, I've heard from some 
of the people, the recipients, how appreciative they are, even though it's small, it's something. And um, I hope that we can continue investing in that way. And I know you had some ideas of creative, in lieu type of, um, not in lieu, but um, um, instead of direct funding, maybe, you know, there's, if it's an event at a park, there's uh, equipment that can be used or things like that. And so I don't know if, how, where things are with that in this new budget, if you could just speak briefly to that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for that question. The city special event grant program is still in effect and would still be um, uh, continuing on and is built into this budget for fiscal year 25 and hopefully into the future. Um, as far as other event support, so a couple things. So historically, the city and city council have approved um, uh, line items in the city budget to sponsor specific events. So historically, Woody's on the Wharf was an example of that. Japanese cultural fair, Aloha Polynesian uh, cultural fair, um, and outrigger races, uh, many events. So uh, over the past probably five years, a lot of cuts have been made to those sponsorships. So we don't have uh, those type of financial sponsorships in the budget currently. Those are always uh, discretionary items that the city council could discuss and deliberate upon uh, in terms of sponsoring events uh, in, a, in a unique way, separate from the grant program uh, that we have in place. And the budget on that grant program, uh, forgive me, I think is around twenty-five dollars to $30,000. So um, uh, as far as uh, support for events, so we do this a lot through Parks and Recreation um, uh, for any number of events where we can help support with equipment. If there are events here at City Hall in terms of podium and AV setup, uh, we do do that in a really in just a supportive uh, role for a, a, a range of events. So. Civic Auditorium is a great example of that. Uh, right now we're seeing a lot of graduations at the Civic Auditorium, of course, and we will charge uh, really the, the bare minimum costs uh, to the renter at the Civic Auditorium, but a lot of the support we provide, we're really helping to uh, subsidize and support these community partners in the case of graduations through the schools uh, that are graduating and, and using the facility uh, for that ceremony. So there's a lot of support. Um, we could capture that. We don't report on that per se, but we could capture that event support, uh, whether uh, it's from economic development or through Parks and Rec, uh, perhaps in the annual report that Parks and Rec produces. So happy to think about that and how we report on that in a more uh, open way. Thank you. And I know that like there's so many events, and I've been on the other side of the event process. And um, I just, you know, hope that your department has the support. I know originally it was with Kathy Agnani at the city manager's office. and She was very manual and transferring it over to parks and rec department and going digital. There's a lot, that's the systems and equipment and infrastructure piece that I was speaking to that I want our budget to reflect in investing and supporting that because the ripple effect is the community feels that lack of in in some ways right and lack of response and timing and and information and similar with the building and the permits and so how um, we can support that in the budget um, I hope that's called out a little more explicitly um, where that where that is yeah, just one brief comment on that, and this is really an IT's, uh, an IT department budget, I think for fiscal year 24 and probably into 25 uh, as well, but for example, the Tyler land management uh, system that's being implemented across the city, special events uh, will have uh, a key role and use of that tool. Uh, so that's a great example of a transition that should make our special event permitting process uh, more transparent, uh, more open, more consistent, uh, and so that's one where collaboratively across the city, IT and Parks and Rec in this example, working together to make that more efficient. Great, thank you. And one last comment for economic development and housing. Doing great.
I just wanted to call out thank you for um, the principal management analyst position and the, funded by the Public Art Fund. Um, I think that is a great example of it. great example of investing in um, you know what our community values and our these values um, to support art and everything and I hope that with this position that we can also explore additional revenue in the creative economy and the arts and supporting not just public art but our art organizations um, and the Arts Council, who, as you know, is also receiving less funding from the California budget. And so, you know, everything we do without art is meaningless. So thank you. I'm happy to support that budget item. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Bruner. And I will say one of the first priorities for that position when they come on board will be to look at the percent for art on private development as a potential new revenue source for the arts program. And we recognize that how important art is in public, the art, public art in the city of Santa Cruz. And we're really um, glad that you support it. And we're really excited to be able to add this position into the city. Thank you. Thank you for soldiering through on that. Good work. Thank you. Council Member Watkins is recognized on the budget. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I'll just echo my uh, colleagues' comments. This budget is really great. And the images, the symbols, the way it's laid out is, is really easy to digest. And so just appreciative of everybody who put in the work to make this happen. Um, so I just have a few comments and suggestions and a couple questions. One with the Children's Fund, I think we already decided, we've had conversations, it was moved to the city manager's office, so I think that would be a natural place to have that. I don't know if we need to revisit that, but um, under your question, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, it was at Parks, came over to city managers, it's worked great as far as I have been able to observe, and then also the cross use of the youth liaison, I think it fits within that as well, so I'm not sure how much more needs to be discussed, but. That was my observation. Um, I guess my question is grant writing has been something we talked about and having grant writing support as an allocation. Is that somewhere in the budget that I didn't see? It probably is. It is somewhere in the budget. Here comes Laura. Thank you. Speak to it. Yes, grant writing is in the city manager's office budget okay. as well as we manage the contract that has um, five grant writing firms available for citywide use right now. While you're up here, just probably because you know it, and I could look for it, but it's easier since you're here. Do we have an identification of how much we've had allocated to the grant writers, and and re, and then also how much we've had re, in return because of their success or not success? Um, we currently are in the process of seeing the returns on it. We don't have the returns right now, but we are tracking the outlay to which firm, and then if we're getting the grant, we're putting that in there as well. But we're still getting the returns on the cycles that we, we started once we um, initiated the program. Okay. I mean, I think it'd be great to have updates periodically as to what we're seeing as a return on that investment. Um, I think that also fits the earlier discussion around temporary staffing, right? If you have a grant, a grant-funded position, that sometimes just makes, makes the most sense. <coughs> Um, and um, if I can on that one, we are seeing um, our ability to grow our temporary staff and interns through the grant process. So for, for instance, in the climate action and sustainability world, Tiffany is able to hire interns that we could then recover through grant reimbursement. So that is something that we're doing. Um, you, you will see in the temp budget within the city manager's office, um, we've requested additional funds, and that's for a resiliency type planner. And our hope is to recover a portion of that temp budget through allocating them to help with the grant and then recover it through the grant funds. Awesome. 
That's great. That's a really great nexus and connection for workforce development. Since you brought up um, Tiffany Weiss West, who also, she staffs our Health and All Policies Committee. Mm -hmm. I know the committee <coughs> talked about having an allocation of funding as in past fiscal years, a small amount, but to support that work. Is that also written into the budget that I didn't see? It is. The Health and All Policies is in the budget, as is through your annual work plan, I believe, in December or January. You asked for funding for a future process to um, equitably reimburse participations on commissions and committees. So that process is awesome. going through its paces. We'll develop an administrative procedure order for that. But the funding is there for it in fiscal year 25 once we adopt that policy and we're able to implement it. Got it. OK, thank you. Um, so the, the pool, I. I hear the Harvey West plan. I know that we have some investments. I know we're opening the pool, but could you help put those, could you help thread the needle on what that looks like for the future of the Harvey West pool as it relates to this budget? Yes, thank you for that question. Lots going on with Harvey West pool, so I'll try to be succinct. Um, in the budget for fiscal year 25, we have a request for 75,000. Uh, that would be essentially a maintenance fund for any catastrophic failures uh, and needed maintenance projects uh, in the pool. So uh, the pool is currently functioning as of today. It's an old pool, a lot of old components that constantly fail. So that 75 really gives us a fund uh, to help maintain the pool again with any emergency failures uh, that occur. Um, Parks and Recreation released a request for proposals in RFP in the past month or so. We received proposals at the end of last week, I believe it was. Uh, so we're going to be reviewing those proposals this week and over the coming weeks. Uh, and we'll be back to the City Council with more in terms of a recommendation on um, uh, where we stand with the pool in terms of an operator. And to give that a little bit of context, so the Parks and Recreation Department currently does not have uh, budgeted resources. Uh, or staff to maintain or operate or program Harvey West Pool. Uh, so those are resources that have been cut over the last 20 years. So where we are right now is really in a position to identify a partner who can operate the pool on behalf of the city uh, from a programming standpoint and an operations and maintenance standpoint. Uh, and then with the revenues they generate in operating the pool, uh, use those to self-sustain their operation. So, uh, we're really looking for a, a unique uh, partner in this way, and that's the, the rationale behind the RFP. So we have proposals. We'll review those this week. We'll get back to the City Council uh, on these next steps. I think the positive thing to take away is we're making progress forward uh, and looking at options on how, how do we do this? How do we run this pool short of having uh, appropriated resources through the budget? So. Um, if that's clear as mud, uh, I, I hope hopeful that uh, makes sense. But in addition, in big picture, the Harvey West Park uh, redesign that will be going into starting this summer, that will create an opportunity for the community at large to really get involved and provide input on what, what should the future of the pool be, uh, what size should it be, what scale should it be, what are some different operating models around that. And so that will give us an opportunity to look big picture at both the pool and the park as a whole. I appreciate that. I think also long-term thinking about safety and getting youth and others who haven't had lessons who may want to go to our beaches, just connecting it in terms of just our, our coastal community, I think it's great. But happy to hear it's moving forward, so thank you. Um, I think the last is is the impact. Well, not the last. Just to, um, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to go forward with it. But it's the impact fees, and I know we talked a little bit about that from my colleagues here. Do you need funding for nexus studies to assess what those might be? Is that and if so, is that not allocated in the budget, or is that? Because um, you mentioned you were working on it, and I did, I didn't know if that was also something that was there. There is work underway. I'll ask uh, Lee to speak to that. Thanks for that question, Councilmember Watkins. Um, we have completed uh, Nexus studies. Um, they are a couple of years old. To, whenever we established it, it was probably 21, so maybe three years old at this point. Um, and so those could be updated. Okay. Um, uh, and I know that um, FIRE is looking at that as part of a, a fee study update that is um, underway for um, multiple departments um, associated with development. 
Um, so I, I don't believe that there's funding that's needed. I think we're building that into our budget right now. And um, we're also looking at, um, it, we have direction from council to look at the affordable projects, particularly as it relates to the public safety impact fees and police and fire, as well as the child care impact fee and how those apply to affordable projects. And later this year, we'll be looking at um, getting additional direction from the council and, and um, potentially based on that direction, actually updating the fees. And, um, and you mentioned the fire, because I was thinking that the fees could potentially be updated as a result of some of the concerns that were brought up around fire equipment and needs. So so I wanted to get clarity. Is the public safety impact fee for both both police and fire, but you mentioned fire wanting to do a different one. Is Can you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. We do have two separate fees. We brought them to the council okay. together. Right. Um, but there are two separate public safety impact okay. fees, one in police and one in fire. Um, with respect to the specific um, uh, capital uh, investments that are included in that, I would defer to the fire department to see if, because they, they do span um, eight or 10 year period um, with respect to the investments. So that, so that may have already been incorporated, but I believe fire is looking at updating that to include additional investments, but um, Chief Odie could speak to that if you'd okay. like. No, I just thought it's a good, I mean, it's a good opportunity to get funding from new development that has these impacts. And so, however, we're thinking creatively about that. I think makes a lot of sense. So, um, okay, thank you. And then I didn't know if we, I know we've talked in the past about facilities assessments, our city facilities, and are they being used appropriately? Is there an, are we still renting other spaces for office um, uses? I don't know where we're at with that. Uh, thank you for that question, Councilmember Watkins. So our, uh, we have several departments that are embarking on a facilities condition assessment. Um, I think it actually makes sense at a future meeting for us to bring a more comprehensive update to the council around that work that's happening. That also includes a look at um, our own city needs when it comes to utilization of space, both now and you know into the future over the course of the next 10 years. Um, so more to, more to come on that, but uh, we, we have a number of studies that have already been funded that are that are underway and should have some updates for the council later on this year. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, and then I think um, I'm reading this correctly, but I just wanted to get confirmation that I know we had direction for economic development to have um, sort of this work around placemaking. As it was written in the budget, it was identified as like activation of alleyways. Is that the same thing? Yeah, okay, I just wanted to confirm. I thought so, but I didn't. I just wanted to make sure because I think it's a really important next step. So, okay, it's just a different word. Um, I agree with what was shared around sort of re-looking at how we're classifying certain positions based on need, as well as how we're thinking about it with some of these long-standing unfilled positions. I think this is sort of a general comment around AI. I think that we have to recognize that we're on sort of this cusp of something really big and how we're planning for that type of work to shift or certain work to shift as a result of that, I think we need to have the foresight to think about that as an organization. So I don't know if that's ever gonna come back to the council in some sort of policy suggestion, update, or recommendation, but I do think we should be thinking about it, and if not, maybe that could be something that would be brought back to the council at a future time when ready. Uh, those are convers conversations we've been having with the city leadership team around, um, you know, service optimization, automation uh, opportunities, and how to how to go about that in a way that uh, is in the best interest of the organization. Uh, uh, Santa Cruz County recently adopted a policy as to to provide policy guidance to the, to all county staff around how to how to utilize what is a very powerful, robust tool in a way that's also protective of personal information and uh, the community that we serve. So we do anticipate bringing a policy back at some point. And I do think there's opportunities there as we look at uh, the future of our organization. We are at an inflection point as to how we utilize uh, this emergent technology. So yeah. More to come. Okay, great. Um, I think my understanding is we kind of are, we have already kind of touched on the council position, but I know there's the CPVAW council position being proposed. We can hold off on that conversation or, uh, you know, have that conversation when the mayor and city manager work comes back, but just wanted to flag that. Um, 
And lastly, an observation just of district projects, you know, how we're outreaching to the various districts and what those projects look like. I think that was brought up by my colleague, as well as to sort of show a proportional. I know certain districts require different needs, and you don't want to ignore <laughs> looking over at your district, uh, Mr. <laughs> no, but that's okay. That's how, like an equity base, right? You do it based on your needs, but you at, at the same time also thinking about how all districts are receiving the supports that they need, or at some time, grand scheme arm. And then um, I guess my last question would be just sort of your thoughts on the impacts of what's being proposed at the state in terms of homeless cuts and future budget implications. Uh, we are worried about that. Um, there are a number of um, both shelter and um, homelessness response programming, both at the county level and the local level, that are under threat based on uh, the really difficult uh, budget year that they're having in Sacramento. Uh, so that is something that we're monitoring closely. Um, there have been some encouraging um, changes that have occurred as the result of both the March ballot and upcoming on November, and that includes um, Prop 1, which could potentially bring in a significant funding stream when it comes to the infrastructure we need around all of these programs. So that's another area that we're paying attention to as well. Um, and we've been engaging uh, with our elected delegation around what other sustainable funding solutions could we help lead, lead the charge on on a statewide basis. It's really the area that every city is now uh, spending time up in Sacramento talking to the legislature and the governor's um, office around uh, this yo-yoing and unpredictability of funding streams when it comes to homelessness and how difficult it is to manage and provide services in that environment. And so I, I do anticipate that conversation to continue. And there's just a need for more. And those, that's really the symptoms and the challenges that we're all experiencing in our collective communities across the, the state are a reflection of how woefully under-resourced it is uh, from a sustainability standpoint. Okay. Um, so, yes. Yeah, great. Yeah, and I think, you know, you brought up the legislative work and alignment and how we're thinking about that in terms of working with our other colleagues and throughout the state of California to get the resources we need in this area and others. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council Member Brown is recognized. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank the finance department um, and all of the departments and department heads for um, bringing all of this information together. But I really want to call out the work of the finance department in preparation of this budget because I have heard not only my own reaction and what I've heard from my colleagues here today, but I have heard from constituents as well uh, that they really feel that this year's budget is is quite legible <laughs> relative to the past. Um, you can and, and the ability to click through and find uh, information about what particular uh, line items are about uh, is just written, you know, even from uh, some quite critical constituents, people are happy. So I really, I wanted to call that out. And I, I also want to call out Tracy Cole um, because I feel like your, your work and your, your commitment to making this budget um, accessible, transparent, um, is really shown through. You've been here, and I think you know you were showing me tools and you know uh, council members' tools, and and really um, so animated about it, and I got excited. And you've been here through, multi, you know, as finance directors have come and go, and I think we've got one now. I hope sh I hope you're going to stay, um, but you have maintained that commitment, and I I just see it here, and I, so I wanted to thank you for that. Um, yeah, so. I, um, a lot of my questions have been answered, and you know, so, and I, I want to echo pretty much across the board everything I'm hearing from my colleagues, and I won't repeat everything. Um, so just to say, you know, arts, infrastructure, you know, all of the things, <laughs> fire, <laughs> fire and uh, equipment. Um, I, I totally agree. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask uh, a couple of questions, and. Now I've got my notes, uh, notes from what people have said in, interspersed with my own questions. So I'm, I got to find them. Um, okay, so one is related to, um, you know, the the general space of eviction prevention, and uh, it's generally, I, I think Council Member Kalantari Johnson raised this at a recent meeting. The re the need to focus on. Um, you know, prevention, homelessness prevention, right? And we have had uh, 
members of our community who have been advocating. I know the Eviction Defense Collaborative, which is comprised of a uh, number of uh, community-based organizations locally, uh, senior legal services, the Community Bridges, the Community Action Board, the Conflict Resolution Center, and Tenant Sanctuary are all part of that. And they are really trying to build uh, for the, the longer term uh, an investment, a local investment coming from all of the cities, coming from the county. And um, so as part of that and with the passage of Measure L, I um, had been talking with the mayor and in our Budget and Revenue Committee about Tenant Sanctuary in particular. Uh, and I wanted to ask where that funding is. I'm, I'm guessing it's in community programs and services, not the community programs line item in the city manager's budget. So I wanted to ask, is the tenant sanctuary line item part of that? It's actually in city council's activity. It's in city council, thank you, thank you. And it's at $50,000 for at 50, fiscal 000. year 2025. So I would like to propose, and I don't know if this needs to be a motion, I think we said we're not gonna do that, but um, if it does, I'll, I'll make it as a motion that we add um, an additional $25,000 to that to provide tenant sanctuary with 75,000. That would be about a little under half of what it would cost for their two, um, not the attorney, that's funded by the county, but for their two, uh, community advocates, um, resource people, to work half-time, not as independent contractors making, you know, after taxes less than minimum wage. So um, I am I'm hopeful that we can make that investment. Um, as somebody who worked really hard on Measure L, um, getting that sales tax passed, um, I would, would hope that um, given we said that this was going to be, you know, intended for at least some of it for homelessness response, I think this is a great upstream response, and so I'd like to see that added. Um, and let's see, my so that's just a. I'm not sure how we would handle that. If there's dissent on that, I would have to be. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, another question I had was the. Um, one thing that is not as easy to find is enterprise fund balances in this budget. It's, they're not really listed in the way they had been in the past. Um, and I don't need to hear them all right now, but I, I think it would be helpful to um, find some way to make that legible for folks. And I, th I think that's all I've got. Um, I, I really appreciate the work that's gone into this as a member of the Revenue and Budget Committee or Budget and Revenue, whatever we are. Um, I feel like I've, um, I've been with this budget for a while now, and um, so I, I don't have a lot of other outstanding questions. Um, but uh, I guess lastly, I would just say I, I do want to highlight the, uh, I want to thank uh, Vice Mayor Golder in ab absentia here uh, for th her out of the box thinking uh, as she's reviewed this budget, thinking about ways that we can, um, you know, again, think outside the box and, and find, find creative ways to address some of our pressing challenges. So I appreciate that. And I really want to highlight that I, I think that her, her point about activating our park spaces, activating uh, our parks and finding resource generating possibilities there is is so important. We have this incredible parks network and we subsidize it for visitors from all over the world um, and and we have opportunities to, they're gonna come, right? And people are gonna come with money. Um, and so we wanna be able to capture some of that. Uh, in the Pogo Nip, I think we've got, um, at this point, it looks like the Homeless Garden is probably looking at an alternative site um, over on where they're at. And so with that, we've got space there. Tony and I had a conversation with some a, a disc golf advocate, um, and I, I just saw the possibility there for a disc golf course. It's not a whole lot of uh, it, it permanent infrastructure, and it, it activates the space. We could have, like, tournaments here. It's just, you know, one idea among the many. But I, I think... Given that's in my district, it, it's really been on my mind. Um, and I also want to call out the pool, just because I'll keep saying pool, 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 please. Thank you. Um, I am an advocate for that, and I will do everything uh, I can to help support that effort, whether I'm on the council or um, retired. So um, cause I think this this will happen, be going on for a while. So thank you, everyone. And um, I'll leave it there. Thank you,
Council Member. Council Member Newsom is recognized on the budget. Really, um, so my answers have been uh, asked and answered by our, our colleagues or um, during our committee meetings. Uh, so I just want to make a, a few comments and uh, just really thank staff for putting this budget uh, together and thank uh, Ms. Cabal for putting such a easily understandable, under, easily, uh, easy to digest budget together and easy to understand. Uh, you know, just want to say I'm, I'm really excited that we will have a balanced budget in this upcoming year. Um, and I'm also was just want to note that I was really happy to see the line item for adding an assistant urban forester to help us achieve our climate action goals, uh, 2030 climate action goals of planting 3,000 trees by uh, 2030. I uh, also was very excited, as uh, my colleague noted, for the capital investments uh, projects that are in my district. Uh, and also want to um, uh, speak to uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Collentary Johnson, mentioned about lights at Depot Park. Uh, I'm very happy to explore that action. I've had preliminary talks with staff, and I'm happy to work with you on that action as well. Um, but just really want to thank staff for putting this together and putting together such a great budget presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Cavill, a couple of questions. One is, uh, with regard to the positions requested that are new positions in the budget, are those assumed to be occupied for 12 months? Yes. They are. Is that a realistic assumption? In other words, do we have people coming online on July 1st to fill each of those positions? We don't, but the way we account for that is we take a vacancy factor that's basically, it's a 10-year rolling average. So we recognize that people come and go throughout the year, all different kinds of, all different times. We do that by activity, so it's not just a blanket number. We really do take that take into account historically what has happened and, and the fact that, yes, positions, even though they're authorized on July 1, they're never filled on July 1. But over time, it does balance itself out. So the way that manifests itself in the budget, as I understand it, is in a line item by department called salary savings. Is that correct? Right. That's the way by we By activity, it. yes. Thank you. With regard to f the fee study that will be finding its way to us, uh, I don't know that the city council has adopted a policy on that. Uh, it does seem to me that a way to think about fees is that our default position should be the difference between fees and taxes is that taxes is an involuntary payment with no expectation of a commensurate return to the payer of the tax. A fee is a choice that someone makes pays a fee and receives something for govern from government of equal value that that's the difference between a tax and a fee, as I understand it. So with regard to fees, then, a correlative public policy position might be that fees, as a matter of principle, should be 100 percent cost recovery, and there sh the exception should be providing general fund support for that activity that is not covered by fees. In other words, it's my thought that fees should be 100% cost recovery uh, because in almost all instances, somebody's making a voluntary choice. Nobody's forcing someone to come in and, and say, I want to do this and therefore I'm, I'm going to pay a fee for a particular permit or whatever the, the permission that the city is is providing and the benefit that, that they're providing. So when you're putting a fee study together, what is the working assumption on that notion about 100% cost recovery versus cost recovery plus subvention by the general fund? I think what Vivian might have more information on this, but I, I think the only one where we I think we call out specifically that the general fund may subsidize some of the fees is Parks and Rec. I think our goal there was to get to 50% for the other fees, I think the goal is to get as close to 100, I'll turn it over, <laughs> to 100%. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. I'm Vivian Pearson with the Planning and Community Development Department helping coordinate this project. Um, so we are working with the consultant through, selected through an RFP process, MGT, and so they're helping us with each of these departments to take a look at the baseline of 100% cost recovery. 
Where we currently are now is that we're reviewing these fees with each of these departments to determine whether or not line by line for this specific fee, do we want to choose a 100% cost recovery or would we like to um, take a look at maybe 60%, 80% or having a scaled phase increase? So that's currently uh, as part of our analysis at the moment. When that report arrives here and your recommendations are accompanying that, will we be able to see that kind of distinction as you're going through? We recommend this on this and this on this. This is full cost recovery. This is 80% for these reasons and so on. Correct. So and the analysis. Two, excuse me. I'm sorry. sorry. Please go ahead. The analysis will include the baseline of 100%, and then you'll see what is recommended by the department at what percentage level. Is that arriving in October? Is that correct? We are currently planning that for October because most of the fees um, will require 60 days effective period. So we're trying to time that with a calendar year of 25. And what assumption are we making with regard to any adjustment to fees in this proposed budget? We did put a little bit in there because we, mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't remember the exact amount, a couple hundred thousand um, that we put in there. But when we get this, when we present the study in October, if it's significantly more, we can go ahead and adjust at that time. So we have a little bit in there now because we don't know what it's going to be, but we can always increase that when, it, when it's brought in October. Thank you. We would also propose any potential changes in revenue at the mid-year um, as well. And so we plan on bringing the study back to City Council in October. If there's any further adjustments from that decision, we'll make the mid-year adjustments. Oh, there will be. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your good work in that regard. Let me associate myself with the comments of Councilmember Brown with regard to uh, the level of funding for various kinds of of uh, work on behalf of tenants, including eviction work and, and, and so on. Uh, I think I might have a way for us to, to move on that here. Those are my questions. Let me do this, make sure that you and I are tracking. Here's what I believe is coming back on or before the last day of budget hearings. Vice Mayor, compensation information, impact fees, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, community engagement regarding housing development, the permanent location for the Children's Fund. Councilmember Bruner, options for acquisition of firefighting equipment. Councilmember Brown, consideration of a $25,000 increase with regard to tenant services. Those are the ones that I have. Do you have others, sir? Elizabeth or Laura, any additional? Oh, I was going to say the only other I have um, to call out the sting operations in the police um, in the goals and accomplishments and yeah, I think that's oh, and the enterprise fund balances so to figure out how we can incorporate that in. Very good. I did want to clarify, Mayor, because you mentioned at the onset of those items that these are all coming back prior to yes, sir. final budget hearing. Yes, sir. Uh, that is that is not feasible for some of the items that you've listed. The impact fee study being one example. Um, I'm, we also had a conversation earlier today about compensation study that we are going to be embarking on. That of course will not be completed by the time we come back to budget. So I, I do I do just want to draw a distinction between. What adjustments we're making to the budget in response to council direction and other projects that are going to be coming forward at a later date? So let me have a call a quick with you on that. Uh, I think that's right. I, you and I don't disagree, but I think in each of these cases, even with regard to impact fees, you should return with a piece of paper that says, here's what we are going to be doing on or before the end of budget hearings, even if it is something that takes place afterwards. That'd be all Perfect. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Schmidt? I don't know if you had mentioned them. Um, but I had a couple of budget book um, items for planning and community development from council member Kalantari Johnson. What do you think those are? Um, one of them is to an improved um, community engagement and outreach I process. I, okay. I mentioned that. And okay. then the Children's there, Fund permanent No, there's location. a second one for planning and community development. And I was hoping somebody else caught it. The time to process? Time to process. If I may. Applications. Sure. Um, the building permit process. Gotcha. And there's one other clarification. Okay. Very good. 
I believe that then encompasses all the last day reports. And then, Mayor? Where are we? There we um, are, yes. I also want to, Council Policy 12.6, 12.3, Section 6, actually already spells out that the city should be doing full cost recovery with the exception of certain parks and rec fees. So it's already in your policy. It was adopted a few years ago. Understood, but that leaves us the discretion to choose in individual cases, whether we're going to do that or not. So that, I think, is the nature of the report I'm looking for when it returns. Ms. Contar Johnson. So um, it was actually the Children and Youth Bill of Rights and the Youth Liaison that needs to find a home. Thank you. And the Children's Fund, um, uh, uh, to per Council Member Watkins' comment, lives in the city manager's home. I didn't see it called out in, in the accomplishments or goals. That's the Children, Youth, Bill of Rights, and Youth Liaison that doesn't have a home yet. Okay. We're on the same page. Thank you. And that'll come back. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any other council members? Is there an item that I failed to indicate? Certainly. I don't know if you failed to indicate it, but I don't know if I made it clear. Right. But I was hoping to see in the goals for the fire department a plan moving forward for apparatus replacement so that we're not having to think about it from budget to budget to budget. So in the goals making a plan this year for what that would look like moving forward since there is that long lead time. Um, okay. And then there was a couple more. So oh, hold on oh, just a second. So uh, I, I recorded that as options for acquisition of fire apparatus. You would like a to, schedule or something of that nature? Something along the lines of like a plan for so that okay. we know All every right. three, yeah. Um, and then the other one that it, I maybe wasn't clear on mm -hmm was um, a, in the goals for for um, Parks and Rec is a plan for, or a plan for making a plan mm -hmm. with revising the Poganet master plan after demolition of the clubhouse, what kind of activation could be happening up there aside from hiking and biking. Mm -hmm. um, and I did want to add a goal for Parks and Rec to look at collaborating, or uh, it can be with public safety too, collaborating with local sponsors to try and put on an organized 4th of July event for the summer of 2025. Very good. Okay, we'll add that. Good. Thank you. Any, any other council members want to make sure you have the opportunity? Council Member Watkins. I forgot to mention it earlier, but under the plan for the fire, mm -hmm. I know we've talked about it in public safety is a training center. And I don't know if that could be considered for a reuse of space or some sort of priority or goal, but that something was discussed in our public safety meeting at one point. I can speak to that just real briefly. So we are in the process right now of, um, we have a firm on board to, to conduct a standard of cover study. Uh, so that firm will come in and take a look at um, calls for service, demand for services, um, condition of each of the stations, location, when it comes to efficiency of calls within the community. We think out of that, there will be an opportunity to have a, a more informed discussion around a potential regional fire uh, training facility. Once that work is completed, we also plan on um, moving forward with a consolidation review that we've been in conversations with Central around as well, and we think that'll also be um, a good conduit for discussing opportunities for a regional facility. This would be the opportunity for anyone who is with us who wishes to comment on the proposed 24-25 fiscal year budget to do so. We will also be hearing from folks online. We have that capacity. We're all fired up and ready to go on that. Very good. Thank you. Anyone who wishes to comment on the budget, please come forward and do so. Ms. Meister, good afternoon. Thank you for all your good work. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor and Council Member, for all your good work. Uh, my name is Barbara Meister. I'm here as a representative of COPA, Communities Organized for Relational Power in Action. I'm a volunteer leader through my parish, Holy Cross Catholic Church. Um, the homeless point in time in 2023, the reason for homelessness, 19% of the respondents said they were evicted. And when they asked what you need for help, 41% they said they needed a job. 31% needed rental assistance. The year before, the highest uh, reason was 37% were evicted, 33% lost a job. COPA's focus on homelessness has been how do we prevent homelessness from happening to begin with? We realize incredible investments you've made and are making uh, to deal with the after effects of homelessness. We'd like to ask you to invest in preventing it in the first place 
In November, Maria received a notice to evict. It was an illegal notice under the 2019 Tenant Protection Act. She called the Eviction Defense Collaborative that Ms. Brown uh, referenced. An attorney was able to engage the landlord and prevent the eviction. When that landlord then attempted to raise the rent by another $1,000 illegally, um, there too, that attorney fended off that illegal rent increase. And today, Maria remains housed with her two children. On January 27th, Maria told this story to several of you and 150 or 130 COPA leaders, along with all the candidates running for re-election to the Santa Cruz City Council and the County Board of Supervisors. COPA asked the candidates that if we endorsed and worked to get out the vote on Measure K and L, would you in turn invest money in eviction prevention by providing funds to increase legal services, education, and outreach? and mediation, not just for tenants, but also for landlords who need information about changing laws so that they can do their part. All the candidates said yes to this agreement. So I stand here today representing COPA leaders from across the county who witnessed these commitments made that day. We appreciate our meetings with Mayor Keeley and many of you to figure out how can we identify funding to prevent homelessness by providing legal services. We understand that there is a $75,000 um, pr proposal being included in this budget today. And I appreciate the work that uh, Mayor Keeley has done and COPA has also backed up his request to the cities of Capitola and Scotts Valley and possibly Watsonville to contribute some funding also to the Eviction Defense Collaborative. We are also in the process right now of asking County Board of Supervisors to include $250,000 for the Eviction Defense Collaborative and their budget. It will take all of us. COPA appreciates your leadership, your commitment, and yet these amounts are small. They really are small and pale in comparison to the need that exists out there. It's a good start, and we look forward to continuing to work with you in the coming year to prevent homelessness by supporting tenants and landlords with education uh, and prevention and mediation, and if an attorney is needed, then an attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Muster. As we're waiting for the next person, let me say, and thank you for those kind words. They really should be directed at Councilmember Brown, who has motivated me to be interested in this issue. Let me see if there's anyone else who wishes to make comment on the proposed budget. Do we have anyone online? We'll take the person online. Good afternoon and welcome. <laughs> Person who is online, if you could hold on for a second, we're having a little trouble with your audio, so give us a moment. We won't take it out of your time. We'll return to you in just a moment here. We will see if we can make this happen again. Person online, good afternoon, and you can begin your presentation a second time. We'll see if this works. If it doesn't, we'll figure something out. So please proceed. You know, actually, this will sound contradictory. No, I can't hear you. <laughs> Although you asked me the question, could I hear you? It is so muted that we can literally not hear you. So let me do this. Let me do this. Uh, I'm going to, uh, we're going to see if there's anybody else who has comment. Anybody who's with us in chambers? No. So we are going to have to try to fix this. Let me do this. Uh, I'm going to postpone action on this at this moment. Uh, we will return to it in a few minutes should we be able to get through uh, this technical issue. We are going to take up item 25 at this point. This is the independent police auditor report. Uh, we have, excuse me, 
Mr. Hefker on the report. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, as the Council is aware, um, every year on an annual basis, based on Council's direction, uh, we have hired an independent police auditor firm um, in the spirit of ensuring full transparency in the work of our police department, as well as a review of uh, evolving best practices within um, the operations of the department. And we have Mike Janako here with our police auditor team, along with his staff, and we'd like to invite them up to provide their annual report to the council. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, good to see you again, Mayor, council members. Sure, sir. Michael Janako with the uh, OIR group and um, presenting as uh, your city's IPA, Independent Police Auditor. It's good to see uh, a lot of familiar faces on the dais this afternoon. I have with me my two colleagues that are part of the team. Um, Teresa Magula is to my immediate left, and next to her is Sam Marion, uh, who's been with the team for a number of years and is a Santa Cruz resident. Wonderful. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we'd like to do a very high-level presentation on our report uh, that was submitted along with uh, uh, the agenda. Um, could we get, I have a very brief PowerPoint just to sort of frame the issue. Thank you so much. This report is a report that covers all of the work that we did over the last calendar year. That would have been 2023. So any case that uh, came in that was a complaint investigation or a significant use of force uh, matter uh, would have come under our purview during that operative period. And what we do with that is we then, based on that uh, review, we then take that information, collect it into an annual report, talk about some of the systemic issues that we have um, dealt with over the past year, and then report publicly. I think that, you know, you all have had, you've all been fortunate to have some sort of oversight for a number of years, well preceding many, many jurisdictions in the state of California. And you should be credited for that, for being sort of on the front line. I think Berkeley may have preceded you for a bit, but really you were really up there. Uh, over the past three years, we have been entrusted with the uh, opportunity and privilege of fulfilling that role for you as the independent police auditor. Um, and one of the things that we came, uh, when we came on board, that we wanted to do is provide a increased level of transparency, which is what this report is all about, um, so that you all as um, as um, leaders of the city and your community at large has an opportunity to read for themselves what's going on uh, in what has traditionally been a very cloistered operation, which is personnel issues, accountability issues, guidance issues, training issues that is performed by your Department of Public Safety, by your police department. But um, I, I would say that there's no other city, there's no other jurisdiction in this county and many other counties uh, in California that now affords your community that level of transparency. The Sheriff's Department is coming on board and we'll have our first public report uh, for the Sheriff's Department in August. But you're still ahead of them and you've been ahead of them for a number of years. And I think that really is, for us, one of the most crucial pieces of this organization and this arrangement. The ability for us to access confidential information, to get under the hood, if you will, of the police department, and then report out as an independent entity what we are finding and what we have found over the past year. Um, we started out uh, in this work uh, with some very low-hanging fruit. One of the problems that we've reported on the past couple years, for example, is that unfortunately the internal affairs responsibility 
fell way behind. And um, as a result of that delay, cases were falling out of process and it was taking way too long for those investigations to get completed. Well, that has been taken care of as a result of the leadership of your chief and the internal affairs sergeant that was put into place, we caught, we got caught up. And I think that's really important in order for a complainant to feel like that complaint is being taken seriously, there has to be prompt action. Um, instead of waiting a year or more, which is um, unfortunate, to get a response on the particular complaint. That has been fixed. The other thing that I would say is that the low-hanging fruit, if you will, that we found in our first couple years has all been addressed. And so you will see in this report a decrease in recommendations, which means that we can't find any low-hanging fruit anymore. And so now we're working sort of at the graduate level of oversight, the graduate level of police practices. And again, it's the collaboration, not that we are, um, you know, um, we are certainly allied with your agency and your leadership of your department in a very positive and co collaborative way. And that, again, couldn't happen but for the cooperation and the interest, again, of your chief. And I don't want to say too many good things about your chief because that'll get your community upset with me that I'm just saying all these nice things. But I, <laughs> I have to tell the truth, right? Um, and and uh, one of the things over the past year that I think has really been a positive feature in my colleagues will probably talk to, a, to it a bit, um, is the fact that we are regularly meeting with the chief on issues that are more systemic in nature. The cases are starting to become uh, relatively um, routine, and, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but I, every complainant needs to be heard, and there needs to be an objective and fair investigation and thorough investigation to get to the facts and have accountability occur when it occurs. But we are now looking more at providing additional guidance to officers. Because if you don't provide that guidance and the officers err or do not meet department expectations, it's really not on them. It's really on the leadership of the organization to ensure that every officer understands what is expected of her or him in the field uh, before you can hold somebody accountable for failing. Um, so we've been working very carefully and have had have made great strides in some of these systemic uh, um, issues and policy development. Um, that's a, a slide. Our initial slide is really a, another way of saying what I said. This is just sort of what our duties are. Um, again, we've been focusing a lot on policy and procedures over this past year. Um, and um, there were a couple of significant incidents as well that we dug into as a result of our work. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, another thing that we do is we provide another way in which complainants can learn about the process and we can be used as an intermediary to offload complaints. Many times in our experience, we will see that complainants are shy or not comfortable showing up at the police station and making a complaint on her or his own. So we provide that conduit. We talk with the individual. We have the advantage of having Samra in town so she can meet with complainants and just sort of talk to them about the process in a way to sort of reassure them in a way maybe that the police wouldn't be able to um, and talk about how if the complaint is get into the, getting into the system, there will be an independent uh, set of eyes and ears on those, on those complaints. Um, and then finally, as I said, uh, we do report to you all annually, which um, I think is really important to, uh, to your community to know that um, you all are taking the time out of a very busy agenda to hear what we have to say and to sort of support uh, this concept. Go to the next slide, please. Um, there were 17 investigations that we actually looked at over the course of the year. Nothing unusual about that number. Um, one of the things was um, that to me it is important is that a number of them were internally generated. And by that I mean department leadership, department supervision um, identified on their own issues that were needing an investigation. So rather than waiting for complainants from the outside to complain about certain aspects 
Um, there also is a very vibrant and robust mechanism whereby sergeants, lieutenants, command staff, and the chief himself will often authorize an internal investigation. And that's really important. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm now going to turn this over to my colleague, is it, is it Sam. Sam is going first and uh, our presentation. Thanks. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. Um, I wanted to highlight some of the work that we did last year, including our outreach efforts, because I live in Santa Cruz. I have an opportunity, again, to meet with complainants uh, in person, uh, if that's something that would help the process. Um, we also had opportunities to meet with the ACLU, as well with the NAACP. I had an opportunity to go to the Public Defender's Office and meet their staff, and again, give an overview of what our role is and field any questions that they have. Um, part of what I'd like to talk about in addition to our outreach is are some of the findings and the recommendations that we've made. And, and those details are in our report, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to highlight a, a few of those. Um, in looking at uh, critical incidents or some of the, the really deep dives that we, that we did uh, last year, it gives us an opportunity to work with the police department, identify areas of improvement, and also then to make specific kinds of recommendations. So in the areas of officer-involved shootings and also uh, uh, with canine situations, we had an opportunity to present specific kinds of recommendations. Um, we were able to to talk at and work, talk and work with the department to update some of the, those procedures that the police department has around critical incident review, particularly around um, officer interviews and, and those type of, of topics. We were also able to, on some of the cases, look at a more holistic view and provide um, recommendations to have to be able to look at not just officer performance, but of course supervisor performance and other aspects of the case. We were able to fine tune some of the timeliness issues so that uh, areas around statute of limitations and exceptions could uh, be worked through with the department as well. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Teresa, and she can highlight a few other uh, recommendations that we've made. Thank you. Good afternoon, welcome. Thank you so much, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. As Mike mentioned, what we're really at at this point with the department is the opportunity to work with policy and procedures. So beyond looking at individual cases, sometimes our case reviews highlight areas where we have recommendations based on our work across California, across the nation, as to how to improve on those policies and procedures. A number of these we are really pleased to report have been updated and completed um, since we recommended them to the department. So really quick um, collaboration and, and a speedy turnaround in having these happen. That would be, for example, updating the definition of biased-based policing to align with the state's penal code on that, updating their use of force policy to require, when possible and practical, to include a warning that force will be used prior to force being used. Um, and then something that the, that the department was already doing, but we wanted to see in policy as a requirement, was have supervisors regularly review the reports that were being submitted by officers. And so supervisors were doing that regularly. We wanted to see that as a requirement in policy. Certainly as staff turns over those types of institutional Practices might get lost, and we wanted to make sure that those um, continue as a good practice. One of the items that we also highlighted was as a result of our review of a critical incident in which we saw that uh, officers engaged in a foot pursuit. Um, this is, a, in our opinion, a high-risk tactical choice. The department, we learned, did not have an explicit policy related to foot pursuits, and we have been collaborating with them to develop that policy. It's important in our mind from an officer safety perspective to give officers the kind of guardrails and guidance to be able to engage in this activity while also balancing their own safety and that of the community. So we feel it's a really important policy that again we're working on uh, developing as, as our time here goes on. We've also been able to um, encourage and the department has completed a policy for children of arrested parents. Um, so at times there are instances where a child is left um, because their parent has been arrested 
and we wanted to provide some guidance for what officers can and should do in those situations to ensure that that child's safety and needs are met appropriately. Um, we also are working collaboratively now with developing a policy related to First Amendment right to record. Um, so when individuals in the community might choose to record an incident or an interaction with their department, they can choose to do so. And that the policy is there, again, to provide officers the guidance for how to respond um, if they find somebody recording that instance. And then, of course, we are very in tune, thanks to SAMRA, thanks to our own work, with some of the issues that are of community interest. So these might not come out of specific cases, um, but certainly we've been following um, your community's interest um, and concern around the use of automated license plate readers. Um, we worked prior to this council approving the um, seeking of funding for that um, to develop a policy with the department that provides a lot of structure around the use cases for those ALPRs, as well as the appropriate guidance for retaining that data, for sharing that data, that align with the state law, um, so that the use is very restricted um, to really respond to the community's concerns around the use of that technology. Um, similarly, we're working with the department to help develop a more transparent dashboard for reporting of their Racial Identity Profiling Act data. Uh, this is an act that was, that's part of uh, state law that requires that departments provide information, statistical information, around the types of persons that are being stopped um, at any given police encounter. And so we saw that the department is certainly posting some of those statistics on the transparency portal. We were happy to see that, um, and we feel like the department can go further in providing more of that transparency to your community. So we're working to develop that type of dashboard with your department. And certainly, as Samara mentioned, we have a whole host of details in our report. Um, we are happy to take any questions that you might have around any of the items that you saw. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you very much. Let me, I'm going to start over here this time, go this way. I don't want to be. Uh, mean to you. I'll be nice to you. Questions, Mr. Newsom? Ms. Brown. I do have a couple. When you start over there, all my questions get answered, so I just get to sit here. Um, That's what you always say. So I'll see if you have actually uh, have any questions. All right. I, well, to the test. Um, so uh, thank you so much for your very very informative report. Um, thank you for the work you do with our Police Department, and um, you know, and thank you to SCPD for being open to having these conversations. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, and th these are not questions that I necessarily um, want to get specific point by point answers on. Um, and your presentation provided a response to some of my questions, but generally, it's about um, how your recommendations are or are not implemented. Um, and so I wanted, I thought I'd ask you uh, from your perspective, uh, you know, it, I did see specifically with respect to the, the timing of invest on investigations, um, both in terms of um, initiating the investigation, but also interviewing when there is a significant use of force incident, and um, that, that there we could be do better uh, so I wanted to ask you specifically about that one and then just generally um, how these recommendations are being operationalized your sense of how that's going if there's is there something more that the council could do to provide direction aside from please continue to work on these recommendations that's a uh, kind of meandering question, but um, how's think, it going? I think I get it. Um, well, on the slides, you saw that with regard to the policies that we've been working on, we've had great success. Sometimes it takes decades before you can convince a department to um, revise, improve uh, that guidance that occurs in policy. And these are happening really quickly uh, in our, based on our experience. There are some things that we are still wrestling with the department about. Not that they've said no, but they haven't, we haven't gotten to yes yet. So we're going to continue to work on that. 
Um, the good thing, I would say, about this past year is that there was no, oh, my God, kind of case, right? So um, that being said, that's why we sort of hunkered down over the past year and worked on some more policy development. But I do think that um, the policies that particularly Teresa talked about um, will leave the department in a much better place with regard to avoiding some of these use of force cases. That's what it's all about. The foot pursuit policy isn't intended to restrict an officer from doing his or her job, but just making sure it's done as safely as possible. Thank you. And so I guess one of so the question that I have is, um, you know, from last year, recommendations were made. I didn't have an opportunity to go back through and actually pull them all out and um, identify where I saw overlap or continued concern or recommendations um, for this year. And so I'm. this is really for, uh, for Chief Escalante. Uh, can we get a report, even if it's like a simple, like a chart? I mean, what you just gave us in the, in the PowerPoint was really helpful, because my question was, what policies or what recommendations have been implemented, and where are, are we still needing to do work? And you answered them, but we didn't get that in the um, documents that, we, that were posted for the agenda. So it would be really helpful to have um, you know, an update, uh, so it's a question, I guess, for everyone, but I'm asking uh, Chief Escalante in particular, can we get, um, you know, some kind of report from PD on here, you know, the recommendations, here's the recommendations from the OIR report for this year that have been implemented, here's the ones in progress, here's the ones where we have, you know, more work to do or more discussion to have. I think it would be really helpful yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I also think that in certain components of different reports that we've seen, they also include that in in their report. So I don't know. I mean, I'd be happy to do that, but I think that's also, I don't want to steal their thunder, so to speak. So I think that, um, yeah, however you want, want it, if you want it more for me or you want it, more from them, um, but I know that I've seen them do that and and kind of provide a little bit of a chart in in one of the reports before. So if we wanted to see that, yeah, it's and it's here. I mean, I was reading through and I could see where you know you say some have been rec you know implemented. We're revisiting one from last year, but like a, just a, a visual to help identify what those are, so that, mm -hmm. you know we can sort of get a general sense of how things are going. Would be great. Yeah, Thank you. That's fine. Council Member Watkins. Um, I guess my only additional question is: Do you, coming on the heels of our budget uh, discussions, do you have what you need to get the policies accomplished in terms of training resources, et cetera? Are there things that we should take into consideration um, moving forward for this fiscal year to see these move ahead? Uh, thank you, Council Member Watkins, for that question and uh, resources. Uh, the city has been very good about resources. In fact, we just had a meeting to talk about a slight adjustment in resource allocation. But I think we're um, having getting the support of the leadership of the city in order to accomplish our work. And uh, really appreciate the support that you provide, though, um, sitting on the dais. And with regard, um, Council Member Brown, to your question. We'll do a handy dandy one page chart like you just suggested that will give you a real snapshot of where we are on each of these recs. Thank you. Vice Mayor is recognized. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody's questions before me, <laughs> less. Um, but one I was wondering and was asked to me was in instances like what happened on Bay Street a few months ago where there was um, a stop, that, and I don't know if that was going to be in next year's report. Um, I'm wondering if we have the body cam footage and we know our officers didn't do anything wrong, can we release that body cam footage sooner than later so it doesn't cause rumors and community outroar when it's not necessary? Um, Vice Mayor Golder, I'll leave that particular question to the chief to, to talk about. Uh, ultimately, that's his call. But that case will be reviewed by us. We are very aware of it. The chief reached out to us when it first occurred. We've already had some preliminary discussions. We'll be reviewing that investigation in the same way we would 
any other. And eventually we'll have a report, probably it's about this time next year, but that may be too long. So I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, when that's, I think that's my point, is if we could do a press release, put the footage out there when we don't think we have anything to hide and there's, it's not going to require discipline or it's nothing confidential, that would be a request, I guess. I don't yeah, know if it's possible. I appreciate uh, the question, Councilmember Golder, and it is something that uh, police agencies and departments are doing across the country um, following certain incidents, uh, particularly now that in many cases they're, they're also filmed by bystanders and there's a lot of video information that's readily available that may not accurately capture what, what occurred in that situation or how our officers responded to it. Um, so I, I do think it warrants some review uh, from a policy standpoint about when it might be appropriate to re release uh, video footage um, on any particular case, and uh, the chief can speak to this as well, but of course, any active investigation, there's some influence as well as to uh, what, what can be released. So, um, something we're talking about often. And Vice Mayor Golder, another option would be, instead of waiting for this annual report to come out, if there is that still that community interest, we could front load that investigation when it's completed and publish it. There's no reason that we'd have to wait for the for this session next year to do that. And I think that's where this stems from is I just don't want any misunderstandings in the community and I don't want our police department who does really good work to get a kind of a bad reputation. Um, and I think the positions are hard to fill. They have a really hard job compared to other police departments in other jurisdictions and people might not want to apply if they think there's a, like, a controversy or things like that. So if we can clear things up, that was my only reason for requ requesting that. Okay. Council Member Collins R. Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Thank you so much for the work and the report. I'm, I'm, I don't know why I can't find this, but I know you um, talked about the um, uh, being present when children are being removed. What was the recommendation there? Um, I'm going to have uh, Ms. Marion talk about it because she's the, she was the heavy lift on this one. And it came out of a case, and maybe you could just... Thank you for your question. Um, we recommended that the department have a policy so that officers are given guidance as to when they're arresting someone, if that individual is a parent, that there's a process by which there's questioning, um, do you take care of a dependent child, that there's an opportunity for that parent to identify someone else uh, the other custodial parent or another uh, adult, responsible adult who could take care of the child so that uh, children aren't left uh, in the home without anyone taking care of them. Um, and so a case, it was actually the previous year that gave rise to uh, our observation that the department didn't have such a policy. And so we made that recommendation to the department. And this is one of the recommendations that the department embraced. And we've worked with them this year um, as to the specifics of that actual policy. And it's my understanding that the policy is finalized. And I think it's, we're at the stage of, uh, or the department's at the stage of uploading it and putting it into their internet so that policy would be available. But ultimately, it's about giving officers the understanding of what they need to do when there's a, a, a dependent child at home. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I guess this is a maybe comment question. Just wonder if there's, um, when, when we, I don't know if we'll see the policy, but just what am I trying to say? Partnerships with the departments whose job it is to oversee those um, actions. I, I, you know, I'm thinking about child welfare services and children's mental health. And um, I mean, this is just, it's so outside the scope of what law enforcement is trained to do. So um, I'm so glad that we are strengthening our policies and it seems like there should be some partnership with the county departments whose role it is to oversee that, those actions. Absolutely, and thank you for your comment. And part of the, the policy does uh, include okay. uh, communication uh, with, the, with the, the relevant departments that would be in the position to assist officers so that the, de so that the decision making is a sound decision as to where that, where that child should be placed. Thank you for your work on sure. that. Thank you. Councilmember Brunner. Uh, thank you. My question stems somewhat from Council Member Brown's question. I was not clear. There were 14 recommendations in your report, and 
it said that five have been implemented and three in progress, but it didn't say which ones. So that leaves the others, and what's that next step in the others that aren't in progress or haven't been implemented to getting them considered? And is that an action that just is going to happen, or is that something that we have to drive? Uh, Council Member Brunner, thank you uh, for the question and the clarification. I believe we now have a new homework assignment, and so we're going to work on that homework assignment, and we'll just present Latin words sua sponte on our own uh, this update, so that you'll have a one or two page chart, as uh, Council Member Brown had asked for, that will give you a, a sense Recommendation one, done, two, in process, three, this. So that you'll, we'll have that as just an appendix to our report. And then can you clarify if there's, what, if there's any recommendations that haven't been implemented or are not in progress, what is that? If it just lives there for how long? Do well, if, if we're still not where we need to be or where we want, would like to be, and the, the issue comes up again, we'll be reporting it next year. Um, some of these reports, you know, continue, continue, continue the issues. Um, but um, I, I do think that the great majority of the recommendations are either continued to move forward or have been already implemented. So for me, thank you. Um, recommendation 11 and 12, I was glad to see those. Um, the bias-based policing, and it seems like that's been implemented. Yes. Is, am I understanding that correctly? That is correct. And then 12 was the communications in other languages. That is correct. Has that been implemented? Thank you for those two questions, Council Member Bruner. I'm, I'm also particularly passionate about RIPA data, so thanks for highlighting those. Um, the department, to just clarify, the department has provided um, some of the data on a transparency portal. We have recommended that more be included, and it is currently a collaborative effort to do so. Um, Cal Chiefs, the California Association of, of Chiefs of Police, has um, provided a dashboard that agencies can sign on to that will streamline the way that RIPA data is being um, presented to members of the public. And so we'll work with the department um, to perhaps join in on that model or create a model of their own. Um, certainly there are some challenges related to presenting RIPA data. Um, we'll get into those today. Um, but again, wanting to really work with the department to make sure that it is as transparent and accurate as possible. Um, as to the translation, um, it is one that I know the department is, uh, has accepted. We haven't seen that come across as an opportunity yet. Um, there was a particularly, uh, just an explicit case in which we saw that. Um, so certainly when the opportunity presents itself, um, we, we will see the evidence of that come out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the questions or comments by members. Let me see if there's anyone with us, either in chambers, uh, who wishes to testify or provide comments on this item. Seeing here none, is there anyone online? Nobody with their hands. No one with their hands up. Matters back before the body. Um, um, Council Member Watkins. Sure, I'm happy to move the recommendation to receive the annual report from the city's independent police audit auditor, OIR group. Motion, is there a second? Second by Council Member Collentar Johnson. Debate or discussion? Thank you all very much for your fine work. Chief, thanks to you and your department for being so cooperative in this effort. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Boulder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion approved and so ordered. Again, thank you all very, very much. Thank See you, you very much. Year. We're on item 24. We will, in order to go forward, we will go backwards. Uh, we are on item 24. This is the proposed fiscal year 24-25 proposed budget, public hearing, and other activities. Let me see. Do we have anyone online who wishes to 
participate. So we do have someone we are up going their hand to do. The clerk has advised me that the best they can do right now is hold a microphone really close to another piece of equipment they have there to see if we can get that volume up as much as possible. So thank you for your efforts in that regard. Person online, uh, regarding the budget, this is your opportunity. Welcome. Okay. Uh, hey, I checked my equipment out. It works fine on my end. Anyway, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you for okay. your forbearance. So what we left off was that the revenue uh, for the primary general fund in uh, 22 was 126.1 million, 23 was 126.3 million, identical rate. Then we see in 24, the estimated final revenue jacked up to 140 million, which was a one year increase of almost 11%. Almost all of that came from a 12 million vague increase in charges for services, which I surmised partially was the effects of this ongoing relentless coercive jacking of the fees up, many with very lame justifications by all departments been going a long time, an amount larger even than the sales tax increase of measure L, or perhaps some unreliable one-time fees. Uh, we sure didn't get to vote on those fees. It's a long list of outrageous fees and you plan more. Next, I'd like to make the very, very simple point when I pose the question, why in the world would you actually plan? I mean, plan on purpose, a budget that was not balanced as was the case until this item was introduced. Normally, your only justification would be uh, when your end reserve balances end up way overfunded, but that doesn't really jive with the past or current future projections of fiscal doom. If revenue versus expenses didn't match by year end, reserve fund balances will come out different. That's where the reserves come in. But planning deficits is for sure fiscally irresponsible as well as no real attempt to budget a reserve rebuild when the reserves are running short. In the unlikely event, which uh, I don't know if that's ever gonna happen, but money builds up to more than recommended reserve amounts, my advice in the next year, you can work off more CIP backlog instead of one time burning the money on short term anything or adding more personnel. Try to remember this one fact that comparing the, the, to the 2015-16 budget, it quoted the population as 63,789 compared to what you say now of 63,224. It's a population decrease of 1% over nine years. The general fund went from 86 million to 150 million a total increase of 74.5% or about 7 million a year average increase. Read the city cost per capita is going up a lot, even worse when comparing employed citizens, uh, which were stated at 33,100 back in 2015-16, and now it's only 29,700, a decrease of 10.3%. One wonders who is paying the bills. In 2015-16, the budget, uh, there were 735 full-time employees versus what's projected to be 943, or is it the 963 positions on page 48? That may, it's a huge staff increase versus zero population growth over nine years. It is even a worse comparison with the total budget. It's funny how some things change and others don't, no matter how much the end goes up, like dire predictions of future fiscal doom and zero mention of ever cutting costs only growing the government's revenue and size by any means. In 2015-16, there was no mention of the Awazwaz tribe or climate change or zero mentions compared to the 21 mentions of equity as there is in this report. No mention of the globalist entity health and all policies uh, passed by that brief progressive city council before it was forced out. I'll offer another comparison. My property tax bill has nine amendment debt obligations besides normal property taxes. In my Santa Clara property, I have one for $100. And I missed the part where you, uh, if you total the amounts you spend on consultants. To me, they are temporary employees. They're not counted that way or in, even transparently accounted for at all. Thanks. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. I'm sorry about the earlier interruption on that. Thank you. Is there anyone else online? No one else online. Matters back before the body. Uh, if I might recommend, uh, there is a recommendation here. We adopt that recommendation, including uh, the direction to the city manager to report on or before the last day of budget hearings on various items indicated by council members. Is there such a motion? So moved. Council members. Council member. <laughs> so fast. <laughs> poor poor Ms. Bruner meant to so, make no, a motion, <laughs> open her mouth, and nothing gave out. <laughs> so <laughs> Ms. Brown moves and the vice mayor seconds uh, that motion. Who did yeah. you settle on for the maker? 
Say it again, uh, uh, Ms. Brown. Yes, I'm sorry, Ms. Brown. <laughs> we will, uh, uh, further debate or discussion, uh, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? <laughs> aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Goldberg? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Uh, I believe we are completed with the work we can do until 5.30, at which time, excuse 4 me. 4 o'clock. 4 p.m. Oh, we will do the, uh, uh, the volunteers, then we'll probably take another break and come back later for the food bin public hearing. So we will stand in recess for about 17 minutes. Santa Cruz City Council is back in order following an afternoon recess. Clerk will call the roll to establish a quorum. Council members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watson? Here. Bruner? Present. Helen Tari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we will proceed on to our scheduled item. Uh, number six, which is outstanding volunteer recognition. Boy, there's a lot of competition for that, I would suspect, in our community. Uh, we are, uh, this is National Volunteer Week, and uh, we are about as fortunate as you can get in this community with having the Volunteer Center, the wonderful executive director, who had a great celebratory occasion recently, and uh, we are so proud of the work that they do and uh, providing a central location for people to be able to manifest their love for our community through volunteer activities. And we're going to recognize a few of those folks um, as we begin today. I would like to start by acknowledging our good friend Karen Delaney for her fine work and ask you to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and council members. Um, we've been partnering with the city on CityServe to uh, bring volunteers into various city projects for close to 35 years now. And um, the folks that you're going to meet and hear about and honor as outstanding city volunteers are part of a cohort of folks this last year at the city through CityServe about 450 special event volunteers and 350 or so regular departmental volunteers. And since we are here during budget day, we thought that um, we, you know, volunteering is a wonderful thing for so many reasons. I think of it sort of as a three-legged stool. And the first thing is the amazing work volunteers do. So we thought we'd bring a prop that the value, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, of time that volunteers donated through CityServe last year was a little bit over a quarter of a million dollars, mm -hmm. which is a 500% return on your investment in this program to provide insurance and some recruitment support for people who love their city. So we wanted to give this to you all to remember that volunteering is a wonderful thing, but it also is a smart and fiscally responsible thing to do. Um, the two other legs of the stool, I'll leave this up here. The two other legs of the stool in volunteering are the ways that volunteering works in our community. Um, people who volunteer are twice as likely to vote. They are two and a half times as likely to give money to charity. Businesses that encourage workplaces like the city that encourage their um, employees to volunteer have higher productivity, higher profit, longer retention, and lower absenteeism. When volunteer rates rise in a community, property values rise and crime goes down because volunteering builds our culture. Volunteering builds our civilization. Volunteering is the glue that holds us all together. The third thing that we're really interested about in volunteering is what it does to individuals. And volunteers, as you'll hear, are never out for themselves. But the interesting thing about volunteering is volunteers are happier, healthier, and live two years longer than people who don't volunteer. The Surgeon General, our Surgeon General, 
came out with a massive report and campaign this November. One of the top three health crises in the United States right now is social isolation. Social isolation is, has an equivalent harm to your health in terms of needing medical care and your lifespan of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. And in his prescription, and now I'm gonna quote the Surgeon General, which is something I never thought I'd do, being the director of the Volunteer Center. What he said recently is, what if I told you there was a medicine available that would lower your risk of diabetes, Alzheimer's, heart disease, stroke, and mental health? And what if I told you that taking this medicine would improve our democracy, make you happier, and make your community stronger? And what if I told you this medicine were free and readily available to every one of us at any time? This medicine, this medicine is volunteerism, that when we step out and serve others, we create real value for our community, we strengthen our community, we get happiness and health for ourselves. So I really want to thank the city for partnering with us. I want to thank you for your wise investment in our program. And I want to turn it over to our wonderful Director of Volunteer Engagement, Christina Thurston, uh, Johnny Shamoon, who's our staff member here at the volunteer, from the Volunteer Center that runs CityServe, <clears throat> had a death in the family, so he couldn't make it today. But Christina makes us look good in all things. <laughs> sure, thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to uh, do my best to fill in. Um, for the volunteers, when I read your name, uh, you can come on up and accept your award. And I not sure am I reading the descriptions or are you I doing think, that I think what we'll do mm -hmm. is I've distributed this among council members so Beautiful. we will have a council member introduce each person as we move along sound Perfect. all right that sounds great and I have everyone's awards I'll just hand them out wonderful thank you thank so you much, for, much for honoring uh, the volunteers so today we will start with council member Brown on the first person to be recognized all right, it is my uh, pleasure and honor to uh, recognize Karen Perrette. Did I get that right, Perrette? You Karen. did, and actually she was not able to be here today. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Karen just so folks are aware of her uh, wonderful volunteer work. Um, Karen is a Santa Cruz City Graffiti Abatement Volunteer. Uh, she's been part of the program now for several years, removing graffiti from different locations throughout the city and just as importantly, notifying the city when she is unable to remove graffiti. Um, so I'll skip around over here, but um, years of dedication to the city graffiti abatement program has been no less than outstanding. She is passionate and understands it is an activity that may go unnoticed by many, but the results keep our city beautiful. And so I'd like to ask folks to join me in giving a huge thank you to Karen, graffiti abatement. <laughs> The, uh, the next person uh, we're going to recognize is uh, Isabella Brown. Uh, Isabella Brown is kind enough to volunteer in the office of the mayor and uh, a young person who works very hard, very smart, goes to the University of California here, uh, full of energy and goodwill and happiness on a regular basis has been uh, quite helpful in the uh, operations of my office and I thank her for that. So thank you, Isabel Brown. The last mayor. I have the privilege of recognizing and thanking my friend Nancy Holmes. And Nancy, you can come on up and get your award. Nancy volunteers at the London Nelson Senior Center here in downtown, and she's been teaching chair yoga every Wednesday since January 23. She put in 70 hours of volunteer hours during that time, and Nancy started teaching a second weekly class called Cardio Drumming. Both of these classes, Nancy Leeds, are, offer accessible forms of exercise to reach our senior patrons with the greatest needs. Nancy generously shares her enthusiasm and positivity every week with our seniors at the center. The students always leave her class with a huge smile and her contagious positive energy is spread amongst them. The Downtown Senior Center is so grateful for Nancy's contributions and we look forward to more classes to come. Thank you, Nancy. Ms. Colin Tori Johnson. 
right, it's my pleasure to um, announce Catherine Cohen as an awardee. So Catherine, is Catherine here? No. She's ill. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and read um, portions of this so we can honor her today. Catherine volunteers at the London Nelson Senior Center and leads a memoir writing class every week for seniors at the center. She's been volunteering at the center since 2019 and has accumulated over 500 hours of volunteer service. After retiring from Cabrillo, Catherine decided to volunteer to lead the class and has done amazing. During the pandemic, Catherine continued to teach her class. She changed the format to Zoom so that students were active and engaged and connected. And um, Catherine's class consisting has long wait lists as students are eager to learn from her expertise. She's built a safe space for students to create, learn, and grow through the therapeutic experience of memoir writing. So we're grateful for Catherine's time, wisdom, mentorship as she helps so many write their stories. Thank you to Catherine. Councilmember Watkins. It's my pleasure to recognize Alan B. Allen, who's here. Welcome. Please come forward. I have a few words to say about Alan. Alan has volunteered with Parks and Recreation in our Neighborhood Parks Program. He conducts maintenance and care to the City Hall in Mission Plaza Rose Gardens and has done so for over five years, accumulating over 700 hours of volunteer service to our city. Alan provides passion and expertise in his care of our beautiful rose gardens. Over the last five years, the roses at City Hall and Mission Plaza have been a huge success. A huge thank you goes to Alan from all of us for his dedication, hard work, and passion about civil service and volunteerism, and his part in providing a great value to our community. Thank you, Alan. Mr. Newsom. It is my honor to introduce Alex. Alex has volunteered with our Parks and Recreation Neighborhood uh, Parks Program. And over the past year, Alex partnered with the Parks and Recreation staff discussing the establishment of a fishing line recycling program at Westlake Park. And Alex has been passionate about preserving the habitat and ecosystem at Westlake Park. And through developing partnerships, has been able to spearhead the city's installment of four fishing line recycling stations at Westlake Park. And so we want to thank Alex for the amazing volunteer serve for her amazing volunteer service at Westlake Park. Thank you. Mr. Newsom, you're up again. Uh, I also have the honor of uh, introducing Elise. And Elise. Elise is also a volunteer with the Parks and Recreation uh, Neighborhood uh, Parks Program. Uh, she has been volunteering for over two years with the City Serve program and has accumulated over 200 hours of service to our community. Elise works on preserving, caring, and maintenance at Westlake Park. Elise has removed hundreds of abandoned fishing lures, recycled fishing line, and provides weeding around the lakeshore. Elise's passion for cons conservation, hard work ethic, and creativity have greatly impacted the habitat preservation at Westlake Park. So thank you, uh, thank you so much, Elise, for your work. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins. And I have the pleasure of recognizing Bev. Please come forward, Bev. <laughs> so Bev is a volunteer for our Parks and Rec Neighborhood Parks Program. She volunteers providing care and maintenance to the University Terrace Dog Park. Mm -hmm. Bev has volunteered for three over three years, accumulating 700 plus hours of volunteering in our community. Bev has a real passion for the dogs and the people of our community to have fun and have a safe place to play. She has provided daily work for the prior three years, pulling foxtail weeds and assisting with erosion control. Bev is a selfless volunteer with a passion for safety and spaces for the community. We thank you, Bev, for your performing your tireless work for the prior three years, and we appreciate all your hard work and dedication. So thank you very much, Bev. I just wanted to, to say one thing. Um, I was, I've been doing this since 2016 when my dog, Sasha, had gotten three bouts of having foxtails embedded in her body oh. during that time of year. And it was just really, 
rough and I don't know how devastating those things are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you Thank so you much. So how wonderful. <laughs> Mayor is recognized. It's my pleasure to recognize Paul Martin. And Paul, are you here? There you are. Yeah, Mayor. thank you. Come on down. <laughs> Paul has volunteered for the graffiti abatement program for many years. His dedication for the removal of graffiti throughout the city of Santa Cruz has been nothing but extraordinary. Paul helps by taking photo of graffiti he finds and sending it to the city on a weekly basis. Graffiti that Paul cannot remove himself, he also notifies the city of the specific locations, which helps the city process and gather evidence of how widespread the problem is. His consistency and dedication to the graffiti program has helped keep the city of Santa Cruz free of graffiti and his help to senior homeowners to remove graffiti on their homes shows his love for the people in our community and for the beauty of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Paul, for those of us that live on Market Street, thank you for your quick attention to things. Very much appreciated. Shepard Contar Johnson. Great. I am pleased to announce Hunter Denworth. Is Hunter here? Well, we're going to recognize you anyway, Hunter. <laughs> Hunter was a part of our Youth Serve Summer Institute, which conducted two beach cleanups, two park restoration projects at Orina Gulch, and two invasive species removal and plant restorations at San Lorenzo River. With a total of 48 hours of volunteer work, Hunter's volunteered at nine different organizations, including our own City Serve program. Hunter showed leadership skills, helping others to complete tasks, and encouraging others to try new tasks. Hunter showed dedication and genuine interest in the service he was providing, as well as learning about the different organizations and environment. He asked questions and participated in all of our events and discussions. Thank you, Hunter, and we hope you continue to volunteer in our city or wherever your dreams may take you. Council Member Brown. All right. I well, I get to finish up here with our second Youth Serve nominee, Eliana Shamoon. Eliana here? Also, <clears throat> not here. Sorry. All right. Well, Eliana was here <laughs> for um, every session um, of uh, the Youth Serve Summer Institute. So an amazing uh, youth volunteer. The institute consisted of two two-week sessions with youth volunteering with eight different organizations. Eliana was the only youth to attend every day, um, showing her true passion for volunteerism and helping others. Ellie, her nickname, was a super volunteer, encouraging the other youth around her and being a great role model in our second session with her experience from the first. In all, she was able to assist City Serve with two beach cleanups, two park restorations, and, invas and, and invasive species removals at Arana Gulch, two river cleanups and invasive, invasive species removal at the, on the San Lorenzo River. And along with this service, Ellie has assisted the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz with their Adopt a Family project and, and their emergency food assistance in Pajaro, really critical programs of the amazing Volunteer Center. Thank you, Ellie, and keep the volunteer spirit alive. You did a great job. That's Christina, closing <laughs> remarks. Thank you. Yeah, that's everyone. Thank you to the council members for taking the time. I know you're busy to recognize the volunteers. It really does mean a lot to them, even the ones that weren't here. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge the contributions of the city staff who put in a lot of time and effort and energy to mentor the volunteers and make it possible for them to participate in city programs. The folks who nominated these volunteers today are Mayor Fred Keeley, Mike Godsey from the Parks and Recreation, Kelly Mercer Labov, also from um, Parks and Rec with the Senior Center, Jennifer Shelton with Economic Development and Housing, and Robin Sycamore from the also Economic Development and Housing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We literally couldn't do it without you. Thank you so very, very much. We are finished with the day's agenda. We have an evening agenda that will begin at 5.30 p.m., at which time we will take up two appeals of a land use decision. Until such time, we stand in recess.
the hour of 5.30 having arrived, the clerk will call the roll to establish a quorum. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkin? Here. Bruner? Present. Alan Tari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we will move to item 26. Uh, this is an appeal of a decision for a development project at 1130 and 1132 Mission Street here in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, before we begin, I would like to set the situation here for everybody, make sure we uh, all have an understanding how we're going to proceed tonight. Uh, for those of you that haven't maybe attended or don't frequently attend city council meetings, uh, we sit in various capacities. Uh, you all went to uh, school and got yourself a, a course in civics, and so you know that there's executive, legislative, and judicial activities. Oftentimes those are in separate branches of government, but there are times when the city council serves in all three capacities. Uh, for example, this morning we had uh, on item four an amendment to a lease. Item 14, we were authorizing a contract. Uh, in those capacities, we essentially sat as an executive body. Uh, we took up initial hearings of our budget this afternoon and this morning, and we sat essentially as a legislative body making decisions about a budget. Here this evening, we're sitting in what you would probably recognize more as a judicial body. Uh, we are going to be hearing an appeal. We will be accepting evidence. We will be hearing testimony. We will then weigh all of that and make a decision. What we do here at the City Council maybe is different than perhaps some other meetings you've been at. We will listen to each and every person who wishes to testify, and I'll go through that in a moment. And the way that we will do that is that we will listen with rapt attention, literally, to every person who provides comments. Every person, whether you're online or you're here in person, we will extend to you every courtesy and respect by listening to your testimony. We won't interrupt it. We'll listen to what you have to say. We would expect then, when the matter is back before the council, that it is a reciprocal arrangement. And that is, when the matter is back before us, we would expect the same courtesy we will extend to you, which is not to interrupt you, not to make comments while you're testifying, uh, not to show uh, that we agree or disagree with it. So we would ask that courtesy back the other way because we will be sitting in a judicial capacity here making determinations. So let me explain how we will proceed. We will be hearing from first a member of the planning department who will provide us with a staff report. As you know, this matter was before the body on a previous occasion. We sent it back to the planning commission. We want to hear from staff what happened in the intervening period of time. We will then hear there are two appeals tonight. We will first hear from appellant number one, Ian and Natasha Guy. We will then, that'll take up to, they can do what they want with that time. They have 20 minutes. They can use it all themselves. They can have other people participate. They can do what they wish with that 20 minutes. Same thing for Ms. Livingston, Laura Livingston, who is the second appellant. Ms. Livingston will also have up to 20 minutes. She can use that time as she wishes. At that point, we will hear from Jamila Cannon, a representative of Workbench who will have up to 20 minutes to say whatever the applicant wishes to say. Matter will then be at a point where the council will be able to ask questions. This is not the time for us to act. It's time for us to ask any questions we have. We'll then reach the point where every member of the public who wishes to testify either online or in person will be able to do that for a period of time not to exceed one and a half minutes. Following all of that, the, each of the appellants will have five minutes to provide any wrap-up or response that they wish. Matter will then be back before the body. That's the point at which we will engage in discussion, debate, deliberation, and actually take a final action on this item. So with that as the way to set the stage, I'm going to recognize Mr. Bain 
from the planning department and Mr. Lee Butler, the planning director, for an opening presentation. Good evening, sir. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the City. I want to provide a little bit of context before turning it over to Mr. Bain, and I'll start by noting that any new housing makes housing more affordable for all. Prices won't necessarily go down, but housing prices rise more slowly when new housing is getting built. And that fact is often misunderstood, but the more it is studied, the more it is backed up. And I've got background information on the ready should the council choose to see any of that. But you can see on the slide here that since 1980, the general trend for housing production in California is for a steady decline in housing production, especially over the last 17 years. And you can see that here in Santa Cruz, the trend mirrors that with the exception of a couple of years ago when we had a few large projects break ground. And to put these numbers in perspective, our high school seniors are graduating this week, including 275 of them at Santa Cruz High. We are not producing enough housing, with the exception of that uh, two years ago, we are not producing enough housing for just the high school seniors of Santa Cruz High. And we have four high schools in the city. So it's no wonder that we've got challenges in um, having our kids remain in town. Um, next slide, please. This slide was developed by Shane Phillips. He is um, the author of The Affordable City and a professor at UCLA. And um, I think um, most of us in this room would agree that um, we have an appealing city. And pretty consistently, we hear from the community that we want to have an affordable city. And you cannot have an appealing and affordable city that is static, that is unchanging. In order to have some semblance of affordability, we have to change. We have to produce housing. Next slide, please. The state has responded to the pattern of reduced development um, in a number of ways and very substantially over the last seven years in particular. And um, the council members are familiar with all the things, uh, all the different regulations on the slide here. Um, the, the, not the least of which is the updates to the Housing Accountability Act, which um, significantly limit cities' abilities to modify projects that are before them. Um, I won't go into all of those, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Our team is ready to answer questions uh, about these. And um, all of them apply to the project that's before you tonight in, in one way or another. Um, our team was not perfect in our initial review of this project, and Ryan is going to talk with you about that um, and um, some of the changes that have occurred to um, update those plans um, prior to it coming to the uh, council the, uh, on uh, the end of last month. And um, I, I'll just close before turning it over to Ryan by saying that the state laws that you see here are in place because of projects like this. This is the type of project that we need to address our housing and climate goals, the type of project we need to, over time, shift modes of travel. And that will occur. That shift will occur. We're already seeing projects like this along our corridors, Mission, Ocean, Water, Soquel. And while we will experience growing pains as a result of projects like this, um, you'll hear about many of those growing pains tonight. Uh, our community as a whole will be better off because of projects like this in the long run as we integrate them and others like it into our urban fabric. With that, I'll turn it over to Ryan Bain to talk about the project. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Mr. May Mr. Bain, good evening. Good evening. 
So, um, <coughs> excuse me, the project proposal um, is a five-story mixed-use project um, with at-grade parking uh, with some commercial space um, on the ground floor and 48 uh, SRO units. In terms of entitlements um, as part of this project, we have a non-residential demolition authorization permit to demo the existing structures on the site, boundary adjustment to um, combine the two parcels, um, a design permit, special use permit for the SROs um, in, the, in the zoning, a water course development permit uh, with it being adjacent to Laurel Creek, and then a density bonus, which includes uh, waivers um, to height FAR and setbacks, and then also um, two concessions that uh, I'll cover a little bit later. Um, and in terms of community outreach, we did have a community outreach meeting back on April 18th of 2023. Um, there was uh, approximately 100 members of the public attended the meeting um, with questions and discussions involving height, uh, parking, traffic, shading, trash pickup, and pedestrian-friendly improvements. Um, while the previously mentioned issues were part of the discussion, there were also comments supporting the project, specifically in regard to the addition of high density housing along the Mission Street corridor and the provision of affordable income units as part of the project. Uh, in addition to the webinar, a project webpage was created um, and, a, and posted to the City of Santa Cruz website that provided a link to the recorded webinar and allowed for members of the public to submit comments. In terms of the background, um, this project was heard by the Planning Commission um, back on January 18th of this year, and it was approved on a five to one vote. Um, on January 29th, um, two separate appeals um, of the Planning Commission decision were received. And following receipt of the appeals and before being scheduled for a city council hearing, the applicants submitted revised plans um, to the planning department, um, reducing the number of single occupancy SRO units from 59 to 48, among some other changes that we'll, we'll cover. Um, the city also received several items of correspondence um, from the public identifying areas of concern regarding details on the plans, which triggered some additional plan revisions from the applicant that have been uh, addressed on the, newer, on the newest set of plans. And as you mentioned, at the April 30th city council hearing, the council approved a motion referring the application to the planning commission to provide a recommendation on the applicant's proposed changes and following the April 30th council hearing and before the May 16th planning commission hearing, the applicant updated their plans to clarify some of those various issues um, that had uh, been brought up at that April 30th uh, council meeting. Um, as I mentioned, we did receive two separate appeals um, on the planning commission approval of the project. Um, there, we went into a lot, all the details of the appeal and addressed a lot of the, um, or all of the appeal issues. Here are some of the issues that were brought up as part, and it's all included in our staff report. Um, some question, the eligibility of the AB 2097 regarding parking requirements, loss of solar, um, base density and far calculation accuracy, traffic impacts, neighborhood compatibility, and creek impacts were just some of the issues that were brought up um, as part of those appeals. So um, at the direction of the council, we did bring the revised plans back to the Planning Commission on uh, May 16th. And at that hearing, um, eight members of the public spoke at the hearing, um, with six in support and two expressing concern with certain aspects of the project. The two people that expressed concerns, one mainly was concerned with the truck delivery um, as locations, and then also someone had some concerns about the creek impacts of the project. Um, six spoke in favor, um, most discussing you know, how this project really helps us. This is a type of project that will help us meet our arena numbers, um, the need for housing, and then the, the positive um, that the food bin would be, which has been a long time um, business here in Santa Cruz, would be remaining on site. So the Planning Commission recommended approval on a 7 to 0 vote. And as part of that recommendation, they also uh, had a couple of conditions of approval that they had recommended to the council. One had to do with the um, previous condition of approval regarding um, regarding 
the volunteering of $10,000 to the adjacent property at 1212 Laurel for the cost of the solar panels. The commission had basically wanted to simplify the condition and just suggested that a straight $10,000 be provided to that neighbor. Um, and then also a condition about a six foot solid wall. Um, specifically, they were discussing a split face concrete block wall be constructed along the, the western property line with that single family um, home adjacent. Um, also, uh, they wanted a biotic report peer review to be done. And we were able to actually get that done last week. Um, our environmental consultant, um, Dudek, was able to, to prepare that report and we received it uh, on Friday. Um, I think you might have been included um, later on in, in your uh, packet. So in terms of the biotic peer review, Dudek states that the report is well written and consistent with industry standards for biotic resource assessments and supports the report's overall conclusion that special status wildlife species are not expected to occur on site due to a lack of suitable habitat. They also state that while the report would benefit from additional information on its methodology and rationale for its significant findings, they concur with its overall conclusion that the project would not have a significant impact on biotic resources and supports the recommended conditions of approval to remove invasive species and plant native vegetation. Um, so speaking about some of the revisions that occurred, and this is what we brought back to Planning Commission, um, there were changes mainly to the base density diagram, specifically looking at uh, FAR, unit size, and then the inclusionary requirements. Also, the changes included um, storage spaces for ADUs, additional requested concessions, and some new conditions of approval. So um, as part of these revised plans, um, the applicant has revised uh, specifically sheet GP 0.05, which demonstrates the base density calculations for the project. Um, the base density calculation is, is necessary in order to determine the allowed uh, density bonus calculations, which are based on the maximum number of units that will be permitted under the city's zoning code, in this case, the CC zoning. So following the planning commissioner hearing um, in January, uh, it was brought to staff's attention that the base density diagram was inaccurate and because it did not show the correct rear yard setbacks and did not meet the allowed FAR, uh, which was is 1.75. So the community commercial zone district requires a 15-foot rear setback as was depicted on the original base plan. Um, but the Mission Street Urban Design Overlay District calls for an increased setback, um, which reads as parcels adjacent to a residential district shall maintain a rear setback of 25 feet for the first and second stories and a 35 foot setback for a third story. So this was corrected and is now, um, is now shown correctly on this base density diagram. So through the course of the revisions, uh, the number of base density units was reduced from 40 um, to 33. And the FAR was recalculated using the gross lot area instead of the net area, which deducted the riparian setback area, as was presented in the Planning Commission staff report. So recent laws require, specifically SB 330, requires that the city use the general plan density for the FAR calculation, which is based on a gross acreage. So that's been corrected. And as is demonstrated um, in this table, the base density FAR calculation resulted in an FAR of 1.72, um, thus not exceeding the maximum 1.75. So the, the, the prior plan incorrectly included the covered parking area and FAR calculations and specifically section 24.22366 of the zoning ordinance only includes covered residential parking. And because this is all commercial parking, the area is not included in the FAR calculation. And so those have all been looked over and corrected and, and this is the accurate um, calculation now. The updated plans, updated plans also included um, um, a sheet that's GP09 that provides details on how the proposed project meets the requirement of average gross unit area. Since zoning the zoning code specifies that the average unit area of the proposed project cannot exceed the average unit area in the base density calculation. Um, per, per that section of the zoning ordinance, the gross residential area is used to determine floor area and includes the area of the unit walls. So the previous plans approved in January by the Planning Commission 
did not call out the comparison between the average gross unit area of the base density plan and the average gross unit area of the proposed project. So the latest plans show that the base project and density uh, bonus project comply with the provision with the average um, base density unit size being 354.6 gross square footage and the average project unit size being 346. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It should also be noted that an additional uh, new page provides details on average net SRO unit size to demonstrate that the SRO average unit size requirements are being met. So the SRO section of our ordinance states that the net area of an SRO unit may range from a minimum of 150 square feet to a maximum of 400, um, with an average unit size being no greater than 345. So with an average net unit size of 287.7, the diagram demonstrates that the average net SRO unit size falls within that permitted range. Similar to the gross average unit size page, the diagram compares average base density unit size with the proposed project net unit size, which has caused some confusion. And so this comparison is really not needed and does not create nonconformance as the previously mentioned gross unit area calculation is the correct way to confirm the average unit area of the proposed project and does not exceed the average unit area in the base density calculation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. With a new base density of 33 units, um, six or 20% of the residential units will be required to be deed restricted as affordable housing units at the very low income level, which is 50% of the area median income. In addition, the applicant intends to convert newly proposed storage spaces into 11 accessory dwelling units, um, which will bring it up to a total of 59 units total, 48 SROs and 11 ADUs. Uh, of, the, of the 11 ADUs, two will be required to be restricted at the low income level, or 80% AMI. However, the property owner has volunteered to provide all eight units at the very low income, consistent with the original proposal heard by the Planning Commission back in January. Um, the floor plans for levels two through five have been revised to replace three units with storage spaces on each floor, um, as demonstrated here. Um, additionally, the rear setback along the western property line has been reduced from 15 feet to six, foot, six feet three inches in the location of the new storage spaces for flo um, floors two through five. And the setback reduction is proposed to be added to the original waiver request uh, for a zero setback. Uh, cities are generally obligated um, to grant density bonus waivers or reductions in development standards so long as the proposed development complies with the applicable affordability requirements and the waivers do not result in specific adverse impacts on health and safety for which there is no feasible method to satisfactorily mitigate. So case law is also established that the city is also limited in requiring modifications to the project as proposed that would have the effect of reducing project amenities in order to meet development standards. The applicant indicates that the intent of the added storage space is to take advantage of recent ADU laws which allow the conversions of the portions of the existing multifamily dwelling structures that are not used as livable space, um, such as storage areas, boiler rooms, passageways, et cetera. So these sections indicate that a local agency is required to ministerially approve these types of conversions uh, with a building permit. Therefore, if the project is approved um, at the time of building permit application, the applicants will be proposing to convert those 11 storage spaces into 11 ADUs, resulting in a total of 59 units total. Um, also, following planning commission approval back in January, um, two, concession, two additional concessions were requested um, by the applicants. Um, based on the affordability levels, the applicants are entitled up to three concessions, and they're asking for two. Um, the purpose of this standard condition has been to allow future flexibility um, of commercial spaces to accommodate restaurant uses, which require special ducting, venting, and grease traps. So this here is a standard condition that we've used for most of our projects. So having these in place when the building is being constructed avoids issues in the future uh, when a potential restaurant use may want to move in, um, and either of these items cannot be physically incorporated into that space. So the applicants are requesting this condition be removed as a concession, stating that requiring construction of building features that are not necessary for the proposed uses unnecessarily increases costs to the project. Um, so this concession would result in an identifiable and actual cost reduction to provide for affordable housing cost and is consistent with state law and must be granted. 
The applicants are also requesting that the city not require the payment of any impact fees until the timing of the issuance of a final certificate of occupancy for the development. Um, again, another standard condition is that those fees are, are paid at the time of building permit issuance. So as part of this request to defer the payment of the fees, applicants have stated that the collection of the fees at building permit issuance increases costs to the project because of interest payments on those funds during the course of construction. So therefore, the granting of this concession will result in an identifiable and actual cost reduction to provide affordable housing costs and thus must be granted. Also, um, a number of conditions of approval have been um, volunteered and offered up, um, mostly to address um, concerns that have been expressed by the neighbors. Um, just listing, listed a few here, I won't read through all of them, but um, some of them, uh, 67 mainly, to address any impacts to the creek in terms of lighting. Um, 68 has mainly to do with privacy impacts and creating some buffers to the neighbor to the west. Um, 69 has to do with curbside loading uh, north of the driveway. Um, also, 70 is the one that we discussed about the payment to the neighboring property regarding their solar. 71 basically is, is just clarifying that a grab-and-go fast food is not permitted unless they come forward with an administrative use permit sometime in the future. Um, and then 72 through 74 have to do with colors and murals uh, on the building. That were some concerns of the, of the neighbors. Um, let's see. There was also some concerns about parking and people pulling in and not being, knowing whether or not there's any available parking spaces. So they volunteered to um, include an electronic sign and system to display available parking spaces within the garage before someone pulls into to the garage. Um, also volunteered $7,500 to go toward the Metro and future bus stop improvements. Um, also a condition um, that was provided to us by Santa Clara Valley, or sorry, Santa, Santa Cruz County Environmental Health uh, regarding um, soil management, a soil management plan be um, provided uh, before they do any type of soil excavation. So in terms of recommendation, we're recommending that the City Council adopt a resolution denying the appeals, thereby upholding the Planning Commission's acknowledgement of environmental determination and approval of the entitlements that are involved as part of the project uh, based on the findings listed in the draft resolution and the conditions of approval that are attached to that resolution. And I am available for any questions. Mr. Bain, thank you very much. Uh, we will return with regard to questions of you on this presentation in a little bit. This would be the opportunity for Ian and Natasha Guy to present their appeal for a period of time up to 20 minutes. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council. Thank you. Oh. Um, hi, I'm Natasha Guy. I'm here with my husband, Ian Guy, and we also have a guest speaker, Veronica, who will be helping sure. us um, speak to one of the points we want to make. Okay. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Oh, sorry. I'll go back. I'm not very good at public speaking. This is not what I normally do. To introduce myself... You're, you're um, doing great. Thank you. I am a color and material designer. I specialize in aesthetics. I design beautiful things that hopefully last for a long time using sustainable um, practices. My husband is a mechanical engineer. He designs things that also let, um, work for a long time and are designed beautifully. Um, Ian will speak to one of the more legal aspects that we have found is a problem with this um, uh, plan. I will, Veronica will then help support his um, argument and I will wrap up with a few extra points. Okay. Go ahead. Good evening and welcome. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, so the thanks for your, your comments, Ryan, but you didn't talk about parking or, or transit stops. And I'm, I'm going to 
admit to doing something extremely boring over the past several weeks, which is I went through all the bus timetables and this development is illegal and it is not eligible for no parking. And I'm going to walk you through some math, which is kind of fun. Let's go. Next slide, please. So as I said, this is not eligible for the parking exemption because it's not one half mile from a major mass transit stop. And so the city must enforce these parking requirements. And I'm saying this from a place of selfishness because my kids live on a street two blocks away and I don't want them to be <laughs> running around on the street next to all these cars which are going to end up there because we don't live in London. We live in Santa Cruz, which is a sleepy beach town. And we do not have mass transit, especially in that area. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thanks. So what is a mass transit stop? It could be one of three things from this section of the code. It could be an existing rail or bus rapid transit station. It could be a ferry terminal. Or it could be the intersection of two or more major bus routes with a frequency of service interval of 15 minutes or less during the morning and afternoon peak commute periods. So let's go through these one by one. Next slide, please. The Metro Transit Centre is more than half a mile away, so we can skip over this quickly. Doesn't meet that requirement. Next slide. Ferry terminal. I'm waiting for the ferry service to Hawaii, but it's not online yet, so whenever that's available, I'll be very happy to support this project. <laughs> Next one. Okay, let's dig into this a bit more because it's a bit complicated and there's a lot of words here. Next slide. So this is what the Planning Commission said. The Planning Commission said, and I'm not going to read this word for word because you may not understand my accent, but when you analyze the transit stops within half a mile radius of the subject site, there are multiple transit stops with frequency intervals of 15 minutes or less. So that seems like a good response on the surface, but let's dig into it a little bit deeper. Next slide, please. So the code says the intersection of two or more major bus routes with a frequency of service interval of 15 minutes or less during the morning and afternoon peak commute periods. We also call that rush hour sometimes. Next slide. So this is the timetable that was provided. Next slide. If you look at Route 18, which is highlighted, it stops at two different stops and is going in two different directions. So that is sort of to say that if I wanted to go to the university, but I missed the bus, I could just jump on another bus going in the opposite direction. And that's not typically how public transport works in my experience. If we go to the next one, same applies for Route 19 and then Route 42 is a bit of an anomaly. So the service interval calculated here is not on a specific route. Basically, what we've calculated is the amount of time for any bus to arrive going anywhere to any bus stop <laughs> and said that that meets the definition of 15 minutes or less. And like I said before, that's never how I've used the bus. Next slide, please. I think I made that point. Next slide. The other thing that's interesting about this is we've just looked at the time between 4 and 6 o'clock. And to me, that is the evening, unless it's AM, but I checked the bus timetable last night and the buses don't start that early here. So this also doesn't meet the requirement. Let's just skip to the next slide and see what it says. 15 minutes or less during the peak morning and afternoon commute periods, not just any time of day. So what if we tried to calculate this correctly as it is stated in the code? Let's go to the next slide. These are the bus routes going in different directions. Let's take a step back. What is a bus route? Next slide. A bus route is a designated path or itinerary that follows a bus to pick up and drop off passengers at specified locations or stops. Bus routes have some interesting metrics. Start and end points. Stops. It's important to note that stops are not synonymous with routes. They also have a schedule. That's the time the bus comes at. They have a frequency. And by my research, that is the interval at which buses run on the route through a particular stop 
and that often changes through the day during peak hours. They have a direction and they also have a number and a name for the route. So taking this, let's move to the next slide and do some maths. Or wait, actually, major transit stop first. I'm getting excited. The intersection of two or more major bus routes with a frequency of service interval of 15 minutes or less during the morning and afternoon peak commute periods. That's what a major transit stop is. Let's keep going. So I did this for every single bus, at every single one of those stops that was called out, my own time. I took the day off work the last time the meeting was cancelled, only to not be told that it was cancelled. Thanks for that. Next slide. So there's a lot of schedules, as you can imagine, and I put them all into a big spreadsheet because I love nothing more than a spreadsheet. Next slide. This is the math. On this, what I did is I took the rush hour, assuming it starts at 5 a.m. and ends at 9 a.m., but you can cut it in different ways, as we said in our appeal. And then I calculated the mean frequency of service for the peak morning and afternoon commute periods. If we go to the next slide, we can start walking through what I found. So Route 42, next slide, 120 minute average service. Route 41, next slide, 60 minutes. Route 40, 32 and a half minutes. Route 40 northeast, 33 and a half. Route 19 southeast, 22.1 minutes. 19 northwest, 19.2 minutes. Route 18 southwest, 20.4 minutes. Route 18 northeast, 21.3 minutes. So none of these meet that definition by my eyes. I may be wrong. I'd be happy to discuss it. So I thought, well, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and try and figure out when does 15 minute service interval start? Route 42, never. Route 41, never. Route 40, never. 40 northeast, never. 19 southeast, 901, that's after rush hour. I'd love to go to work at 10.30, but I can't. Route 19 northwest, 8.51. 18 Southwest, 821, 18 Northeast, 858. None of these meet the criteria, at least by my standard. And then finally, it's worth noting that while Route 18 and 19 are the closest routes to meet the definition of a major transit route, they don't intersect at a single stop. They stop at different stops. So Route 18 stops at 1624 in one direction and 1625 in the other and Route 19 stops at 12.25 in one and 12.26 in the other. Next slide. No two major bus routes intersect any of these stops. And so that concludes my maths. I've thoroughly enjoyed going through all this, but on a serious note, it, it doesn't seem to meet the criteria. And that was not addressed by Ryan in his response earlier tonight, and it was also not addressed in our uh, appeal letter which I was disappointed to see. Now I'm going to hand the stage to Veronica, who's going to talk about the health and safety impacts of this. Okay. So as the gentle lady is approaching, I'll repeat my earlier statement. I'll repeat my earlier statement before you begin your presentation. We're not going to have applause or cheers or boos or anything else. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. You wouldn't do that in a courtroom. You're not going to do it here. Good evening and welcome to the city council meeting. I'm looking for the microphone, sorry. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the city council. I'm Veronica Elsie, Laurel Street resident. I would like to elaborate a little bit on the health and safety aspects of this transit plan. First, our transit plan in this area is really quite adequate for a neighborhood that supports the university because that's what we have there. Most 
transit riders are going to take a bus that's near where they live and go to the university and vice versa. So at what are labeled as the major stops, there won't be people transferring from one bus to another like we would have at, say, Ocean and Water. So that is another reason that, to me, this does not appear to meet the qualifications for a major transit stop. The other issue that we have by adding extra people is that we have no bus service that goes towards Walnut or from Walnut except for those occasional 40, 41, and 42. And the reason this becomes, hey, stop, stop, sorry. Um, the reason this becomes important is that if someone moves into this development and is coming from town or somewhere else on Walnut, they're gonna be walking or riding a bike. Where are you gonna ride your bike? On mission? Most people I know don't like that idea. Hey, is there a dog behind you? Yeah. So, something, <laughs> sorry. Hey, stay. Um, stay. Uh, um, so they're going to ride their bikes on the sidewalks, which is what they do now. But we've now increased the number of people riding their bikes on the sidewalk because the entrance to the building is going to be on mission. Part of that sidewalk gets really narrow as it crosses Laurel Creek. So again, a pedestrian like I can't get out of their way. And I often, because of not only the current traffic on Mission Street, but what could be an increase in traffic due to delivery and rideshare vehicles, may not hear the bicycle approaching either behind me or from in front of me. So this creates a very unsafe walking situation for all pedestrians, even those coming to and from the building. The other issue is that the height of the building with these extra stories above everything else is going to change the sound of navigation. And I couldn't find anything that would explain whether they would have to move the walk light button on that corner because right now, when you access that walk light button to cross mission, you kind of have to have a foot in the parking lot to be able to stand on level ground. And I also would like to see mitigation and what they're going to do for pedestrian safety during the construction phase. You're going to have places where they're going to be storing equipment, people coming and going, trucks, it's going to make a very noisy, complex intersection. And that is an intersection where pedestrians have to pay attention because it's not straight when you're crossing. And it's not a place where you want to get off. And I would say that when you're bringing in a small group of housing, I don't see how this will increase transit use because most of your university students already use the public transit. And I would like to see a way for everyone to work together so that we don't attempt to benefit one group at the detriment of another and find a way to get our communities so that the neighborhood is livable, comfortable, and safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. A little time check for you. You have about five and a half minutes remaining. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, we covered that next. Oh, Ian, you had a lot of slides. Um, go into the part where it says health and safe, uh, low cost housing, please. Uh, uh, there's a slide that says low cost housing. Oh, one more, one more. Yeah, there we are. All right. Um, there are a lot of uh, reasons. Everyone here wants more low-cost housing for a variety of reasons, both rentals and ownership. Um, if you go on to the next slide, <clears throat> there was a previous program uh, project that Workbench put forward that was a three-story triplex project on Pennsylvania Avenue. They 
got it through planning permission by saying there would be affordable units. And then after getting the uh, um, approval, they withdrew the affordable units. And this is not okay. I think everyone in this room would agree with that, whether you're for or against this build. Next slide. Should this building go ahead, we believe that Workbench, the developers of 1130, and council members here should uphold this responsibility and co-sign into an agreement that this cannot be removed at any time for a duration that we could um, discuss um, whether it was sold or inherited, etc. Next slide. Health and safety. Okay, um, it has been said that your hands are tied, there's nothing you can do unless this um, build has negative um, impact, impact upon health and safety. Um, what I have found is that you do have the power if we, prior to building, uh, issuance of building permit, if we define that there is something here that would impact health and safety. Next slide. <laughs> There are, well, there's a small text. Um, I won't go through all of these in detail because of time, but there are many reasons why this build will impact people's health and safety. The main one I will cover, seismic and wildfire safety. There should be um, Cal Fire, Caltrans, and Santa Cruz Fire reports on how increasing the density of mission would impact um, evacuation routes. It's already a very densely populated area uh, with a lot of traffic. Um, we've seen how this kind of event can just blaze through and we need to be able to evacuate quickly. I don't, haven't seen anything that states that this has been properly looked into. I'll breeze over air quality and water contamination. We know that that's going to be an issue with construction. The other thing I wanted to touch on was the impact of mental and physical health on this build. Next slide. As I said, I specialize in aesthetics. I won't read through all of this. I'll just read through the bold. Poor design um, evokes negative reactions like anxiety, raised blood pressure, increased risk of infections. Mental health is a direct link to physical health. City living is associated with greater stress responses, emotional regulation, depression, anxiety, and have a lasting effect on the brain. Next slide. A couple more um, articles here. Surroundings actually have a direct impact on our physical and mental health. Uh, looking at certain urban landscapes may actually give you a headache and cause migraines. I know I'm not alone in a feeling that the building as it's proposed has caused me negative mental and physical health. I'm sure there are many people who, if we were allowed to raise our hands, would agree that this has caused them a lot of physical and mental negative effects, and it's not even been built. It's just a year and a half of us pouring all of our heart and souls into trying to fight it. Next slide. Here is the building as it's proposed. And on the left-hand side are some snapshots of the kind of um, facade treatments that existing homes on Laurel have. Wood, stone. Uh, it's all very muted. It's softened. Not only is this five-plus story building going to completely shade a whole uh, surrounding area of houses, removing sunlight from their gardens, it's also clad in black facade. It is going, you'll stand, and the setbacks have been reduced as well. So if you're standing right next to it, you have no sunlight and you have a black looming facade over you. It is so insensitive to people's mental and physical health. It's unbelievable. And Workbench have a lot of, you can go into the next slide. Workbench hold a lot of responsibility in their hands. They're picking up a lot of these projects. And with that responsibility, they should be incredibly sensitive to how they are building and so that they don't impact people's health. Next slide. To summarize, next slide again, thank you. Um, we, our main points are that the parking um, included is insufficient. It is not eligible for the waiver AB 2097 and must include parking. What would, what would you, your 20 minutes is up, but what I'd like you to do is take about 30 seconds and wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Workbench and 1130 should co-sign on the, um, the low-cost housing. Planning council members should investigate the detrimental physical and mental health of the proposed development. 
And then additionally, it's not legal, but buildings of this nature should aim to fit into an existing landscape as seamlessly as possible in order to better to suit everyone, not just the art architect's personal taste. Um, I had some quotes on the next slide that are really nice, but we don't have to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank we you. appreciate it. Next, we will be hearing from Laura Livingston. You have up to, you are a second appellant. You will have up to 20 minutes as you choose how to use that. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Hi. Hello, Mayor and City Council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I, my name is Laura Livingston. I, my name is on the appeal. However, I do represent uh, the Laurel Street and uh, Cleveland neighbors, and James Mueller is going to be speaking, and Vasiliki Basil will also be speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Hey, everybody. I'm James, representing a big block of the uh, Laurel Street Cleveland neighbors. Before my time started, I just wanted to say that the City Council has been amazing in this process. Uh, with being in the negotiator between us and uh, Workbench and the developer. And uh, I want to say thank you to all you guys for all your support in, in doing this. It's not your job. It really should be. There should be a better process in place, I think, for this in the future. But thank you for, for going above and beyond in this whole thing. So uh, here we are. Our appeal was based on uh, a bunch of problems that we found with the, uh, with the building. And everyone, I just want to be clear here. Uh, this is a slide coming up. There's no one in my neighborhood, I'll say, we'll put a caveat on that, but like we're pro-housing, we get it. Like we need housing in this community. Everyone understands. You guys have made a great point on that. And what we're here is we're trying to make sure that the housing that we're building is not like unregulated and that the housing we're putting out is thoughtful and smart and, uh, uh, and is uh, in compliance with the laws and the rules that we've set up for how we want to build our city and not turn that over willy-nilly let developers do whatever they want and and uh, and run the show and and just roll over the planning department and let and we just want to make sure that the rules that the buildings we're building are compliant and do the right thing next slide please uh, so our appeal is just um, against the uh, the January 18th approval of the original project that was approved by the Planning Commission that project was approved in violation of city and state law everyone agrees on that next uh, pro housing I mentioned housing needs to be built we're excited to build housing. I think we all agree the food bin location is a great spot for housing. We should build housing there. The question is just like, what is that going to look like? And is it going to be compliant and legal or are we going to, or not? Um, uh, housing without good planning is a disaster. Good planning needs good enforcement. And we've seen cities that we've traveled to where those haven't been the case. And those are the cities where we're like, God, I'm glad I don't live here, right? Because good centralized planning, a good planning department, good rules and enforcement of those things develops great cities that we can be proud of. That's all we're trying to do here. The, um, and as, as um, uh, director said, we're looking to the future. This building is going to make Santa Cruz better in the future. It will be maximized if we're doing it legally and we're doing and we're building to our code and enforcing those codes to make sure that this, that the buildings we build, we're still going to be proud of 50 years from now and we're not going to regret them like Seaside does the <laughs> giant hotel they accidentally like had built there. Um, and it also, like, if we want to build housing, we want to build it quick. I'm going to talk in this again. But to do that, we need to have, like, even enforcement of our code where developers can show up. They know what they're going to be expected to do. They can submit good plans. Those plans can get approved quickly because they're good plans. And we can move this through the system and not get dialed in in this whole crazy thing that everyone's been involved in for the last six months of, like, trying to get a legal set of plans out of the developer. Um, yeah, oh, and we, we did great. Everyone should know that we are in the 6% of municipalities that met our quota, which we should all be really proud of. And we did that building smart housing, and we did it without huge negative impacts on the local residents. Um, and there's no reason, and we did that so that we wouldn't turn over our building to the state and turn over our building uh, to builders through Builders Remedy. Uh, and we should, and so I don't know why we would then just turn our building plan or code over to developers and not provide any checking to make sure that what they're doing is legal and correct. We fought hard for this right, and we should, and we should use it to build the city we, we want and not the city, uh, the, the city other people want. Thank you. Next. Okay. Our experience with Workbench. So as was pointed out, Workbench had the project out there in Soquel where they submitted one set of plans and they did the switcheroo and then actually tried to build a different building and got 
caught. Um, and uh, that's been kind of our experience too, where they submitted a set of plans, and then after the Planning Commission approved them, they came with some pretty heavy duty changes on what those looked like. And uh, and we've gone through six revisions as they keep trying to like get in there and get the get something that that will pass muster with the minimum amount of uh, compliance. Next. Uh, a great example here is this. Uh, I love this photo from Workbench's plans. Guys, this, um, this if you don't know, this is a 22-foot building next to a 61-foot building. If the perspective looks a little bit weird to you, that that doesn't seem mathematically possible, we can go to the next slide, and we corrected it, and that's actually kind of what it should look like with a 22-foot building next to a 61-foot building. It's a little bit of the misdirection that we've experienced working with Workbench. Next slide. This just shows them kind of side by side there. Next. Um, okay, so our appeal is based on three things. Uh, uh, Ryan already went over these. I'm just going to touch on them again to point out that our appeal is a completely valid appeal, and everyone agrees that it is. The FAR was out of limits. Building setbacks were out of limits, and the developer's base units were smaller than the, than the ones that were permitted and built in the final plans. All those are in violation of various laws. Next. Uh, so real quick for anyone out here who's listening, the way this works is we build, the developer builds like a, or designs a theoretical building. They try and get as many units in that legal theoretical building that they can. Then they apply the 50% density bonus, and that's how we get to our final building. Uh, but that first building, the theoretical one, has to be legal. It has to meet all the rules, and this one's not going to. So I don't want to ruin it for anybody. Um, so this is the base building that they originally submitted for the, for the January 19th uh, plan, uh, commission planning hearing. Next. Uh, FAR calculations, so FAR calculations is just like the size of the floor area of the building that's permitted. You can keep going, sorry. Um, we ended up having to hire a consultant to come in and like do some math and figure out if this was, because our back of the napkin calculation showed that it is way out of line in what's being accepted, or what's, what's realistic. Uh, and so they did all the calculations and of course came out um, next. We put it in a sheet and added everything up, but we asked the, we asked the consultant, like, you know, there's some interpretation here. Like, give us, like, a generous interpretation. Give us a conservative interpretation. Show us, like, kind of how it falls out so we can have a conversation with the developer about that. Um, and unfortunately, next slide, every possible scenario that we came up with, everything with the FAR was out of limits. And the developer will tell you that parking spaces is a commercial building. At the Planning Commission, it's just more the smoke and mirrors from our perspective because at the Planning Commission meeting, they said that they were going to allow residents to use those parking spots at night for guests and visitors. So... The code says that residential parking gets included, commercial parking doesn't. Again, it's not, it's, uh, it's clearly going to be used for residential purposes at night and in the evening. So I don't think that's, um, it's just a little bit misleading to call it purely commercial. Uh, far was out of limits, let's go to the next slide. What does everyone have to say about this? Planning staff says it was brought to the staff's attention. Density diagram was inaccurate, right? So they agree with us. Next. Uh, setback issues. Setback is, this, is the distance that the building has to be from the property lines. We want to make sure we've got, uh, a, you know, that they're not up on the property line. Um, Mission Street Urban Design Overlay says that you need to have, against residential districts, you need to have a 25-foot setback on the first and second floor and a 35-foot setback on the third floor. Um, uh, next slide here. Thank you. Planning Department. Documentation shows the same thing. They're at the bottom 25 foot for the first and second floor, 35 foot for the third floor. And uh, what do we get when we look at the original design plan that was submitted? It was, next slide, 15, right? So, and like 15, it's like uh, planning department, guys, you know, you kind of said like, well, it's complex. There's a bunch of different stuff to, to consider, but this is like professional company. And I mean, like if a nurse doesn't say, I didn't read the chart, sorry, I screwed that up, or a pilot forgot to check that thing, those people would be held accountable. And I don't think it's unreasonable to expect a developer of this magnitude, building buildings of this size, to like have their ducks in a row on, on planning one-on-one -on -one issues like setback requirements. Next. Developer agrees. We revise the base density diagram to include the wider setback. Next. The planning staff says that they also revised and now have the correct setback. So everyone's in agreement. The setback was incorrect. Next. Base unit size. Uh, next. Uh, when they design the base building, the, the, the units have to be smaller, have to be the same size as the units they actually want to build. Did we do that? Let's check. No, we didn't, right? So the design on the left, the base building has 280 square foot units. They actually intended to build 300 and 
50 to 370 square foot units. So that also is not compliant. Next. And again, planning, everyone agrees. Next. So here's why our appeal is valid, right? Our appeal is valid because FAR, like we appealed, it was passed by Planning Commission. We filed an appeal that said that the FAR was on a limit, and it was. Everyone agrees. We said that the base building violated, the setbacks were violated city code. They do. And we said that the units were smaller than they're supposed to be for the, for the initial math, and they were. So I don't understand why everyone's recommending to not approve this appeal. Is there a scenario, is there an appeal that can come before the city that would ever get approved if not this one? Next. ADU issues. So real quick, backing up, I do want to say um, that, uh, I lost my train of thought, sorry. Well, do, so ADU issues, I just want to talk about ADU issues for a minute. Uh, so this is the, the new plan for ADUs. Next. So Workbench's uh, uh, letter there, guys, said that portions of the existing multifamily dwelling structures will be used as ADUs. Okay. Santa Cruz Municipal Code says that it's got some definitions in there. Here's a quick cut. New construction accessory dwelling units shall mean any accessory dwelling unit that includes new construction. That makes sense. And they want us to think that this is existing multifamily dwelling and not new construction because the rules are different. And this is clearly new construction, not existing. And to call it otherwise is more just smoke and mirrors of like, what is what? Next slide. Why do they want it existing? Because new construction doesn't allow windows pointed in a neighbor's yards, which means that they would have to build the ADUs with no windows to be compliant with this regulation, and they don't want to. So they want us all to believe that this is, ex this is going to be existing construction. It's not. It's not built yet. It's new construction, clearly. Next. I just said that. Okay. So um, here's my big takeaway on this, right? Uh, there has to be accountability here. Other developers are watching this, and they're going to say, does this game of, like, pushing everybody around, is anyone going to call us out on it? Are we going, like, what is our path forward for getting what we want? And what we want is we want to send a clear message that says, no, in Santa Cruz, follow the rules, submit clear plans, we'll get them approved and get your building built. I do, for the longevity of our community, we need to have equal application of the law to everybody so it's clear and everyone knows what, they are, what they're getting. That's all we're asking for here. We want the building built. We just want it to be built legally. That was the purpose for the appeal. We're all on the same page. I'm going to bring up uh, Vasiliki to talk about some of the environmental issues, and I'll be right back. Good evening. Hi, I'm Vasiliki Vasil. I'm a neighbor in the Cleveland Laurel area. Um, I'm also a licensed geologist. I've spent a lot of time working on watershed restoration projects, on hazard geology, and on sites that have um, residual gasoline, uh, gas stations, um, <laughs> dry cleaners, a cesium plume at a national lab, and lots of manufactured gas plant sites. So I know how sites that are contaminated work. And I have a lot of questions about whether this actually is uh, consistent with being uh, meeting the CEQA exemption that it was given under Class 32. Next slide, please. I'm not going to read these all, but we've all seen them. These are the requirements for Class 32 CEQA exemption. A, C, and D I've highlighted because I really don't see how this project meets those. I'm going to start out at D. Next project. Next sign. Uh, approval of the project I believe will have some significant impacts on air quality and water quality. Of course, planning department added their, uh, was it COA number 77, I believe, for oversight. We'll talk about that again a little bit later. But as it is now, the project has potential of negative effects to water quality in Laurel uh, Creek near Lagoon. It could increase sedimentation, and there could be an introduction of contaminants into surface waters as well as spreading in the local groundwater, possibly as far as off-site. Next slide. So Laurel Creek is a year-round stream. I know the county and the city, excuse me, view it as a storm drain. Uh, it is a very important stream. It's fed by four karst springs that start in the marble bedrock with pretty good water quality. These flow year-round. Um, next slide, please. So this, uh, this is a picture of the Neary Lagoon watershed. Laurel Creek is the main tributary that supplies Neary Lagoon with freshwater inflow, which is very much needed. Uh, it is, the little blue circles you see are the springs 
that are in, there's four of them in Laurel Creek Watershed, one in Bay Creek Watershed. So the fresh water that's coming into the lagoon when it's not raining is mainly from these springs. Next slide. Uh, in addition to water, Laurel Creek produces 70 to 80% of the sediment in Neary Lagoon. And I know that's very costly for the city to manage in order to pre preserve the wildlife refuge. So when you think about removing the existing vegetation, you could end up with bank erosion. Now, I'm a, a real fan of native planting, but with the reality of an overhanging building that has no riparian setback from the corridor and that the development setback has been waived as well, this large building will be overhanging the creek from a height of 16 feet above the creek channel straight on up to over 61 feet. So anything that's planted in there will be in year-round shade. Will the plants thrive? What happens until they can get established? How much sediment could be transported to the lagoon? What will that additional cost uh, you know, be incurred by the city? Who's going to pay for that? These are things that should be looked at, should be looked at in an environmental impact. Next slide, please. Next, yeah, thank you. Uh, so we all know that the site is a former gasoline uh, site. So there's gas stations there. Back in 1990, the water board learned about a leaking tank that put a lot of gasoline into the ground. So they put monitoring wells in the ground in 93, and these have been monitored up through uh, 2023. Um, there's not as much gasoline left in the ground because it degrades through time. Uh, the water board decided to give this what's called a low threat closure. Now, low threat does not mean the site is clean. It means that, well, given the current land use, you know, we've got a nice paved site, there's two small shops on it, eh, what's going to happen? So they gave it a, a low threat closure, but it's a conditional closure. And the, the italic quote is actually on the closure packet that states that the water board, you know, and the local environmental health and all applicable agencies have to be notified before there is any change in land use or any kind of excavation into the site. Um, next slide, please. So in, in doing our research, you know, we did an FYI, and this was from the um, SB 330 application, where the developer certified, you can see in orange, that there was no hazardous waste on the site, and that it's not listed, you know, in the safety code, section 253, I can't see from here, 66. Um, anyway, next slide. When I looked that up, they were basically referring to what's in the Cortez list of sites. And I highlighted the GeoTracker database where all the uh, groundwater monitoring reports for this site, which I've read every single one of and tabulated data and read most of the ones for the other two gas stations and for the dry cleaner. So yeah, this site's in the database. Does that still qualify for CEQA exemption? Next slide. Uh, so uh, this is compounded by the developer who on two occasions violated the requirement for oversight. And I think environmental health contacted the city around April 30th or so and reminded them of this requirement. And yet a week later, the developer had set up with another project to do at the site. They were gonna lay some lines. So we have this history, next slide. We have this history of disregard for the re management requirements, and that in itself poses a huge risk. Next slide. Um, okay, we'll skip that. <laughs> uh, has it habitat? You know, the, I was really glad that you guys did the biotic report, and um, you didn't address the habitat needs of the raptors, which are protected, next slide, by the migratory bird. Next slide, please. Treaty Act. So wherever they feed and breed is their habitat. Their habitat is the creek. The little bird on top is hanging on to a piece of prey that it swooped down into the creek and caught and ate and shared with its mate right across the creek from the food bin. Um, should I go on or do you want to finish this finish up? Next slide. I just, even if I don't talk, I just want to put these up here. Um, We'll skip this one, even though I think it's really important, but you can take a quick look while I skip it. Next slide. <laughs> uh, setback waivers, this is really important. So right now, most of the plume of gasoline on the site is in the central part of the site. So if you allow setbacks to happen, you're not going to risk spreading that contamination to the margins of the site. If you build up right to the creek, 
and right to the project boundary, you have a risk of transferring gasoline to places that have historically tested clean. So, um, you know, these are risks. They should, next slide, be evaluated through CEQA. And um, next slide. Just want to respectfully thank everybody and ask you to consider whether or not this really meets the requirements for CEQA exemption. And thank you so much to all the council members who met with us. Thank you. Great response. I think you have about, I'm going to guess, about two minutes. One minute. About one minute. I got it. There we go. Good. All right. So, like, uh, Thank you, Vasiliki. So the question is, right, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get something, we're trying to get something built there that works for, that builds housing that we desperately need and works with the city and works with our long-term needs and the neighborhood. Uh, they've got, uh, they're allotted 50 total units, right? Is there a way with uh, including reduced setbacks for the environmental needs and for neighbor concerns? Uh, we need housing. Is there a solution out there that gets us the thing that we all need, which is housing, privacy, et cetera? Does it exist? Yes, it does exist already. Next slide. This is the original base building that Workbench proposed right out of their plans. This is 16 units on the second floor, 17 units on the third floor with full setbacks. You add one more floor, a fourth floor with 17 units, that's your 50 units. You can get 50 units, four floors, full setbacks. Everyone wins. That's, I think, the path forward on this. Next slide. That covers what I just said. Allow sun, privacy, and housing for everybody. Hooray. So we're asking you to approve the FAR waiver because that's required. This note at the top is from city planning documents. This is the last slide, by the way. It says that, hey, uh, the waivers, uh, if, if they preclude building the building, they have to be allowed. But here we've got a perfect building ready to go that doesn't need setback waivers. It does need a FAR waiver, for sure. That should be approved. It should approve the height waiver to four stories, for sure. That should be approved. And we should deny the setback waiver because it's not required and it'll open up a whole mess of CEQA stuff. Um, and we should allow storage and amenities and whatever they want to do within those parameters. Hooray. Next slide. Is that it? There we go. This just talks about the affordability of it and it just says that there's no parking. Lots of these, lots of these buildings in Santa Cruz require parking. That makes it less affordable. This has no parking requirement, which makes it easier and more profitable to build. It's also a small building and it's a modular project, all which reduce costs. So knocking it from five stories down to four stories makes a lot of sense for the neighborhood. It makes a lot of sense for Santa Cruz, and it makes a lot of sense for the builders, I hope. All right. So let's do 50 units now. Hooray. Anyone else? Thank Questions? you. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. We'll now recognize uh, Ms. Cannon on behalf of Workbench. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and council members. Doug is going to join me for a few minutes as well as the project developer. Let me just find my notes here. Um, my name is Jamila Cannon. I'm a founding partner at Workbench, and I want to thank everyone for being here this evening and for being willing to sit down and talk over these last few months about really challenging topics. It's important that all of our voices are heard and that we share our perspectives together so that we can create housing that is sustainable and beneficial for our community. Doug and I are going to introduce ourselves, discuss the project's goals, talk a bit about financing projects like this, and then I probably won't dive a lot into the project changes since Ryan already covered those really thoroughly. Uh, you can move ahead a few slides. Keep going. Keep going. And then uh, I'll let Doug speak for a minute. Good evening. Well, hey, good evening. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you to the appellants, too. It's it's interesting, really. It's good. You guys are bringing it. So. Um, I know a lot of people because they shop at the store, so it's it's kind of bittersweet, you know. So we want to make it work. We're definitely um, thought a lot about this, and um, the seed for it was really the food man. You know, like how do we make it? How do we redevelop it in a way that's that's tasty and and um, is able to physically, you know, stand for a long time. And uh, yeah, just be a nice part of the community, right? Um, so, should I there was one quick question? Can I have a question? Or? You can, can use your. Can I address answers. anything that was said? Sorry, sorry. Should, can I address anything that was said, like in any of the reports, or no? You can use your twenty minutes as you wish. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Just one thing here about the soil and the contamination that's moving stuff around. We've never moved anything around except PG&E. We lost power. The store lost power because it's so old. The feed coming in was like damaged. So PG&E had to come on the site and, you know, get some, they work with the water board and they do everything to code. And that was the May movement of the soil that somebody just brought up in the last appeal. So I just wanted to let you know that wasn't really us, that was PG&E rehooking up our power, if you will. So a little tangent there, but I wanted to uh, address that. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, so really we wanted to provide a long-term home for the food bin in the herb room, and how do we do that? So we, we approached Workbench, and we started working together, and we hired them to help us, you know, hey, let's figure this out and um, do something that will be incremental to the community, give the stores like another life, like a 2.0 for the, for the stores. And at the same time, hit the other marker of uh, um, creating housing for the community and the city. Um, and then lastly, just be a community meeting place on the west side, which we are for a lot of the neighborhood, a lot of Bonnie Dune, a lot of UCSC, mm -hmm. downtown. We kind of pull from kind of pull from all over, pull from uh, even from the east side. So uh, we wanted to maintain that and, and really Compete, you know, we don't compete that well versus, you know, New Leaf, TJ's, Whole Foods, you know, all the big guys, right? So we're trying to say, how do we, how do we do that into the future and, and be relevant as a, not, not a primary shop for people, but a secondary shop or a neighborhood, a nice pantry. Um, so, yeah, so just over the last couple years, I'd say I've talked to, seriously, four or five, six hundred customers, you know, every day it's three or four, it seems like. And uh, it's, been, it's been really interesting. The majority of the feedback has been positive. Like people are for housing, like James said. I think James is for housing, right? Like we want housing. And people want us to incorporate that and build that in so that we can actually build the project. So um, in a weird way, the housing subsidizes the store a little bit, but you need the housing to help the store and vice versa. So it, it, it all sort of works together. Um, okay, so, yeah, so just about, kind of a little bit about the outreach. I've, I've met with a lot of neighbors just informally in the store, met with the local neighbors. Um, I guess I was blindsided a little bit, like, didn't realize there was so much opposition to it until, you know, it got towards the end. Like, the community meeting, there was a lot of questions and a lot of answers, and we tried to deal with those and took online questions and tried to recap the answers that were answered, asked multiple times. Thought we did a good job there, but um, in hindsight, that should probably be more robust earlier in the project. Like, how do you get that feedback earlier, right? So, um, but yeah, most of the people I talked to, I'd say eight of 10 were for it. Eight of, eight of 10 people are for it. And really, it's, you know, like we've heard the, the neighbors who are close by that are most impacted are really the ones that are that are upset. And, and I get it. You know, I've lived here. I grew up here. Lived here 55 years. On the, grew up on the east side. And uh, worked downtown. Worked at Mellis Market right across from the food bin. Worked at 7-Eleven on the west side. Worked at Shoppers. Worked at Lucky's. Worked all over, right? So I've been in retail. Been in grocery for a long time. And uh, both my wife's and my parents worked on the mall. Had businesses on the mall, which is like... Nobody does that anymore, right? So, and raise families. <clears throat> so, yeah, I love Santa Cruz. You know, I love it. I want to see the right thing happen here. And, um, yeah, so that's sort of the spirit of it. Um, I guess next slide. So, after the appeals and the, the planning commission meetings, we had... Um, some things that we requested and asked for. And so these are just some of the estimated costs um, of the appeal and the conditions of the project. So um, the window coverings facing the creek, you can see we just threw some numbers out here so you can see what these actually are. The buyout for, for the neighbor's solar, the electronic parking so that when people are in the parking, they can tell what spaces are open, so like an airport. Um, we offered, uh, we, we the bus improvement bond for a bus stop anywhere in the city. And then this is kind of a tricky one, but the ADUs at that very, you know, those levels of affordability. So all the, um, those two, two extra ADUs at that very low rate 
instead of the low rate, which I know it's confusing, but right, that's so the lowest rate. So the impact to the project overall is um, about $150,000. And then, of course, all the drawing updates, hearing process, et cetera, et cetera. So we definitely, we've hung in there on it, and um, we want it to work. And we think it's a good project. We, think, we definitely think it's a good project. We think it'll be, um, help, help the stores out for sure long term. We've had a lot of people come into the stores like, hey, how do I get on the list for, you know, for the housing? And I was like, it's, it's, it's down the road a ways, right? But um, the general feedback's been positive. But I think it's just hard for people, too, who've been here a long time, where just change, right? It's change. And um, my wife and I have been in some really cool um, new towns. Like, I don't know if you guys know Slab Town in Portland, but it's like a brand new uh, town inside Northwest Portland, where it's kind of like a college campus on steroids, like apartment buildings, a new leaf called New Seasons, right in the middle, yoga, restaurants, plant stores, and it merges into the older neighborhoods. It kind of works. It's kind of fun. You got the youth energy, you've got the older stuff, and it kind of, it kind of works. So that's how we sort of envisioned it when we started working with Workbench, and and really being incremental to the neighborhood in terms of like bringing that that bringing other people to the neighborhood. Um, yeah, there'll be some traffic concerns. And one that, one that I did hear a lot is like, where are they gonna park? Well, so we can, we think we can screen on cars. We're pretty confident we can screen only rent to people without cars and people cannot buy parking passes. So that covers a little bit of the street. Can't stop people from visiting their friends at the, at the building or something, but um, for the most part, people in there would not have cars, so. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doug. So before we get into the project financing, uh, next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about Workbench and respond to just a few of the comments that we've heard so far tonight. At Workbench, we believe that building housing is essential to keeping our community vibrant and thriving. We care deeply about our neighbors and bringing our community's goals into reality to create diverse infill housing that supports our changing population and preserves our natural spaces. We're based in Santa Cruz. We're a group of designers, architects, contracts, contractors, developers, and housing policy nerds. We have a 27 person team. 21 of us live here in Santa Cruz County. We're raising our families, supporting our local economy, paying taxes, and we are actively invested in our community. Next slide, please. As a community, we voted for the Green Belt and we identified the corridors and downtown as places for development and growth in order to maintain the natural beauty of our city. We recently codified general plan changes that were decades in the making with the objective development standards. These changes reflect development along the corridors and keep growth out of the neighborhoods. Our work is aligned with this vision by creating infill housing that supports our changing population and helps our neighbors remain in Santa Cruz. Our work has a huge impact in supporting our local economic ecosystem. And best of all, the results of our finished product are homes for people. I'm gonna go off script here a little bit. I just wanna take a minute to respond to a few of the comments um, tonight, that I've heard so far tonight. Um, we have made changes in the past to projects in responses to appeals. Um, we've been open and transparent about what those changes were as we've gone through the appeal process, just like this one. Um, I'd like to highlight just how quickly and often not only the state law, but the interpretation of the state law changes. So we are constantly navigating an ever-changing landscape in which we do our work. Um, as it relates to ADU, the ADU code that was cited was a detached single family code. It's not the multifamily code for how you implement ADUs on multifamily code. And transit stops are set by AMBAG, and they include future stops. Next slide, please. Okay, I've been asked a lot about, can I present a little bit on development and finance info on how a project comes into being? So I'm gonna talk very high level for a few minutes about project development. Next slide, please. So I've been asked a lot about the term penciling or getting a project to pencil over the last few months. I've also been asked to share some high level information about developing a project like this one. I'd like to begin by just naming a common perception that developers are greedy and wealthy and don't have integrity or personal investment in their projects. In some cases, I'm sure that this is true, but I can assure you that in our case and in Doug's case, it is not. 
There's also this notion that the public should get to weigh in on the profitability of a project. We get asked about this a lot. I think this goes back to the perception that developers don't have the community's best interests at heart, and I can understand why the public would want to have a better understanding of a developer's practices. On the flip side, I can't think of any privately financed business where the public gets to say, I'd like to see your P&L and forecasted profit, and then I'll let you know if you priced that service correctly or not. Certainly, nobody walks into the food bin and questions Doug's financial statements before they buy that loaf of bread they need. So the costs of projects can be summarized into four buckets. There's land costs, which include things like the actual land and the carrying costs, like the interest on a loan. There's project development costs. These include all of the costs that a developer must pay to create a project. They include things like design fees, building fees, permit fees, impact fees, and the very hefty cost of construction. Then there's the cost of capital. Most developers don't fund their projects with the cash in their savings accounts. There's a mix of bank and investor money along with personal investment. Lastly, there are operating costs, what it takes to keep the building up and running and maintain to keep it rented and to account for vacancy rates. If all of the costs are well below the final value of a project, then it pencils and will have a better chance of securing funding. Oftentimes projects don't make it past this very initial phase of due diligence because the cost exceeds the value. Next slide, please. In the very beginning of a project, even before the land is purchased or a designer has drawn a single line, a developer will work through a complex matrix of information that includes things like total building square footage, net rentable area, number of units, rent projections, construction costs, finance costs, projected returns, and project schedules to figure out what the right mix of all of these things are in order to get a project to work, i.e. to pencil. This work is often done in a financial modeling tool called a pro forma. Again, a lot of sites just don't work and never make it past this Excel sheet. You'll notice that I use the word projected a lot. Projecting is obviously challenging and can have huge impacts on a project's costs and outcome. For example, the associated builders and contractors reported that building material costs have increased by almost 40% in the last four years, not to mention labor wage increases and the rise of interest rates. It's incredibly expensive to borrow money and to pay for construction right now. Then you layer in the bank and the cost of capital. Banks are risk averse. They do not take chances with their money and they want a safe place to earn interest. They will lend about 65% of the final project cost and in a rental project, they wanna see that projected rents exceed the project's cost by 25%. This is true for any project anywhere. Private investors also expect returns. They have long-term financial goals they have to meet and they know how much risk is in these projects. When you think about it, these don't feel unreasonable, and they may even feel appropriate if you were to put your money into a risky position like this. So if the bank will lend 65% of a project cost, then the developer needs to come up with a 35% of the cost on their own. This is a critical component to why it's so important that projects are seen as financially viable by a bank and by the investment community. Next slide, please. The ratio between cost and value often isn't large enough for banks and investors to take these kinds of risks, i.e. It's, excuse me, it simply costs too much and projects aren't valuable enough. With that as a backdrop, in steps the state. The state's changes to housing policy have helped to bring this ratio, ratio back into balance for lenders and investors, therefore mitigating risk and incentivizing the production of housing. In the graph on the left, prior to state law, one main way to increase the value of a project would have been to increase the rents. However, rents are constrained by local marketplaces and as we know, they are already incredibly high. That project is not feasible. In the right, after state laws, the costs are decreased by the state mandating shorter approval timelines and providing incentives like reductions to impact fees, among many other things. Value is also increased by spreading out costs over more units. Typically, this takes height to achieve the additional units. Another small example that relates to this project that Ryan touched on earlier is that we requested a concession for Doug to be able to pay his impact fees out of certificate of, at certificate of occupancy, which means once the building is finished, rather than at building permits where he'd be paying interest on a loan to pay for those impact fees. It's substantial impact fees are a substantial cost to a project. Therefore, unnecessarily increasing the cost of housing. There's a bill working its way through the state right now that would make this mandatory for all jurisdictions. So this is an incremental and impactful improvement to helping projects pencil. 
The food bin project only pencils because of state housing policies like the density bonus and height waivers. Without those laws, there wouldn't be less housing here. There would be no housing here. So with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation. I hope that you found it useful and thank you all for listening. And I feel, and I really appreciate your feedback as we build our community together. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. We're now at the point where council members are going to have the opportunity to ask questions. Following that, uh, we will go back out to the public, both online and in person, accept all the testimony that is offered this evening, one and a half minutes per presenter. Let me start on my left with the vice mayor, if, see if you have questions at this point. Can we go to other the Certainly, Ms. Kalantari Johnson. <laughs> Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you to the appellants and the applicants for your presentations and for all the time you've spent on this um, project and in meeting with council members. I do have some questions. Let me just get myself organized. Uh, okay. Um, so um, I think this was addressed, but um, I'm going to ask staff. Um, the, the first appellants that spoke to the metro schedules, um, if, if someone can speak to that, are, are those frequencies accurate? Um, does it account for the changes that um, the metro is making? Um, I know Ms. Cannon said that it's also future um, planned transit. Great. Thank you for that question. Uh, good evening. I'm Matt Starkey. I'm the transportation manager. Um, yeah, the key, the key part that wasn't mentioned in the appeal on the um, state laws here is that planned service frequencies as adopted by AMBAG in this case are what counts. And so the Bay Corridor is one of those 15-minute um, frequency corridors in our planning documents. So by plan, not even considering what service is today, um, the exceptions are valid um, as are proposed in the project. Uh, the second piece, um, yeah, as you mentioned, Metro has really um, increased their transit service quite sub substantially lately. Um, I went and looked at the service on Route 18 and 19 uh, in a single direction at the intersection of Bay and Mission Street, and from roughly 8.20 uh, a.m. to 8.20 p.m., there's 15-minute service on both of those lines. So because of the, um, the planned exemption and also due to the service frequencies that exist today, um, this site does qualify for those um, parking exemptions. I'm going to, um, since you're up here, I'm going to ask my other um, traffic-related questions, if that's okay. Um, let me see here. Oh, so um, back to Metro. Has the team, has anyone on the team um, explored what improvements... Uh, so there's a condition, there's a proposed condition of 7,500 by the applicant for Metro bus stop improvements. Has anyone on the team connected with Metro to see what those improvements would, would look like and how much they would cost? I believe um, that's something that I still need to work on more to pencil out those details. We have started looking at where specifically they would happen. I believe that was a request to improve the stops um, nearest the food bin at Laurel Mission. Uh, and what we found is that we don't have the, the city right of way mm -hmm. to do that. And um, that's why it's important in this condition that we could use the funds elsewhere on the Metro service. So where we have space to fit something like a transit shelter that's quite wide and quite long, um, we could do it elsewhere on the route to benefit um, transit riders there. Um, so I do serve on the Metro board, and I did just a little digging. It, it cost $25,000 for one bus shelter, so just for us to keep that in mind. Uh, let me see if I have other traffic-related questions for you, Mr. Starkey. Uh, I think that's it for the traffic. I do have a couple other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this was brought up by one of the appellants around... Um, uh, I think it was Ms. Silic um, around the seismic and wildfire safety and evacuation plans. If somebody could speak to um, that concern that was brought up by Appellant, I don't know who that would be. Good evening. Mayor, Council, thanks for having me. Uh, Tim Shields, Division of Prevention and the Fire Marshal for the City of Santa Cruz. 
Um, so in terms of the wildfire risk and the evacuation routes, um, the current location is not part of the wildland urban interface, so it's not directly interfacing with the wildland. So it's not considered necessarily a technical wildland threat. And in terms of evacuation routes, we actually just hired a emergency operation manager who will be assessing all the evacuation routes throughout the city. So that is something we are planning on assessing here in the near future. But for this current project, we have not done that assessment? No, we have not. OK. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so this was also brought up around um, what will happen to traffic and safety during construction? What's the construction plan? Where will the staging happen? How will we reroute traffic on an already impacted Mission Street and Laurel Street where there's um, kids going riding bikes to school? So um, has that been thought through? If not, what is the plan to think through? I guess that's you again, Mr. Starkey. Hi. Um, yeah, I think this, um, this process that you're mentioning is something that um, comes before the Public Works Department once we're at, um, at the construction phase of the project. Um, and often what that entails is uh, coming to get an encroachment permit from us and we, as part of that, we would review a traffic control plan. And a key component at this intersection would be considering how pedestrians get through the corner there. Um, so it may require um, small detours, perceivably, for pedestrians through that intersection, but it's uh, a plan that we would review and approve uh, with the future contractor um, on the project. Okay, thank you. I think this is, um, I have one last question for right now, and that's um, the FAR calculations that were brought up, and, and I understand what's written in the staff report, but the point was um, brought up by James that um, the parking has been said to be used for residential purposes at certain times when the business is closed. Um, so how does that, if parking is going to be used for residential purposes at, at any time, how does that impact the, the total square footage in the FAR? Is that maybe to you, Mr. Bain, or Mr. Butler? Yeah, I was referencing the, you know, the FAR definition and what's counted in FAR. So um, non-residential parking, which is what this is, is commercial, commercial parking is how it's been identified. Now, if people want to park there, the residents want to park there during off hours, off commercial hours, I don't think that's going to necessarily throw it into requiring to be counted as FAR. So, but it's been be stated that it will be used for residential parking, correct? Hang on just a second. Mr. Butler? Thank you. In um, response to the council member? In response to um, planning commission concerns in the January meeting, the applicant indicated that they could evaluate that. I don't know that there was a uh, specific commitment to that. Um, other than the evaluation, but I think um, that is a question for the applicant because there is no parking required, so we can't um, dictate that it's used for commercial or residential. Um, so it's really up to the applicant as to whether or not they intend to use it. But I guess my question is, if it is used for residential parking, does that play into the FAR calculation? I guess that's the specific question. The applicant has indicated that it's not going to be used as residential parking during the day. You know, if it was used for residential parking in the evening, then arguably you could say that um, that uh, it's it has a dual role as residential and uh, commercial. Um, again, the applicant has been on record saying that it's not, and only that they would look into um, the. Um, residential uses as my recollection again that would be something to ask the applicants though okay thank you those are my questions for now miss bruner let me i'm going to another okay and by the way for those of you who weren't with us earlier in the day our colleague miss bruner has laryngitis and so she's when she does speak she's going to sound like she's whispering so uh, we'll all be very attentive to that and we'll be back with you in a moment uh, mr newsom you are recognized thank you mayor keely um i have just a few comments first i want to or not comments sorry a few questions i uh, first just want to start off with just kind of the basics of the project so the application before us is for a 48 unit project correct correct uh okay and 
<clears throat> breaking down the 48 units, the application is for 33 base units and then 15 density bonus units that the applicant requested, correct? Correct. Uh, and the 15 density bonus units are the additional units uh, that were requested and thus allowed under state law at the time of the application for a 33 base unit project if they request it, correct? Could you say that again? I'm sorry. I didn't quite sure. Understand so your the question. 15 density bonus units, the additional bonus units that they requested, okay. are allowed under state law at the time of the application for a 33 base unit project, correct? Yes. Okay. And just a quick side question this might be for the applicants. How much does it, each unit cost to build? Or do you have just a rough estimate how much each unit costs to build? Um, we've done pro formas, but it's been a long time since we've updated it and re-looked at it. I don't have current pricing on it. Could you have just a rough estimate somewhere in ballpark? Right. Tim's saying 400,000. 400, 400, 400 <laughs> yeah. 500. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, so the application also includes four bicycle storage units, one residential storage unit, a courtyard, three amenity spaces, and a communal office, correct? Correct, yes. And the application also includes on the west side of the project an additional 11 storage units on levels two through five on top of what I just named, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, so just bear with me briefly uh, before I ask my next question. Um, so on page GPO.09, if you turn there, which is about 40 pages into the agenda item and the project plans, Let's let the gentleman find that. Sure. Let me just take a moment. This is more just a setup for some question. What was the page again, GPO09? Uh, GPO.09, right there. Uh, so on this page, the 11 additional storage units that are shown on the west side of the project are identified as storage, while other areas on this page are identified as an amenity. Uh, and there's also a box at the bottom of that page, if you could scroll down just a little bit. I believe, well, there it is. The, so there's a box at the bottom of the page that lists the storage, the square footage of the various aspects of each level. Uh, and in that box, I noticed that the 11 additional storage spaces on levels two through five are calculated separately from the amenity calculation on each level. So on level two, the square footage of the courtyard, the bicycle storage on that level, and something that's just deemed an amenity or calculated as an amenity. But the two additional storage units on that level are calculated as storage. And the same happens for the calculations on levels three, four, and five. Now, if you turn to page AP1.02, Just below, uh, just below, or just past, just below. Yeah, go down. AP. Yeah, it's, it's down past the L. There it is. AP uh, 1.02. Okay. Yes. Uh, so on that page, you can see that the storage units on the west side of the project are marked separately as storage and are shaded brown, while another space is labeled as an amenity and colored purple, and that the bike storage on that page is labeled purple as well which I assume marks that space as an amenity. And the same pattern is repeated on the next three pages where the additional storage units on the west side of the project are labeled and colored differently than the amenities on each level. And on page AP4.01, if you keep going down, the 11 additional storage units on the west side of the project are labeled as storage and are shaded gray. And if you turn the page, uh, and if you turn the page, three spaces on the left of the page are labeled as an amenity and are shaded as, gre as green, if you turn to the next page. So my question is, um, and really this is for the um, applicant, but uh, my question is, what are these 11 additional storage spaces on the left side of this pro on the west side of this project? Are they an amenity or are they additional units? The 
their storage. So are they an amenity or an additional sure. unit? If you would like to call them an amenity, we can call them an amenity. Is there an amenity? Okay. Yes. Uh, same question for staff. Are these additional storage units, are they an amenity or are they additional units? They're not units. That's okay. Sure. They're, okay. They're a store. I mean, you could you can consider storage an amenity. Okay. Not logically. Okay. So you're saying amenity too. Okay. Thank you. That's it for right now. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you. Um, see, I imagine I'm going to have or potentially going to have more questions after we hear from the public, but. Um, I guess right now I wanted to try to clarify a couple of things. One, uh, the we heard from the applicant in response to the um, appellant's contention about uh, ADUs and how that's written into the law, um, that the, the law is written, and, and I read it too, and, and I, so I want some clarification here because I just heard that it, that's just for single family ADUs, but I read it out of the multifamily law. So I'd like to have some clarification, ADU law. I'd like to have some clarification about um, whether this is an existing or constructed project because those are the qualifications for ADU conversion. Is it an existing entitled project just that so there's, it hasn't been built so i don't need an answer to that is it entitled currently right now yes no okay thank you um and my second question and and does are the multifamily adu rules different for um than single yeah, family so. dwelling I mean, adus I there's conversion and new construction adu so i think there's different rules for both so conversion ADUs don't require, that can just be whether or not there's an, I read it as entitled or existing. And I want to get clarification on that. It looks to me as if Mr. Butler would like to provide some input on that. Mr. Thank Butler, you. good evening. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks for that question, Council Member Brown. The um, definition in um, 24, I believe it's 24.16.142, um, if I... I don't have that. I just pasted the, the definition here in front of me, so I'll confirm that's the section. But it says conversion accessory dwelling unit shall mean any accessory dwelling unit created primarily by the conversion of any permitted, entitled, which you were referring to, or legal nonconforming structure or portion of such structure on property developed with multifamily structures, only areas that are not used as livable space, including but not limited to storage rooms, Boiler rooms, passageways, attics, and it goes on, um, shall be eligible to become conversion accessory dwelling units. So, so the, the project before you right now includes the storage spaces as amenities, and those, it, uh, as a matter of transparency, the applicant is, is trying to um, be clear that they do intend to convert those uh, amenity spaces to, to um, ADUs through this definition of conversion accessory dwelling unit, which um, does include entitled. So you would, it, the council, if the project is approved, the uh, storage spaces would be entitled, and then those would qualify as, um, as conversion accessory dwelling units. If the council agrees to entitle them. If the council agrees to entitle the project, then it is entitled. Thank and you. the amenities uh, that are, are noted could be converted. Thank you. Uh, I also am trying to figure out my uh, a way to ask the question related to um, the CEQA concerns, because I am hearing different things about whether or not the contamination on this site warrants cleanup. And uh, it, apparently the applicant self-certified there was no contamination, but it is in GeoTrack. So I'm trying to understand um, where, why it is that this site has, <laughs> that it took calls from the neighbors to get environmental health <laughs> even alerted to the fact that there was work happening. Um, that concerns me for the future. But for right now, the question is, um, why, if it's in GeoTrack as a site, a contaminated site, are we being told it's not? Well, early on, in, during the pre-app, 
environmental health, the county environmental health was notified and they reviewed the project and provided us that it was a closed monitoring site, that it's, it's not. Um, so Even though it's conditionally closed, according to the state. Conditionally closed. Um, it's it's uh, what I I spoke with Heather Han over at the environmental health and went over this with her. Um, so it's it's a closed monitoring site, and all the tanks were removed back in the 70s, I think 74. Um, and so when consulting with her, she indicated that we should add that condition of approval number 77. So that's been added just to cover all of that. But um, yeah, that's it's. Basically, she did not have any concerns, um, and, and it's basically outside of our standard process out of that condition of approval. So prior to any, as part of the building um, permit review process, there's going to be a, a plan that needs to be provided before that, for any uh, soil is, 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 is moved. So. And who will provide that plan? Um, the app, well, the, applic the applicant will have that plan prepared and submitted to the city. And then it'll also be reviewed by the County Environmental Health as well. Okay, so it will, so en Environmental Health will be involved. Yes. All right, um, then the last question I have is related, and this is partly because I, I just viscerally react to um, <laughs> a biotic report saying that um, this riparian corridor has no value for native habitat. I just fundamentally disagree with that. I'm not um, a biotic report uh, producer. <laughs> that is not my area of expertise, but I do have a background in environmental studies. I have a PhD in geography, and I have, <laughs> I have studied uh, wildlife habitat and fragmentation, and so I think I have a fair amount of understanding about this. Um, the concern that, that no survey was done, so Dudek looked at the previous biotic report and said no survey was done, that's a concern, it's not a deal breaker. But then once again, we see a peer review of that biotic report that is not looking at the period of time when one might find some of those nesting birds and raptors in particular. And so I guess I'm, I'm just trying to understand how um, we can say there's n no significant impact if the survey hasn't been conducted during the appropriate time period. You're saying a survey of, of raptors? For the, the wildlife, the survey that it was done for all I'm not a biologist either, wildlife. but I'm relying on the original biotic report, and then also I'm relying on the, peer, the expertise of the peer review, which indicated that the original biotic report was accurate and covered everything accurately. And so, and, I, and my, my recollection is the peer review indicated that the timing of of that review is not essential to that. I'd have to go back and look at the exact wording of how it, I recall reading it just today, um, and so I'd, I'd need to go back and look at that exactly. But I don't think I think they indicated that timing is is not necessary. It seems to me that Mr. Butler again may yeah. wish to comment. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thanks for that question, Councilmember Brown. The, the key issue is um, during the nesting season, and so um, off the top of my head, um, that is mid-March to mid-August, roughly, um, again, just off the top of my head. So um, if construction, tip, the typical process is that if uh, construction is intended to commence during those time frames, then there are uh, nesting raptor surveys that are done and um, the appropriate measures are taken. And so... Uh, to, to make sure that if there is a nest, um, that the nest is not impacted by the construction. So that's a, a typical um, condition that we would see as part of any construction where there are um, uh, trees on the site that might sustain uh, raptor nests. nests. Um, a couple of things, if I could. Uh, the section, the definition section that I quoted before was 24.16.125. Uh, I had um, misquoted it as 24.16.142. Um, and then um, the, uh, oh, I just wanted to point out, you had some questions about the, the coordination. Um, and we do regularly coordinate with um, the county environmental health at the building permit stage when we have items that are on a closed, um, or, or sites that have been on a closed list. So that 
that is a typical part of the, the building permit stage um, when we have a, a site that's either on a list or um, that's been closed to see if there's any additional um, measures that they want to take. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Brown. <laughs> Ms. Watkins is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the uh, questions from my colleagues. I, um, following up on Councilmember Brown's question around the storage spaces being converted into ADUs, um, I haven't seen a project come before us where it's identified to be storage with this entitlement for a proposed ADU prior to it. You know, it seems really unusual to me. I'm wondering if this is common practice or if this is sort of just a way to entitle something to be storage with the intention of making it something else in the long run. That's how it Well, appears. the new, the ADU ordinance, I mean, it's constantly changing and over the last few years, it's been changing quite a bit. Um, so I don't know if I would say it's a common occurrence because it's fairly new. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, this happens a lot with single family homes where people will build a single family home with a garage or detached garage. Um, requires a design permit or something um, with the intention of turning it into an ADU. And so we have that discussion with them. It's in, it's, since it's ministerial, you know, they will usually indicate, oh, well, this is going to be converted to an ADU. And so we leave it up to them whether they want to indicate that or not. But regardless, it's being approved as a non-habitable space that they can convert into an ADU um, at the building permit stage. It just strikes me as odd in that it's a big project. It's not a single family home project where you would see a common occurrence and where you actually anticipate ADUs to be used for that purpose. This seems to me like a large project with 48 units. Um, then having storage identified to later be converted as opposed to identifying what it is, which is eventually to be housing. And I think that seems odd to me. It's increasingly more common, I would say. Um, Felker Street actually added a story with, uh, at 150 Felker, added a story of storage um, that did not make it to the council. Um, and their intent there was to convert to ADUs. Um, the uh, property at the southwest corner of Cayuga and Soquel, um, vacant lot now, was entitled um, with uh, the attic space is now being explored as conversion. Um, to um, ADUs, um, the um, site the uh, site that was referenced before was um, the Pennsylvania Street site, which did become come before the council. Um, that was um, four or five years ago, and um, that uh, garage conversion was not anticipated until after it was in front of the council. Um, but um, another uh, instance of those properties and there are others that are exploring as well um, and um, yeah it it's uh, a tool that the developers see as an opportunity to create more housing mm -hmm. and to help make projects pencil and how would you so um, if it's intended for that purpose you wouldn't encourage them to identify it as that intended purpose as opposed to starting it as storage to be converted as an ADU for a big housing project like that, because That's, they can, because they can is yeah, basically that, what you're it's saying. a good it's a good question. Um, we try to be transparent about it in in our reports, mm -hmm. um, and the applicant is is aiming to be transparent about it as well in terms of you know letting folks know their ultimate intention. Um, it is listed as the storage area as uh, because pursuant to state law you can convert those non habitable um, amenity spaces whether they're as I mentioned in the list, the boiler rooms, the storage rooms, and so forth. And so um, it's listed as um, what it is, um, uh, as the amenity, and then it's going to be uh, converted. So um, we don't have it on there because the council isn't actually approving those. The council is just being asked to approve the storage units, the amenity space that's being proposed. 
Yeah, I, I get, I get it. I just think it's sort of it feels strange to me to say that you're going to make it something eventually, and then you're create, but you're identifying it as something else. You're right. And I don't think it's what people anticipate an ADU looking like in terms of a big project like this. Right. It was something the planning commission struggled with as well in terms of a lot of the conversation about you know how do we how do we show what's actually um, getting entitled, but also daylight that when this project is getting built, if this is what's approved. It's not going to be the storage units. It's going to be ADU. So it, your your um, your feelings are, are uh, hard to reconcile. Acceptable. <laughs> um, and then in terms of the parking questions that were brought up by Councilmember Kalantari Johnson with the evening versus daytime parking, I, I don't know if I fully captured what that means in terms of what that the implications can mean for this project specifically and how it's identified as residential and commercial only at nighttime. I don't understand why that matters. If it's residential and commercial, it, why would it matter only at nighttime? Or how does that impact the pr project? Sure, the applicant has indicated that during the daytime it is gonna be commercial parking. Um, and as commercial parking, it would not count towards the floor area ratio. The definition in our zoning code clearly excludes that. It's a little more of a gray area if it's primarily used as commercial parking, but then overnight it's allowed as residential. Some of the residential uh, units could use it. Um, the FAR definition does say that residential parking is included as part of the FAR. So arguably, um, if it were to be used as residential parking, then it could be included as part of the FAR. Um, it was not included as part of the FAR based on the, app, the applicant's initial statements of this is going to be commercial only. And again, that's something you could ask the applicant about their, their overall intent. Um, they did at the, the planning commission meeting say it was something that they could look into as residential in response to the community feedback. And so that's where the, the question arose about should it count as FAR or not. Okay, and then my last question I guess would be if there's 48 units, or there's, sorry, there's, what's the ultimate, the top number? Now I wrote down your numbers. Right. <laughs> Four, numbers. 48. Right. It was 48. Okay. If that, how many people do you anticipate residing in this space based on those units? And they're, that might be more for the applicant, but they're, they're basically like studio units, so I would expect one to two people one per unit. People. Seems reasonable to say. Okay. And if there's an assumption that people would be, parking in the evening time, then you would assume that a number of the residential people would be having cars. <laughs> I'm assuming if that's outlined as, I mean, I, I, I think I heard it was guests only, but if they're calling it residential parking in the evening, residential means you reside there. So um, I don't know if you want to speak to that. I feel like those specific questions are best for the applicant for them to understand it. If uh, it pleases the council, then I'll leave it up to the mayor if at some point we want to bring it up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor is recognized. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, many of you have asked some of my questions. My my question about fees, I've never heard of somebody um, delaying paying those fees till the building is constructed. Does, is that something that normally happens or has ever happened? I well, for me, this is the first time that I've ever heard okay. of or had that request. So I don't know if anyone else can speak to that. But yeah, that's, it's a first and something we had to research and look into. How much would the anticipated um, impact fees from this project be? It's difficult because it's a an combination of everything from traffic impact fees, park tax fees. Um, there's fees so many favorite. different types of fees that come into play. Like I said, they're usually collected at the building permit issuance stage. Um, but this is the first time that someone's asked as a concession to delay or defer those payments till uh, final occupancy. A uh, couple additional comments. So typically it's hundreds of thousands of dollars for a project of this size. Um, I just did a back of the envelope ask of our transportation engineer. The transportation impact fees are often um, one of the larger, if not the largest. Um, about 150000 was the back of the envelope plus um, additional fees, um, like uh, 
the water fees and um, other public works fees. Um, it's not the first time it's been requested. Um, it's been it's the first time it's been requested as a concession or incentive. Um, and um, there are state laws that give us the um, uh, that actually say um, they should be collected at um, the certificate of occupancy unless the city has a project that is um, uh, that is already in need of those funds and um, we have plenty of projects that are in need of those funds and so we have utilized that exception to require the payment at um, the building permit issuance historically um, as uh, Mr. Bain uh, indicated, we did confer with the city attorney on this, and um, as a result, the um, the ultimate um, determination was that it is saving money. Um, there are exclusions that, that preclude the ability for applicants to request fee waivers, and this isn't a fee waiver, it's just a fee deferral. So they would be paying the fees somewhere between a year and a half or so with modular or maybe two and a half years if they're not doing modular for a project of this size later. And that's the carrying costs of those, which is gonna be less. So it is actually, it, it's a clear cost savings for them if they're paying the hundreds of thousands of dollars later and not paying interest on it. I see, I totally see that. I think I'm just was confused because I'd never heard of it. And I think yep. for people I know that have remodeled single family homes, some of the cost to the architecture and the permits, it's like $100,000 before they break ground. So I was expecting it to be a lot. I just hadn't heard of that before, so I wanted to clarify. Yeah, and that um, is, that's part of the density bonus. So you have to have five or more units um, in order to, as the base project, in order to qualify for request of density bonus. That's the baseline, just FYI. Okay. Um, this is a question that I, and I appreciate, I have to say I also appreciate the neighbors and I appreciate uh, Doug and Jamila meeting with us and kind of going over some of our questions in advance of this meeting. Um, one of my questions that I still don't know the answer to, in the, in the drawings, what is the size of that bed? And <laughs> Please come to the microphone. <laughs> because people are asking, it's not just for me. So it's not on this page, it's on it, the it's, other pages. Yeah, there, um, I know Council Member Golder asked if you could fit king beds in these rooms. It, you could not comfortably fit a king bed and function in the studio. So we anticipate they'd be double beds, a single bed if it's a single occupant. You might be able to do a, a queen bed, but you're going to be really, they're going to be cozy. Oh, and I don't know if Omar's in the room. Uh, this one here. Okay. Omar's it's, modeled queen beds in the rooms right okay. now. Yeah. Thank you. That helps clear it up. So then I'm guessing, okay. Um, th thank <laughs> you. That helps. The other one I was going to ask, if we don't know the cost per unit exactly, I just wonder if the planning department can tell us what an, for a um, mixed, med mixed, mixed media, mixed use project such as this, what is the approximate cost per square foot? in Santa Cruz to build something like that. Do you have any clue from a project that's been, I mean, PAC station south or north or uh, the Anton Pacific, those are pretty almost done. And it, it can vary. Okay, um, obviously. Uh, I don't know if Bonnie Lipscomb is on the line. She might be able to give some of those specific um, statistics for PAC South um, or Pacific Station South or potentially um, Pacific Station North. Um, I don't have those. Um, get back to me too. If you don't know. We could try to get some additional okay. information for you on that, Councilmember Gover. I would caution a bit, however, of drawing comparisons between 100% affordable projects right. and a market rate project like this. Yeah. The timelines are different, the costs sure. tend to be different. Uh, but just strictly on a, on a labor and materials basis, there's yeah. probably some information right. that could be helpful. Window. That's all I was just kind of right. thinking. And then if my other, thank you for that. And then my, another question I have is um, if they're going to be converted to ADUs, why not just initially put them in as ADUs? I think that when we talked about the process, when people felt that people weren't being transparent, I think the developers and workbench felt they were being transparent by telling us they're going to convert them. But for everybody else, then why not just make them ADUs initially? 
And I don't know if what's the advantage. What's the reason? If anyone has an answer. That's a question to workbench. So the way the code is currently written, we can't legally call them the ADUs during entitlement, though we are legally allowed to make them, to turn them into ADUs if they're storage. But why not just make them as units to begin with and not ADUs? Because we had to go back and do redo the FAR calculations or the setbacks. So this was a way to achieve the same building that we were originally working on entitling, just a different code path. And then the other question is, are the ADUs bigger than the, than the, than the other units? The ADUs are, drawn, are intended to be one bedrooms. The ADUs don't have to follow the SRO code that the rest of the building has to follow. Okay. I think that's all my questions right now. Thank you. Council Member Brunner. All my questions were asked. Okay. Very good. Thank you. This would be the opportunity for members of the public to make comments uh, for a period of time not to exceed one minute and 30 seconds each. Uh, in the event, and I suspect we will, we will have people online, we'll simply toggle back and forth. We'll take a person who's here, then someone online, then a person who's here, and so on. Good evening and welcome to the City Council meeting. Yes, sir. Originally, somebody in front of me in line, so I want to make certain that they were still here. Very My name is you. Good evening. My name is Brian Pearson. I own a home at the home at the corner of Cleveland and Laurel. I own. I raised three children in that house. We are already a food bin employee and customer parking lot on Laurel and Cleveland. My meta message for my comments here is: Will the city council? hold the Planning Commission and developers and architects accountable to our own rules. Like that. Every, and I, I'm gonna, I'll back up for a second. The City Council has been misled by the Planning Commission willfully or incompetently over and over and over again. The community had to redo the math. The community had to tell the City Council how the Planning Commission was misrepresenting and, and not working for the community. Workbench has over and over and over again proven itself as almost a bad actor. The idea that they ask forgiveness instead of permission, over and over and over. These changes are like honest mistake, honest mistake. Even right now during this council, and it's, it's, I have a couple comments, but Councilman Newsom, when you said, are these thing, are these storage units ADUs or entitlements? He said, yes, they're amenities. He omitted that they were going to be ADUs. City okay. Council. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. hold us Thank you. accountable and transparent. Thank you. And do we have someone online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the first person online. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Good evening. Council, uh, Bradley Snyder. So uh, 15 years ago, uh, Mission Street for, went from having uh, only uh, two-story uh, two buildings to three stories. Uh, that was the 1804 apartment complex, uh, 1804 Mission. And then uh, Hampton Inn, I believe, is also three stories. But now you're talking about going from three to five. And you're also talking about uh, using AD, uh, let's see, ADU, uh, units kind of disingenuously as, um, uh, you know, potential future units. And then um, uh, I just, yeah, I just, you know, I, I basically, uh, I've seen so much development and I've complained so much in front of this body. And, you know, and to some extent, what I see is uh, the developers coming from out of the county, uh, places like Monterey, uh, and, uh, you know, in the peninsula and it's, you know, none of it is, none of the money is coming back to Santa Cruz. And I really don't see how approving this is going to benefit Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County, or, uh, even the students, the people who live there. I mean, these units are so tiny. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Just a little, little notice for everybody. A minute and a half is going to race by when you get up there. So Calculate your, your time well. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Um, I'm Kurt Hurley, and it was a 
my past privilege to present several times to this body, both on green building awards and on the city's natural gas infrastructure prohibition, which I also administered. I worked both as an architectural plans examiner and field inspector to raise the standards of our community's building professionals and engineers. I am concerned that the energy and green features required by state law and adopted by this council as local building code <clears throat> may not be incorporated in the permitted construction drawings or verified in the field. Why is this the case? Several local building professionals with whom I've consulted recently have noted that since my departure from the city two years ago, these requirements receive very low or no oversight, including commentary when applying for a permit or when completing that work in the field. Those features include increased dwelling unit ventilation and intake air filtration, battery energy storage systems, rooftop solar, and increased EV charging infrastructure. These features improve health outcomes for building occupants and reduce the climate impacts of building occupancy. I encourage you and the city manager to work closely with staff and the city's third party engineering resources so that this project and the many other projects in our city's development pipeline meet these requirements, including the recently adopted single margin energy reach code. Thank you. Thank you. Another person online, Ms. Bush? We'll take that person online. Good evening. Welcome to the city council meeting. Hey, guys. Uh, I'd just like to say that if you are for housing, vote yes and say you are for this project. Don't blame the state or developers or, you know, they're going to build ADUs. What a big deal. Uh, like, be for housing. That's, that's what I'm asking. And if you are not for this project, vote against it. Be accountable for your vote. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Hi, thank you. I'm Nicole De La Santina, Santa Cruz High School and Cabrillo alumni and Santa Cruz homeowner. It is possible. Santa Cruz is not alone in experiencing frustration over the erosion of local control of housing. There is no such thing as one size all one size fits all legislation. In Santa Cruz, affordable housing for working people will not be addressed until UCSC provides adequate housing for many of the over 9,000 students who currently rent homes and apartments in town. The only high-rise housing complex that should be built in Santa Cruz should be on the UCSC campus. Many of the houses on the west side neighborhood I grew up in and around are no longer owner-occupied. They're now rented to six, seven, or eight college students for, the many, thousand, for many thousands of dollars a month. Most working families simply can't compete. It's not the fault of UCSC students. UCSC creates a housing shortage and sets a high marginal rate the community must compete with. Despite being aware of these issues, for some reason, all of you except council members Watkins and Brown voted last month to lease one of the few remaining West Side parcels to one of the county's largest landowners, UCSC, to build housing for hundreds of st students in our neighborhood rather than provide live live work, live work housing for those servicing our community. I was also disappointed that many city council members expressed a defeatist attitude that there isn't anything we can do regarding the erosion of local control by Sacramento. Thanks. Thank you. Another person online, Ms. Bush. We'll take that person. Good evening. Welcome to the city council meeting. Three, two, one. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome, my name is Kenny Imes, I'm a resident. Um, from, for some expert analysis of laws eroding local control, I'm going to read excerpts from a recent article by the economist and retired UC Berkeley professor Michael Barnes. Quote, thanks to the intervention of State Senator Scott Weiner, RENA has been twisted into a profit-making tool for corporate developers. The Bay Area Council is not interested in making RENA calculations more scientific and accurate. The council seeks, um, is, their task is to see that its corporate members make more money. The six cycle RENA goals um, also calls for 2.5 million housing units to be constructed in eight years, more than 300,000 units annually. California now produces slightly more than 100,000 units annually. It is not possible to quickly triple production and hold it at that level for eight years. This fiasco will come to an ugly conclusion when HCD's six cycle targets are met almost nowhere in the state. Senate Bill 423 will be just the first of many bills that will seek to undermine the integrity of the Coastal Act and destroy 
its abil ability to preserve the coastal zone. The Coastal Act has preserved the California coast for the common benefit of all of our state's residents. Unfettered coastal development will destroy the natural beauty of California's coast. The six cycle arena is a fraud. Regardless of how the problem was caused, the goal should be to prevent the damage that will spring from it." End quote. I conclude high-rise housing complexes should be built on the UC campus. We should join other municipalities pushing back against Sacramento. As leaders of this community, I implore you to summon the courage to reject out-of-scale projects in our neighborhoods and preserve the Coastal Act. Thank you. Thank you. Another person online, Ms. Bush. We'll take the person online. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Uh, yes, this is Garrett. Uh, briefly, uh, our IHNA goals are garbage, and they use double counting of uh, needed development, uh, as well as leftist garbage justifications. But anyway, I was more impressed with the arguments of the opponents of this project. They seem to offer reasonable alternatives and serious legal objections. Every legal objection needs to be resolved by your legal counsel or planning, citing the exact code to its legitimacy point by point, offering a chance of rebuttal. Maybe I missed and snoozed that uh, point by point rebuttal. The developers mostly seem to offer a threat of no deal is likely without absolute approval, offering no concessions. I don't know about you, but I never like to be threatened but persuaded by logic. The earth is gonna turn whether this project happens or not. A lot of people oppose this. Me, I don't care that much since I don't live that near there, but I'm guessing a lot more congestion, big project on Mission Laurel, even if mostly not by cars, will have a somewhat negative effect and better be 100% allowed code with this much opposition. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Hi. Elizabeth Mondernese. I live up on King Street near Laurel. And um, what I haven't heard mentioned at all, anybody who has young, uh, young adults or middle-aged adults is deliveries. Um, when my kids moved back home during COVID, when they lost their jobs, I was amazed at how many packages were delivered every day. I work remotely, and I have a big window, and I see car, um, all the delivery trucks stopping many, many times a day. We would sometimes get five, six, seven packages a day. You've got 100 people, and I don't believe it'll be one person to, I know there'll be two, because at the price that most of these um, units are going to cost, it's going to take two people to pay the rent for them. So that's a lot of packages being delivered. And the food bin, one of the reasons I think they got so much um, uh, people saying, yes, we want this, there are a lot of UCSC students go there, and they do want housing, and they deserve housing. It should be, as the other people have just said, up at the university, where actually their dormitories are very small. It should be high rise like Berkeley. But what I'm saying is the traffic, it's a very narrow street. I drive it every day. We walk it a lot. We walk Cleveland. They are so impacted. It cost me $2,000 to, well, it would have cost me to extend my parking because most of these houses are small, one um, driveway park, one car parking. And I would like, oh, that's it. I can't see more. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next person online. Person online, welcome. <laughs> Hi, Kevin Hewer. As a tenant in a workbench home myself, I love how thoughtfully these homes are designed and built. I love that their actions as a company show their commitment to this community's housing security. I love my diverse group of new neighbors who contribute to this place from really across the income spectrum. And I couldn't be happier to see more units like this offered by this upstanding company. So um, I urge you to deny this appeal and greenlight this project. I think when we talk about parking, let's remember that we've parked plans for smart mixed use infill housing like this for really far too long. Um, the height, let's talk about the actions that have been taken to complicate and question this project. I think the barriers that people are erecting to projects like this are way too high and totally out of step for this community. And it throws shade on those just looking for the housing break that they need to get ahead. When we deny projects like this, we alter the character of our town. It keeps teachers, caretakers, students, nonprofit workers like me farther from their dream of a modest, stable place to live near their workplace or their school. And when we don't build projects like this, we miss chances for environmental gains, reverting to more single rider car trips, your bus being stuck even further back in traffic, and living in complexes much less dense and much less green. So, 
I hope you do consider the new light that this will bring to our arena bottom line and the enhanced safety it'll bring to the dreams of mobility for so many strivers and providers. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Hi, my name is Ava Bruner. I live um, not far away in Santa Cruz. A um, couple of things. I wasn't going to speak, so I'm a little discombobulated. But I want to just remind people that the, as far as I know, the area medium income is about $132,000. So if you think about um, an apartment or a studio, 280 square feet, that's going to cost you, I don't know, a few thousand dollars. Um, what, what student or cafe worker, or even maybe teacher, or person who works at a nonprofit can truly afford that. And how long are they gonna live in a 280 square foot space when they decide they want a family and such? And then the other point is, I, can, a, can a landlord honestly discriminate against somebody who has a car to rent to them? They could say, we don't have parking space for you, and so if you have a car, you have to find somewhere else to park, which of course will be the neighborhoods. So I don't, I don't see how that would be legal to just say you can't live here if you have a car. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bush, someone else online? We'll take that next person. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Person online, good evening. Three, two, one. Welcome. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Gavin Roth, student at Mission Hill. Um, just wanted to kind of talk about some points broken up, uh, brought up in the appeals. First of all, as um, Matt mentioned, yes, in sometime between June and September, Metro will increase service on the 18 route and 19 route, especially during later hours, which aren't at rush hour, but still important times to be going places, and on the weekends, which many people do work on. Um, and then some people are talking about uh, dust and noise, and that is like, and then they're saying, well, we should have a smaller building, but it's still going to create a close to equivalent uh, amount of dust and noise, and um, the final thing, or two more things, where I just wanted to point out that the appellants were not at the planning commission meeting. I know it's hard to make these meetings, but um, I think it would have been important to hear their voice there. And finally, um, as some people have been muttering about, it is possible to live without a car. So um, we should build for that, we should account for that, and... Um, please deny this appeal. Thank you. Another person online, Ms. Bush. We'll take that next person online. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Person online, good, good evening. evening. Good evening. Uh, Director Lee Butler said in his introductory remarks, more building is equal to more affordability. Nonsense. Affordable for whom? Seventy to hundred thousand dollar income doesn't represent a service worker, let alone a family. Certainly not a current high school grad. Even do these coffin box SROs, they are, will be outrageously priced, let alone if you are in the low income or very low income category. Mr. Butler, inter, uh, justification of oversized overpriced developments shows his hand and true in intentions. His department is willing to bend the rules or even overlook them to maximize the height and density of this or, or any development. Can a planning department truly be trusted to balance residents' and neighbors' interests along with developers' interests? I say clearly not. It's time for a new planning director that can follow the rules and account for everyone's interests and assure the underlings do the same. The food bin development should be fully reviewed by objective planners. Until such time, we will not get a fait complete projects like the food bin, or even worse, from the planning department. I thank you for your serious consideration tonight. <clears throat> thank you. Good evening. Welcome. 
All right, all right. Hello, City Council. I uh, wanted to ask if it's okay if I ask two questions directly to council members. No. No? Okay. Yeah, well, that's democracy for you, right? There you go. There it is. <laughs> all right, y'all. So my name is Hector Marin. I'm a paraeducator for Harbor High School, and I work with special needs youth. And in Harbor High, there's a lot of predominantly Latino and also black folks within that community, right? And the one thing that I want to highlight and emphasize is the, is the involvement of Latino and people of color within these development projects. I um, wanted to ask that because I wanted to ask the council members to see if they've done such outreach. But, you know... I mean, I don't even need to ask those questions because I know the answer. I know the answer is no. And I'm very disappointed in the council members, specifically in District 4, um, who represents downtown, who represents the West, West Side, who represents the beach flats, and not doing that and not taking the initiative to do that. These development projects really affect our neighborhoods. They not only affect our neighborhoods, but they also affect the affordability of people of color and also working class people. When we hear the word gentrification, I know that kind of like creates a, um, a meaning that it only affects Latinos and people of color being displaced, but it also, it also um, implies gentrification and the displacement of poor white folks and also working class and middle class folks as well. So please consider this. I urge you to accept this appeal. We need to ensure that we invite everybody to the conversation. And not only that, we also must ensure that there's accountability and transparency behind the way that y'all represent us. Y'all repre y'all answer to the will of the people. It's not the other way around. Thank you, Mr. Marion. Next person online, good evening. Welcome to the city council meeting. Good evening. Good evening. I would suggest everyone in the audience go to OurNeighborhoodVoices.com, OurNeighborhoodVoices.com, where you will hear how locally elected state representatives and the entire state legislature voted to eliminate local control, eliminate public hearings, and eliminate parking requirements. And that's even our locally elected state representatives. These same laws, however, put cities at legal risk if they do not approve these projects which puts the city at risk for costly legal fees that the city is then on the hook for, which then takes away from the general fund. The cities are in a real dilemma because the residents have not focused on their locally elected state reps. Focus on your state reps, not the city council. And for those that want housing at UCSC, UCSC has been trying to build thousands of units for four to five years, but has been stuck with sequel litigation because people you probably know have been trying to stop it. So allow UCSC to build the housing so it puts less pressure on the city and the neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and council members. My name is Lola Caroga. I'm a member of the UCSC Student Housing Coalition, and I wholeheartedly support this project and urge you to deny the appeal. After moving five times in the last three years of living here, I finally settled out of place on Mission and Walnut, and um, just a few blocks from this project, and I currently live car-free there, um, just like many other students who already live car-free in this neighborhood. As someone who lives on mission, I know it's possible to walk, bike, and take transit to and from UCSC, downtown, other parts of the county every single day. I bike on Walnut, Bay, King, and Escalona every day, which are great alternative routes to mission, but um, they're being improved with the repaving project, um, 2024 Public Works repaving project, and building dense housing on crucial transportation corridors gives Metro and our city the ammunition they need to fund more active transportation projects on this corridor because more density equals more demand. And yeah, <laughs> uh, I wish my biggest problems were my garden getting shade on it, but, my stu but students at UCSC are too busy worrying if they'll be homeless or not this next school year. Our housing crisis is far too urgent for us to cre continue to deny and delay projects like these that we desperately need. Please deny the appeal and support the project as is. Thank you. Thank you. Next person online, good evening. Welcome to the city council meeting. There's nobody with their hand raised. No with their hand up. Next person in line, good evening. Welcome. Hello all, my name is Alex Santiago and I'm a first year at UC Santa Cruz and also a student with the UCSC Student Housing Coalition and I'm here today to ask you, like my, many of my well-meaning neighbors here, to consider the environmental implications of this project. 
In the city of Santa Cruz, transport accounts for roughly 69% of emissions, and many people who work here commute here. Not short commutes, long commutes, because as it stands, Sa Santa Cruz cannot sustain the people who sustain it. The truth of this project is that this land has already been developed, and this, the best thing that we can do for the environment is in fact build housing so the people who, who run Santa Cruz and who keep this city running can actually afford to live in it. Transit is environmentally friendly, and by building this housing, you would be empowering transit users and helping transform Santa Cruz into a multimodal and transit-friendly city. Personally, I can think of nothing better than an interconnected and equitable city and support this project and reject the appeal. More so, as for those who grew up with housing instability, such as myself, uh, there is no greater detriment to my mental health than the prospect of not being able to find place to live not black paint, unfortunately. And so I agree with the dissenters of this project that the infrastructure in Santa Cruz, unfortunately, is inadequate in terms of transit. Um, we need to improve this. And so I, I would suggest that those dissenters of affordable housing and more housing in Santa Cruz would rather stand, stand up and support public transit in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, welcome. Hello, Council. My name is Nicolas Robles, a youth activist who is part of the UCSC Student Housing Coalition. Today, I'd like to address some of the concerns I've heard. First, I believe 56 people compared to an average four-family household would mean 52 more income streams circulating around Santa Cruz. Putting these people on top of a local shop would mean 52 more people going in and out and spending a lot more money locally than a family would in a week. Instead of thinking about how much money each room costs to build, think about how much money 56, let me say that again, 56 people actively contribute to Santa Cruz. Not to mention the equitable nature of this housing. I know if I had a store right at my house, I'd be buying M&Ms and Cliff Bars on the, my way to school almost every day. Um, not to mention that in 2023, 40,990 people were killed in car accidents in the US Needless to say, Santa Cruz is, although transitioning away from this, car-centric, and we should be supporting projects such as this, which encourage less cars on the road and more people in transit. Lastly, many have said that council isn't listening to the community, but at the previous planning committee meeting, the appellants who were expected to present their findings about the issues of the development of the building did not show up. As an active constituent in Santa Cruz who is for housing, I am standing up for it. Thank you, Council, and I urge you to deny the appeal. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Hello, Council members. Uh, my name is Theo Kell. I am graduated from UC Santa Cruz a few years ago, and I live here in the city. Um, when I was a student, I didn't have the opportunity to live in an apartment, which would have made sense for me. I didn't have a car, and I didn't need that much space. But when looking for places to live, instead I could only find rooms in divided single-family homes with other groups of students. I knew people who were crammed ten or more into one house with people sleeping on the floor of the living room. And because these homes are taken up by students, they're not available for families. This project creates the type of housing that's in short supply here. It's in a perfect location near transit, groceries, and other conveniences that people need. And as Mr. Starkey mentioned, in less than a month, on June 20th, both, both Route 18 and Route 19 will be operating on 15-minute frequencies each both ways. Our public transit is finally expanding to meet the demand that we have here, and it's the perfect time to build housing that's appropriate for transit users. I have the same concerns that some people have voiced here about the health and safety impacts on pedestrians and bicyclists in the area, but instead of using those concerns to block and delay the construction of housing, I hope we can use this as an opportunity to demand safety improvements on Mission Street instead to meet everybody's needs. The proposal is sorted out now, and I hope you can move it forward without further delay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. My name is Janine Roth. I live in Santa Cruz, and I'm a lead with Santa Cruz Yimby. Years ago, uh, Sonia Trous, who's a co-founder of YIMBY, saw that public hearings for housing were well attended by mostly homeowners and people who said, no, not like that, not here, not in my neighborhood, not in my backyard. Sonia wanted to represent the people who would be living in those homes. And so she started showing up to say yes, yes to more homes for people. 
At public hearings, including today, we still hear, no, not like that, not in my neighborhood, not in my backyard, although we also hear, but I'm for housing. So I'm here as Sonia was for the people who could live in those homes, the 50 plus people, to say yes to more homes, deny the appeal, and let's move the project forward. The project was approved in January. The appeal added um, months of delay and significant costs, as we saw, to a project that meets local and state requirements. It brings much needed homes to our community, and we agree with Director Butler that more housing does help with the affordability crisis. By the way, I'm not aware of any multifamily homes on the west side that helped us with our fifth cycle arena. Santa Cruz EMB launched a petition last week in support and got over 100 signatures. And I'd like to amplify just one comment. I'm going to give you five seconds. Okay. David says, as a neighbor, I'm two blocks away. I strongly support this project. Densifying along Your five the five seconds. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Next person in line. Good evening. Welcome. Hey, thank you, Council. Uh, my name is Ryan Meckel. I'm a renter in Santa Cruz. I'm also the Santa Cruz EMB. I'd like to continue Janine's comments and offer some comments from other folks who weren't able to make it tonight. Chelsea says, please act with the urgency our housing affordability crisis demands. Delays on critical projects like these contribute to higher housing project costs and sets us back in an uphill climb to fill the massive lack of housing our community needs. It's so rare that a property owner would offer up their land in such a community-minded way, and we should be supporting them. Jessica says, I live a few blocks away from the food bin, and I walk there every week or so to get groceries. We need to add more housing in Santa Cruz, especially apartments. Apartments are more eco-friendly because they house more people on less land. By building apartments in our developed areas, like along Mission Street, we can increase our housing supply while preserving our parks and green spaces. Brett says, this is one of the best opportunities we have this year to add affordable, walkable, bikeable housing right on our transit corridor. We are in a crisis, and this project is one important part of the solution. Bill says, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with this housing project. Times are changing, and so must we. I'd like to end by sharing a personal story from Megan Kay. I've lived at two shared homes on Mission Street. I lived with eight other adults in a single family home. I rented a kitchen to sleep in and a rodent infested property a stone's throw from the food bin. People like me who were working full time and living in Santa Cruz deserve proper housing. And there are many more in our community that say yes to housing. Folks that live here now used to live here but got priced out and people who may have never tried to live here because of how deeply unaffordable our city is. Deny this appeal and move this project forward. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take the next person online, then we'll be right with you. Person online, good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Yes, I'm Donna Haraway, and I live on Cleveland between Laurel and Rigg, and I support this project wholeheartedly. I love the design. I have an elder sister-in-law who would love to apply to live there. I love the bike-centric aspect of it. And I'm really speaking just to emphasize that many people who live in the neighborhood, also part of the community, support this project, even though, generally speaking, the folks live along Laurel have been most vocal. There are lots of people living in the immediate vicinity who think this is a fantastic project and the, the appeal should be denied. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Hello, my name is Mason. I'm currently a student at UC Santa Cruz, and I'm a member of the Student Housing Coalition. I would like you guys to um, you know, build the project and to approve it. I think it would be very beneficial as you know, our community. We need more housing, and I know this because also um, my parents went to UC Santa Cruz, and I just ended up coming here, right? And the bread and butter issues have always been housing and transportation, right? But somehow, in the like 30 years since they've went here, it's gotten worse. It hasn't gotten better, only worse. And yes, I do think UC Santa Cruz is a part of that. But another part of that is also the community and saying, we're not going to build more. We're not going to build more housing. And not just for students, but also for people who are working there. There are plenty of students and people who are just working. You know, They are commuting from Capitola, San Jose, just to get here. And why? Because it's not affordable and there isn't enough housing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No. Not with their hand raised. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council. My name is Craig Schindler. <clears throat> we uh, had our house burned down in Bonnie Dune. Moved to this neighborhood on Laurel Street about a year and a half ago. 
A wonderful neighborhood, incredibly informed citizens. I do not know anyone who's against housing at the food bin. We love Doug and Deb. Our first point is it's an overreach. It's too big for the size of the lot. It has environmental implications that have not been dealt with. Second thing is the process has been terrible. Those first hundred people who were involved in that meeting were never given a chance to ask a question. There was no outreach to the community. We asked for a meeting at least 10 times to deal with workbench, nothing. They shut us down. They have a state mandate for 48 units. That's what's been approved. Workbench continually has shown us that they try to, there's a kind of history of disregard of slipping things in. The ADUs represent an effort to slip things in. Approve the four-story building with the setbacks, with an environmental report. We have two nesting hawks in our backyard, three doors down. And it's a win-win for everyone. And by the way, the appeal did not set back the development of housing. It actually allowed Workbench to create a proposal that is now up to state and local code, which the original proposal approved by the Planning Commission was not. Thank you so much. Really, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? Yes, we'll take that person who's online. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Person online, good evening. Uh, hi. Hi. My name is Dizzy Finley. I'm a student at UCSC, um, and I encourage the council to deny the appeal for the project. So that's well, all. thank you. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the City Council meeting. Hi, my name's Anita Joseph. I am a renter in Santa Cruz. Um, and I just want to clarify uh, one statement that was made earlier, something about out-of-town developers come in and they think they can do what they want. Tell you what, would you just move that microphone sure, a little closer? Sure, sorry Thank about you. that. Is that better? That's way better. Okay. So, um, should I start over? Or? No, no, you could hear me. Okay. Um, but I want to clarify one point in particular, especially some someone said something about out-of-town developers. The developers live here. They're raising their family here. Um, this is their home. They want Santa Cruz to be the community that people can live in and work in, not drive everywhere, and, uh, and also accommodate students. So um, it is a wonderful project. Please deny the appeals. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush, at this point? Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Greg. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, and if you've ever worn a Bell or Giro bike helmet, you've probably worn something I designed or was part of. Anyway, so I've been an avid cyclist um, my whole life, and um, one thing that I love about Mission Street is that King Street exists, and you can go from the beginning of Mission and get all the way to uh, Highway 1, where it becomes safe again, um, by taking King Street. Now, nobody, I'm up here because um, nobody has brought up the fact that people speed on Mission Street, and you might as well just call it Highway 1, because that's what it is, really. Um, imagine... Uh, Two high school kids who have done their homework and they're out driving and they might, you know, decide to have a race. Well, very, very, very regularly and frequently because I know Mission and while I won't live in the shadow of the building, I'm, I'm, I'm on Van Ness a little ways up, but people speed on that street and there, there are people running, running the, uh, uh, the light, the, the yellow light at, at uh, Mission and Laurel going 50 miles an hour plus. And this happens all the time. So, um speed of the traffic on mission the the uh, i mean it just takes one mistake for anyway that's that's really all i have it's it's just uh, just to be aware that people drive really fast on that street thank you sir anyone else online no. mr chargal good evening welcome to the council meeting hi good evening uh thank you uh mayor and council members uh my name is bodie chargal i'm a member of the City of Santa Cruz's Climate Action Task Force. I'm the president of the UCSC Student Housing Coalition, and I've lived in Santa Cruz County for all 20 years that I've been alive. Um, the point here is that we need housing, right? 
these 59 units of housing um, should move forward uh, neighborhood concerns aside. Now, neighborhood concerns taken into consideration, um, and with special appreciation for those who have been um, really thoughtful and kind in this process, um, I've had the chance to talk with a couple of them, and I really appreciate that. Um, I, I appreciate the efforts that, that council members as well have put into meeting with neighbors, and, and if there's anything that can be done further to uh, appease these concerns, um, let's do it. But let's not further delay this, this housing. We, we need this housing. 9% of UCSC students are unhoused. Uh, we have a clear lack in the total of units, um, total units of housing in, in Santa Cruz, and the, simply the rent is too damn high. Um, nobody said that solving our housing crisis would be easy, but we have no choice other than to um, maintain our efforts to end the housing crisis and to do the work. So let's deny this appeal. Uh, let's get this housing built. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shargal. Anyone online? Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Don Radcliffe, and I live on Cleveland, just around the corner from Laurel. So I'm out of the shade zone of this project, but I certainly will be affected by parking. And while the developers say they won't rent to anyone with cars, they probably can't do that. And while they say they uh, will keep people out of the parking, parking in front of my house by denying them permits, the permits are only during the week and not on weekends and holidays, and they're not at night. So what happens when you come home from work? You're going to fight for a parking place in front of your house. Now, the city council is really the only ones that can do anything about this. And I thought there was ongoing discussions about limiting parking, having a different kind of parking, 24-7 permits, whatever, but I haven't heard anything tonight about that. And I'm hoping that you will do something about that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush? Good evening, sir. Welcome. Hello. My name is Craig Seamer. I live on the 100 block of Otis Street. Um, I'm in opposition to the project, not in general, just the size and the scope. It's, it's just too much for that site. Um, I'm worried about the environmental impact, particularly Laurel Creek. I know that a lot of animals do use that. Um, I lost a bobcat to, uh, I mean, lost a chicken to a bobcat, you know, a block and a half from it, and that's how, it, that's probably how it gets, got into the area. I support more affordable housing, but the needs need to be balanced with taking care of the community and the neighborhood. I, I totally understand the housing prices are too much. I have two younger daughters. They're struggling to be able to stay here themselves, but they wouldn't want to see this type of development. I'm hoping we can, you all can find a way to fix that problem without destroying our environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good evening, welcome. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Bruce Thomas. I live on Dufour Street on the west side. And I want to echo the previous second in front of me gentleman's comment that I, there, it would be really good if the city had a little bit more of an engagement on how transportation issues, can, parking issues can be resolved, possibly changing to resident-only parking and stuff. Some transparency and some um, abilities, maybe a website where people can learn their options would be really helpful. I'm impacted by that on Dufour Street. But um, I'm really here to talk about a public health and safety issue that I've um, sent you all an email about. And I have, um, it's something that's continually happening in the city, and I want to raise it as a concern. I just keep speaking to the microphone. So what's happening in the plans here, we saw it on one of the slides. Condition 69 is calling for loading trucks to park on, big delivery trucks to park on Mission Street and use it as a loading zone. This is inherently dangerous. And the city really needs to try to take public safety seriously in this regards. This was taken after the planning commission meeting. I raised it. And then the very next night, I walk in down my neighborhood, and I see this happening at 1901 Mission Street. This is a delivery truck sitting in the suicide lane in the middle of Mission Street with cars going back and forth. I've sent you all a movie of it. And the guy's doing it on a regular basis because there's no, val there's no sizable loading zone was allocated for this project. So I'm worried about the food bin project having a similar story and the city continually making the same mistake. Let's get wise to this. 
um, let's definitely treat it in this project. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We're going to take the next person online. We'll be right with you. Person online, good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Robinson. I'm a UCSC student, and I like and I really support this project. Um, there's a lot we could talk about it, but uh, sorry, there's a lot I could talk uh, about it. Um, but um, I'd like to just point out one or two things. One is I've heard a lot of people talk about how these you know three thousand dollars studios, which is what a lot of the ones in Santa Cruz are going for right now, are luxury apartments that we don't need. You know, we need things cheaper. And while I very much agree with that, I just wanted to point out that. You know, a studio apartment is like the Honda Civic of apartments. You literally cannot make a cheaper version. It's, you know, just a few hundred square feet. If these are going for a few thousand dollars, that's because we, there's just not enough supply of apartments in this town. And I know people will call out, uh, like, investors, people buying up, and I'm sure that represents a small value. But I also know just a lot of students who are paying, you know, two grand to rent out one half of one bedroom apartment because they cannot find anything else. I'm currently trying to find housing. And I can't find find anything right now. Um, secondly is um, I've heard many people um, say that new apartment. Good evening. Welcome. Hi, evening. my name is Pamela San Miguel. Um, I wrote the letter about the creek. You guys have it three times in your agenda packet, and you've all received it. Thank you for your response, Ms. Golder. I appreciate it. Um, I'm the one that this man said that the creek was dead. Um, I want to speak about Veronica's concerns about pedestrian safety. On May 7th, when PG&E came because the lights went out there, they blocked off the sidewalk on Mission Street. Um, I was forced into the street, into Mission Street. There was no signage. There was nothing except for the, all the sawhorses and the hazard, the... the orange sawhorse things and the tape. Um, I, when I got onto the food bin property, I tried to talk to PG&E about my concerns, and I asked them what they expected. There was no signage, what they expected people to do. He said he expected people to cross two blocks down at the Walnut Street light. Um, I don't know how people were supposed to even know that, let alone someone like Veronica, you know? Um, I was trying to talk to the PG&E. This man came and interrupted me. He told me it was none of my business. He told me to get along. Um, I was trying to get about my shopping. Our altercation escalated to the point where he attacked me personally, ran after me as I left the store, yelled at me across the parking lot not to ever come back to shop there. I've been shopping at the food bin for 20 years, much longer than this man has owned this place. I don't know how he's treated. He's making friends quickly. And I just want to point out the safety for pedestrians. Right now, already, he has absolutely no regard for it, none. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello, council members. <clears throat> uh, without advocating for or against this project, uh, on the April 30th staff report, it stated that ADUs are exempt from impact fees. If there's an opportunity, perhaps a council member at the end of public comment can get clarification. Are these storage spaces completely exempt from impact fees? Uh, would they be paid later at conversion to ADU? Um, and is there a back of the envelope estimate of what the difference would be in terms of those impact fees paid to the city? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone online? Mm, no. <laughs> no. No. Next person. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, good evening. I've met many, many of you and want to thank you guys for your time. You guys are awesome, and I don't know how you do this on your part-time, part-time job with, like, hundreds of hours you put into this. Um, I am a renter on Laurel Street. I have no stake as a homeowner in that area. I am pro-housing. I cannot afford to live here. The way the developer has gone about this has been a disgrace. Two-inch setbacks from the neighbor. How did they think people were going to respond? Um, I think this could have been done much better. Um, also, uh, I don't think people are hearing. The neighbors are saying they would accept 50 units. 50, 50, 50. That does not sound like NIMBYism to me at all. The end. Thank you. Let me, let me just make sure the gentleman understands what I'm doing here. Let me just make sure. I wasn't trying to be flippant. You're, the, each appellant will have five minutes when the public comment is finished, OK? That's fine. Thank you. OK. Next person. Do we already do this? 
I love James. He's my partner, but boy, he does like to talk, huh? Good Take evening. the stage. Good Just evening. kidding. Um, Rachel Morricone, a renter on Laurel Street and longtime renter in Santa Cruz County. Um, the one thing I, I think Sharon just summarized it. Um, we, I, I think the Yembe group here doesn't understand. You will hardly ever get any development in any city in America where the next door neighbors are saying, yes, put it there, but please be respectful. Don't put these two inch or five feet setbacks. We have setbacks for a reason. And this is clear in state code, city code, why setbacks exist. And they're important. They're important for safety, access, maintaining your property. I have no idea how they're going to wash windows or do anything without being all over Doug Martin's property. I mean, the two-inch setback is really our biggest concern. It is just a complete slap in the face to just being a responsible neighbor. So that's... Um, the main thing, and then some people are calling us out for not showing up to the planning commission meeting. I'm sorry, we were all there till midnight or whatever time it was back in January. Several of us came to the city council meeting, as you know. Um, dozens of people were standing outside at 7.30 p.m. a month ago. People are exhausted by the process. We knew that that wasn't the place where we needed to share our points. The planning commissioners were well-versed, and they all called it a shell game. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Anyone else who has not testified, wishes to testify? Thank you very much. This would be the opportunity for the first of the two. Mayor, I'm sorry. Me. Yes, there is, there is someone, someone online. online. Yeah. We'll take that person. Good evening. Welcome. Hey, good evening, uh, Council. My name is Bennett Williamson, calling in here. Really want to echo uh, what Janine said. Um, that this project is really for the people who don't live here yet, but there's no way for them to be here and represent themselves. And so as I was listening, I said, it can be hard to speak up in favor of housing um, and to understand that this is part of making Santa Cruz the diverse and affordable place that we all say is within our values, is creating more housing at all levels. Um, and that is just going to allow students to live here. It's gonna allow working people to live here. These are all the shared values of our community and housing uh, is an important piece of that. So um, I think the, those people uh, that need housing desperately are also exhausted with process and process has been the thing that's delayed housing in our state and process has been the thing that's delayed housing in our city and our communities. And that's why developers are using state laws so that we can build housing faster because as everyone knows and has mentioned about their children, uh, that can't afford to live here, this is a crisis. So please keep the big picture in mind and know that uh, while this certainly impacts the neighbors directly, there's a whole community of people out there and people that want to live there and enjoy all the benefits that the neighbors have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Anyone who hasn't testified wish to do so? Seeing hearing none, it is time for the first appellant. That would be uh, Mr. and Ms. Guy to provide any testimony you wish to provide within a five minute time frame. Thanks for the opportunity to speak Thank again. Um, so I, I could say a lot, but I'm gonna try and stick to the facts. So the first one was the future bus times. So my question is, do the council members trust the planning commission have done the math correctly based on if I give the benefit of the doubt, the glaring errors in the initial calculations, or if I'm, <laughs> if I'm sinister, maybe the intentional oversight on what is actually being calculated. Because to me, it seems like we need to see the future plans and review them together to understand if the service is meeting the requirements in the state law. And let me be clear, I support more housing, but we live in America and people drive here a lot. The next thing I want to say is that we shouldn't be myopic on how to build more housing without considering all of the other things. And one interesting point that I'd like to raise by a guy called Thomas Heatherwick is what impact buildings like this have on the climate emergency, because climate change is real. Heatherwick says these buildings contribute to the climate emergency because mostly unloved developments are often torn down quickly and replaced by newer but no less boring buildings emitting a great deal of carbon in the process. 
He is troubled that the average lifespan of a modern building is 40 years. We need to think differently and build forever, or we ain't going to have a planet left. Um, I just wanted to clarify that we have been to every meeting that we have been invited to. Uh, the planning uh, department failed to invite us to um, one meeting, and we've had to call repeatedly to find out when this meeting would be. We have not received notices. So, yeah, we are all in this. Please don't think that we're not. Um, there have been a lot of quotes in response, uh, which include, I think, and off the top of my head, given some of the glaring errors in the initial plans, do we think that's enough to base building this off of? Or do we need concrete answers in front of us? Um, in regard to cars, we live next to a six student house. The average number of um, cars they have is around four. Um, students have cars, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them do. And then I just wanted to also offer my services. I am a color and material designer, as I said. I would love for this project to go through and the adjacent neighbors to feel happy when they look at it. I would be free, uh, I would give my services pre pro bono to Workbench if they wanted my, me to consult upon the project. Um, I think that's everything, unless you have anything else. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, you all for much. your time. I appreciate it. And thank you both for responding to my emails um, last year, I think it was. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Thank you. This will be the opportunity now for Ms. Livingston to provide a response. Hello. Good evening again. Uh, again. Hi. Um, Vasiliki needs to finish uh, what she started. I glossed over a lot of points. I know I had too much, way too much tech data. Um, but one of the things that came out in the, um, Mr. Wallace, um, who said that he had never done any, you know, digging in the site. Um, as you know, I'm a geologist. When I was reading the geotech report, the red flags that really went off in my brain was when I looked at the geotech logs. So the logs are what the field personnel write down while they're sampling to describe the soil. And on the seven boreholes that they drilled on July 22nd and again in August, they came back for like the seventh one. They did six in July. Uh, this was 2022 when the site was not under the jurisdiction of the city, was fully an open site, had not yet been closed. And Mr. Wallace, you run a health food store, and that's oh, really excuse great. Me, excuse me, excuse me. You can address the council. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Wallace runs a health food store, and that's great. But what I saw in the boring logs, and I could see through the lines because I've logged thousands of boreholes, and I, I could see what was going on there. The drillers had not been informed that this was a site with gasoline. They weren't trained in how to drill through these sites. They didn't have personal protective gear. They were pulling up samples, and they were logging strong gasoline odors. So four of the seven boreholes that all went into bedrock, except for the one that hit concrete and they stopped, um, they pulled out the drill cuttings that were contaminated. They put them back in the boreholes. You know, that's spreading contamination. They started, they didn't know it, they started in the dirty end of the site, right in the middle of the plume. They didn't have equipment to know that, to decontaminate their, their drilling material. Then they went on by the creek and they drilled through the area that has characteristically been clean. So in the course of that investigation that was conducted without the water board even being aware of it, while it was an open site, and I know that um, Mr. Butler said there are protocols in, site, in, the, in place for how to deal with these. Apparently, they're not working. They need to be a little more transparent. Um, but when I read all of this, I, and that's what really got me digging into the site, and almost literally. The thing is, you can't dig into it at all, not a single shovel full for any reason without clearance from environmental health. When I spoke to a colleague at the Water Board, who is like the lead geologist on this, I spoke with him in April. He had no idea that the geotech study was done while it was an open site, which is a huge jurisdictional overstep on the part of whoever in the city knew that Mr. Wallace authorized this. 
So the other thing that's going on is all over California now with these mandates for housing and infill development, there are many similar low threat closed sites. These brownfields need to have public and transparent processes for how to deal with them. I would love to see the city come out with brownfields management plans that we can you know, participate in. Um, these aren't our dirty little secrets to sweep under the rug. And I'm very, very concerned that, you know, I want to know what the justification for the CEQA exemption is in light of this material. And I think I want to stop now and give my colleague a moment to have his piece to say. So, James, thank you. And thank you. I so appreciate the time you guys put into this. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Thank you. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on speaking here. Um, I just had... I just want to take this opportunity just to talk about a few things bigger picture than the appeal itself, and I didn't really want that to be part of the appeal. I wanted it to be separate, but here we are. Uh, one was um, this process we just went through, right? There needs to be a different process where it's not we have to file an appeal to get community involvement. That was the only, that was the door that got us to where we were talking, get, having any say into like what the conditions of approval were, bringing up issues in our community that this thing would negatively impact us such as like the lighting and you know, all this stuff. There's just things that we need to like talk about that these guys don't know about, but we do. And so the ability to have like that back and forth needs to be done by someone other than the city council who is not their job and probably the planning department. But, but there needs to be like an actual community engagement and conversation and feedback loop into this thing before it goes to the planning commission. First time we heard anything was seven days before it was approved, right? Um, second, as far as the appeal goes, you guys do whatever you're going to do with the appeal. But I did want to say like, I asked this question, but what is the purpose of an appeal process if everyone's going to recommend to deny it, especially when it's like a valid appeal? You know, like we appealed, and um, I don't understand. Like, I just want so just asking the question you guys can answer if you want, which is like, what is the purpose of the appeal process? What is a valid appeal that gets approved? If not this, which was totally justifiable, do your own. And I, and I would like to say I wish the planning department did a better job uh, working for the constituents, it feels like they work a lot for the developers in this current relationship, and I think that uh, there's a lot of room for, for um, being more equitable in how they approach these projects and the interests involved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The, uh, that to set where we are now, <coughs> the appellants, the applicant, everyone has spoken, the public has made their comments. The matter is now back before the council for our deliberations. Council Member Newsom is recognized. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to deny the appeals and approve a 48 unit project and the permits needed for that project and grant the requested waivers for height, setback, and FAR, but only to the extent necessary to facilitate construction of a 48 unit project that does not include the 11 proposed storage units on the west side of the project. There's a motion and a second. Second by the Vice Mayor. Mr. Newsom, you may open on your motion. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. So this is, first I want to thank everyone who came out and spoke tonight and uh, who participated. Uh, this is an application for 48 units, and particularly for 33 base units and the 15 additional density bonus units the applicant requested and has a right to under state density bonus law at the time of the application. Now, it is clear to me from the comments made by the applicant in previous meetings in our agenda report and letters they've sent to the planning department, and in the testimony we received this evening that the 11 additional storage units on the west side of the project are a device the applicant plans to use to gain more units for this application than are allowed under state density bonus law for a 33 unit project. They have no intent for future residents to use these spaces as an amenity. So this proposed direction does two things. First, it addresses the issue of the applicant attempting to gain more units than they are allowed under state density bonus law and thus brings the application into compliance. One reason a city is not required to grant a, re a request for a waiver per state density bonus law or California Government Code Section 65915 Part E Subsection 1 is if that waiver would be contrary to state or federal law. And second, the proposed di direction will reduce construction costs on the project by 4.4 to $5.5 million, which is the spirit of the state density bonus law. For the debate or discussion, the vice mayor is recognized. I just have a couple of comments, and I think um, my voting record shows I support housing. I can't think, maybe someone can find it, a project that I haven't supported. Uh, 
There was one. Oh, I was going to say outside of the union one. I was like, I can't think of one that I haven't supported. Um, I, um, I lost my train of thought there for a second, but I think um, I was shocked when I asked what the occupancy could be, and Director Butler told me earlier that you can have, correct me if I'm wrong, two people for 70 square feet, so it could be up to six people per each of these units. I don't think it'll be that, but you could maybe stack people in in triple bunk beds. Having said that, I've been up, I, I, <laughs> I never went away to college. I stayed home to go to college because my, my mom took us to go visit my cousin at UCSE, and I saw, I just finally got my own bedroom. I was 16 years old, and I saw her crammed into a dorm with two other kids, and I was like, oh, heck no, I'd rather stay home. So I know that the, and they didn't have a kitchen. So I can see the need for dorm-style studio living like this. I do think that Mr. Butler made some good points about um, the increased supply adding to the, you know, overall um, relieving of the burden for what we're looking for. I, 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 I did kind of uh, chew you guys out a little bit, Doug and, and Jamila and everybody at Workbench, but I, I would really like to work with you moving forward. And so I do think coming out of this, what James said and what other people have said is the process has to get better. I take some responsibility for that. I know staff also um, is willing to help, but I don't want every single project to come to us with an appeal for this, that, or the other. And so I think... I'm going to support um, Scott's motion. I think that it's in the spirit of what's probably the best project we're going to get here. Um, but I think moving forward, we need to, and I'm including myself, develop a process where people aren't finding out about things seven days before they are getting approved so that we can um, build, build the future um, the way we want th the town to look. And I'm, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Council Member Colin Tyre Johnson is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question and then some comments. Uh, there were some community members that asked about the um, parking and increased parking restrictions. I, I know I've communicated with um, with the city team, and I, I, I believe that there is some discussions happening, if Mr. Starkey could speak to that. And if it needs to be explicit, I'm ready to um, see if um, the maker of the motion would uh, accept a couple of friendly amendments. Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> you've heard comments about our um, neighborhood residential parking permit program. And the way that the regulations for that are crafted in our municipal code, um, the residents actually have the power today to petition me and my department to make changes to that, um, that zone that they live in. Uh, we have already started those conversations with some of the neighbors, um, and we need them to follow up with us to move that process forward. And so um, I believe they have our contact information. People can find me after the meeting to talk more about it if they like, but the power is in the hands of the neighbors to um, change the permit parking program. Okay, thank you for addressing that. Um, so I'll just make a few comments. Um, I too have been a supporter of housing. In fact, I have a very strong relationship with the Santa Cruz EMB group. Um, so I think you know how I feel about housing. Um, I do believe that we need more housing of all kinds in our community. I do believe that the more we build housing, um, the, the less the prices will be, the more feasible it'll be for us to live in this community. And I believe how we do that really matters. How we grow and how we bring housing into our community matters. Um, you know, the state laws, we've heard it tonight, we've heard it before, um, state laws, um, for, I think, good reason for past policies that have kept us from building housing have now pushed the limits. But sometimes these limits really push our community to the boundary that is not comfortable. Um, and it's not that it's not comfortable because we don't want to have housing. I mean, I really heard that clearly from some of the um, neighbors in the adjacent neighborhoods. Um, but it needs to, it needs to work. Um, that's the situation that we find ourselves in. This whole process, you heard it again, it's, it's been really painful. Uh, I think for everyone involved, including Mr. Wallace and Workbench, it's been um, painful for us council members. And so we've learned a lot. And um, uh, we talked about this earlier today during the budget discussion. We will be making some changes to our process around engagement around these um, development projects. Um, and, you know, in, in this specific project, a lot of what I'm hearing from the neighbors and what we've heard tonight is 
that lack of meaningful, thoughtful community engagement before it gets to the appeal process, right? Um, I know that, that Workbench and Mr. Wallace have included a number of the conditions. What would it take for us to do that before it gets to you know, this point. Um, so we, we need to work on that. Um, the neighbors have asked for reasonable um, setbacks and um, stories, n number of stories. They've asked for um, thoughtful uh, plan around pedestrian and traffic safety concerns. So I think we have done uh, a fairly good job of adding some of those conditions. And I think with Council Member Newsom's uh, motion, we get even closer to that compromise slide that James had showed us. Uh, it's not perfect, and probably a lot of people are going to walk out of the room not being happy. Um, but I think it gets us, again, closer to where we want to be. Again, I believe in housing, and I really believe we need to do it right. Um, we've done it in our community just in the last year. We've brought, we've had projects that were appealed and, and developers and neighbors and appellants worked together and we brought it to a place where the appeal was removed and we unanimously voted for the project. So we can do it. Um, and I hope that this, this gets us a, close, a step closer to that. So I will be ready to support uh, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Newsom's motion. Thank you, Councilmember. Oh, I'm sorry. I did, I did have some friendly amendments. Sure. Um, and I sent them to Bonnie. Um, so one of them is um, the condition of approval, which Hold was 57. For just a moment while we get those okay. up, if you would be kind enough. Thank you very much. It's up. You're on. Thank you. Yes. So um, one of them is the condition of approval 57 point C. Um, so the friendly amendment is to change that, revise the language that the owner's intent to prioritize tenancy to households that do not own a car and inc an inclusion of a provision in all lease agreements requiring tenants to acknowledge an initial their acknowledgement that surrounding neighborhoods include permit parking zones and that tenants in the project do not qualify for, par for parking permits. Very good. Let's see on that one, sir. Yes. Agreeable to the second. Okay. Um, I'm skipping down to the parking one, and and I'm talking this, saying this out loud to process with with the rest of my um, colleagues. It may not be needed now that we've heard from um, Mr. Starkey that direct staff to facilitate a change to the adjacent neighborhood parking district in accordance with the municipal code by the issuance of a building permit. We heard that it's in process and it's in the hands of the neighbor, so I'm actually now not sure if we need that. Okay, strike that. Um, and then, you know, this is another thing that we heard is, is just a lot of the changes in the project, so I'd, I'd be wanting to keep, hear feedback. Um, if project makes major modifications, bring back to planning commission for approval. Sir? Yes. Second. Further? Councilmember Watkins is recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, these appeals are always really tough, I'd say, and I, I think because I feel like most of us in Santa Cruz want to see just good development and we want to do it the right way. And there's just different approaches and perspectives on how to do that. And it divides neighborhoods. And I've seen it um, from my time on council. Uh, similar to my colleagues on council, I, I've supported housing. I've had less control over the years. I was just talking to one of, our, one of our planning staff about that. It's been really remarkable to see how we had such discretion when I first started on council to now where we have developers who are saying, just because we can through state law circumvent certain processes. And that feels like a real like swing of the pendulum <laughs> in a way that feels disrespectful to local government and to our authority and to our community members. Good relationships with community um, has respectful dialogue with our community partners and developers. And sure, maybe not everybody is happy in the end, Certainly there's modifications that sometimes the developer or the community can't live with, but ultimately there's an attempt to try to make it work. And I felt like this project didn't, didn't do that personally. I, um, I was just disappointed. I, I think it's a, I felt like the processes were disappointing, the approach was disappointing, the uh, storage approach felt um, obviously disingenuous to me. And I appreciate the motion because I think it gets at what is truly what state law has to require. I think to Council Member Vice Mayor Golder's point about future relationships, 
Um, I think that requires meaningful and authentic communication with people. And it doesn't mean just because you can, you should. And I think moving forward, um, certainly not everybody will be happy. And certainly people want to see more development come forward in a way that is meaningful to our community. This council supported a lot of development. We're, we're really actually very far ahead and what we need to accomplish um, compared to a lot of jurisdictions. So housing is a priority, certainly. And respectfully, in a way that the community can have it work for them, is like our Santa Cruz value. So I hope to see that happen moving forward. I was actually planning on not supporting this project, but given the direction that we have added, I, I do plan to support the motion on the floor. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is directed to us. I, um, I, rather than repeating, will just associate myself with Council Member Watkins' comments um, about that, the, the history and the loss of discretion, um, but also about the, um, the, the positioning of the developer in this case. Um, we have had quite a few appeals where things have been worked out. We have, we have taught, and, and I have been there when developers have said, we want to make it work. We have not heard that in this case. And so, um, and I'm going to refrain from editorializing too much, but I do want to respond to a point that was made um, by the EMB chorus and the developers about the delays in this process and the appeal costing money and you know all this time that's being taken because um, neighbors don't want the project. In fact, much of this delay came because the developer submitted false information, <laughs> false calculations, whether intended or not. Our pl it's kind of disappointing to me as well that our planning staff did not catch that, that our planning commission did not catch that. And here we are, not because of the um, resistance to a project, but, but because of the pushback on trying to get more than legally you get by right under the density bonus law. So, um, you know, I, I just, I cannot stress that enough. Um, and I, I just think it's disrespectful to say we're all NIMBYs if we don't support whatever a developer wants. Um, you know, uh, I've, I remain concerned about the riparian corridor questions and the, the geo questions. I'm not sure what to do about that here because, um, you know, a, a plan will be created, but if nobody's minding the store, who knows what's going to happen? And so that just is going to require us to be vigilant um, in the community about that. Um, so I'm not sure that we can what, what we can do to make sure they follow the rules, but we can be monitoring it. So I just wanted to also say that. Um, I, too, uh, was planning to um, support the appeal, and um, I, but given the motion, and I, th I think it does strike a compromise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support that. Um, and I want to make a final statement about um, what... Mayor Keeley said in a Lookout article in which Workbench was also quoted, I highly recommend you read it, um, everybody, um, if you want to get a, hear about the, the perspectives of our, who's in our community um, you know, engaged in, in planning and development. Um, but Mayor Keeley said, you know, we, we've lost a lot. You know, maybe we have 20%, maybe not even 20% of the, the discretion we once had. I believe it's our responsibility to use that discretion to ensure that we are protecting neighbors to the extent we can. Um, that is our job. That is working in the public interest. That's not a special interest. There are neighbors all over this community who are going to be facing similar um, development projects. It is the public interest to do so. And so I'm um, happy to support the motion. And thank you for putting it on the floor. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Bruner is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a quick question um, about the uh, friendly amendments on the legal aspect of both of those. Is the city attorney able to address that? The two friendly amendments? Um, I believe they're consistent with uh, the overall approval of the project and do not impose an unreasonable burden on the applicants. So. 
I don't have a problem from a legal perspective with the proposed friendly amendments. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to confirm. And because I don't have much of a voice, I don't want to repeat everything. Um, however, I do want to make a few comments. I want to say thank you to all the neighbors um, meeting with um, different neighbors. Um, there was a lot of um, care and um, um, passion um, and care for the neighborhood. Um, I also want to thank Jamili for at Workbench for meeting with me as well, and Doug for your time too. I also felt there was a lot of care and response. Um, I appreciated the Laurel and Cleveland Street neighbors, and they really organized their list of concerns around this with um, setbacks and density bonuses and parking and traffic and pedestrians, privacy. Um, there was uh, concerns for the solar and the creek and the habitat. And we need that in our community to have our residents and our people thinking about things and bringing that to us so that we collectively have those different lenses. Even this body is a diverse body of perspectives and lenses. Um, and when it comes to housing, I, I sat for 10 years on the Housing Authority Board of Santa Cruz as a renter and as a single parent. Housing has been a very important number one goal. And I think that I'd like to see us, and I agree, moving forward in education for our community and for everyone around the housing. Um, and not coming from a place of privilege and entitlement. A studio is not just for students. A studio is a home for a person, a couple, there are studies across the US of housing migration cycles. And I just want to say that building new housing, any new housing, increases the supply and the affordability. And there are studies around a person's lifetime and the housing needs that they need across a lifetime. So I really wanted to make that point. I'm confident going forward we can have more education for our public. Thank you to our community. Um, I, I don't want to um, uh, support or deny a project based on whether it's ugly or the paint color. Um, it's a home. and. Um, I think there are valid concerns when it comes to loading zones and safety. And so with these appeals, that's what we have to take into consideration. And um, this is an interesting uh, motion that has um, been presented, I mean, based on the findings in the draft resolution and compliance um, I, I would agree to deny the appeals and support the motion that's on the on the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the debate or discussion, seeing here none, the clerk will call the vote. Mayor, Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Palantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Mr. City Attorney, further business to come before the body? There is none. Ms. Bush? No, thank you. Motion to adjourn to be in order. The Vice Mayor moves. Council Member Watkins seconds. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries and so ordered. We stand adjourned.